Hello, everybody, and welcome back to a Covenant live stream on Monday. Welcome to you all. We're glad that you're here, and we're going to be talking about reprints, the impossible decision for a publisher. Everybody's gone through it. I'm sure as players, we've all gone through it as well. And uh, there's a lot of chatter in various games about reprinting and, and those kinds of things. So we wanted to crack that open because we're also playing Year of the Dragon. The Draft Box by Alpha Clash is their newest release. We're going to play on Friday. probably just play some sealed with this bad boy, open as many packs as we want to, and play some games. And this is an example of their reprint strategy, which is releasing a new product with alt arts, foils, etc., of the reprinted cards, and not all of them, but some of them, and throwing it into a nice box to do limited play with, which is very cool. Uh, I'm wearing this hat in <laughs> honor of Alex Becker, who I learned recently is a country boy. I didn't realize that he was dealing with gravel problems like I was. Mm. My wife got this for me for my birthday, which was last week. A I, common country boy problem. I drive a 2003 Toyota Tacoma. Currently. And I, and I love it. <laughs> and yeah. uh, so she got me this hat. Has it gone yet? No, Can you no, figure that no. out? I'm still, I'm still on it. Yeah. It might last for another few years, yeah. even if it has a half an inch. I don't think my Toyota has that kind of timeline. Yeah. Anyway, this is for you, Alex. I just wanted to do that, and I will uh, I will take this off whenever I'm done making the point and uh, having a good time. I don't know if you should ever be done making the point. <laughs> yeah, I agree with you. I totally agree with you. <laughs> permanent permanent hat hat guy. We'll give everyone a second uh, to, to hop on in here. Really just really just happy that everybody's Man, in the chat. This is a name I haven't seen in a long time. Brew Kiki Kiwi? Yeah. That's, that's a... Yeah. That's I'll a standby that's a, saying 7 a.m. here in New Zealand. Love getting to watch for a bit before I head off to work. Yeah, that's a uh, that's a that's a pandemic <coughs> uh, name I remember from yeah. the pandemic streaming days. Yeah, so Absolutely. a lot of those a lot of those names stick with you. Hey man, I'll tell you what, Star Wars Unlimited was fun. I hated it. That's that's a good that's a good game. <laughs> Apparently, so I uh, they're no. blowing up our threads, man. They over on the Discord. Everyone's yeah. blowing up the conversation. Yeah. I, Star Wars Unlimited. I kind of like that. There's like a hidden thread. You have to like you have to know. And I, the number yeah. of people that I heard asking like, where's Where's this at? It's like a speakeasy, right? It's like you, you just got to know where it's at. You wouldn't believe how much hidden stuff is in that Discord. It, I found the, the for a long time I didn't know there was a wizard clan for Fab somewhere in there in the Discord. Uh -huh. I still don't quite know where you've it's only, at. You've only just begun, my friend. Hey, we got, just we got begun. the Wade King in the house. The Wade King's here. He did a lot of the art. So maybe well. this maybe this cover, in fact. Probably did, Kagan. Um, so, topic first, right? Yeah, let's, That's talk, what's let's, on the agenda. let's talk about yeah, reprints. It. So... I think we need to back up from reprints a little bit. Well, you can't back up if you didn't start. Yeah, but before we get to reprints, I think there's some pre, uh, pre prints. <laughs> same joke, same time. Uh, so, in an expandable card game, lots of uh, like a collectible card game per se. Okay. Uh, new new things come out every so often, mm -hmm. and because of the nature of physical products, you print a booster box or a set. And then in three years, there might not be any of those left. Or sometimes in two weeks. Yeah. It depends on the game and the situation, right? Yeah. Um, which is part of it being collectible. But if you want, like an example right now, Flesh and Blood, had their, 
mainline format is outside the living legend hero rotation thing every card they've ever printed is legal in their main yeah. constructed format so sometimes eternal. called an eternal format that's right yeah alpha clash doing the same thing uh the stuff they print is going to be uh, around for a very long time um and they've chosen to make this draft box which is part of what spurred this conversation uh, which includes kind of a highlight that reminds me of the reflections boxes for Star Wars CCG. That's mm-hmm. how they addressed yeah, it. Yeah, that's true. They did that, didn't they? Way back in the 90s, which is two or three sets come out, they're out of print, that game kept getting more popular. Um, and then at some point, you're like, new players are saying, hey, there's these old cards that are actually at this point just super expensive because of how hard they are to get. Right. Um, they At the time they first were around, maybe they were 50 cent commons, but now it's $10 to get some of these things. So they had a reflection set, and Lord of the Rings TCG did the same thing. A booster box that has some alt arts, some foils, some other language cards, some ex- new. In that case, it was some new exclusive cards in that product, uh, and then a ton of reprints yeah. from older sets. So, uh, a lot of times, reprints happen because a publisher is attempting to increase the accessibility of previously printed cards. Um, but given that a game is collectible, reprints have an impact on would be collectability. So that C, in fact. <laughs> So you you know you print a f- even looking at something like Star Wars Unlimited, which we was that just last week that we played that. That's right. <sighs> yeah. Um, so you know in that set, uh, the the green Darth Vader was like is the card I was most after. Um, and right now, like I don't know, on TCG Play, it's a hundred dollar card or something, which is pretty crazy. But in two years. Like, if all those booster boxes are gone, who knows what that card's going to be worth. Right. And sometimes right. cards that weren't good at the time become very good later. Um, and so naturally, if you're having tournaments particularly, this can be a problem because if players just don't have access to X number of cards, and so with Flesh and Blood is another another example, they've been reprinting some cards into future mm-hmm. sets. Uh, and they did, like, Unlimited for a minute. I remember the first couple of sets sold out, and then they did, like, Unlimited for the first time of Welcome to Wraith and Arcane Rising and, like, injected a ton of cards there. And at this point, they're four or five years in, and most of the cards are pretty, like, findable. It's not like that. that's the problem. But they have not done, like, a massive reprint situation. Yeah. Um, so reprints are a pressing topic and I, you already see people calling for this for something like sorcery mm-hmm. which sold out at, uh, locally in most places within a month or two yeah, distro pretty quick of the game coming out um so it's this whole interesting topic and we titled it impossible bet because <laughs> print printing correctly in a game mm-hmm. like this uh, it's that fine line between collectability and uh making things uh, accessible and then, you know, it, we, you kind of get on this high horse, or I guess bolt box a lot. Excuse me. Well, I never get on high horse. I don't know what you're talking about. I'm always even keeled. Just, just the idea of, like, so many things became collectible because they became old and hard to find. Right. It, it, intentional collectability was not a thing. Yeah, like old vinyl. Yeah. First printing of a Lord of the Rings book. It's not like that was made, and at the time people were like, this is going to be really rare and, like, valuable because it's rare. So collectible games always have this weird line that they're walking. Yeah, uh, like intentional collectability is strange. Yeah. Just straight up strange. Although it's very common these days, like not even in just hobbies, trading cards, that kind of thing, but like everybody's into it. Everybody's just put like, ah, oh, limited run sneakers, limited mm. run book, yep. limited run, what else do people buy? Shoes. No, I don't need sneakers. <laughs> I guess I only buy shoes and Video cards. game editions. Fact, limited, limited, well, video games are a little harder because it is a file that you just kind of... But I've seen the, like, pre-order this thing, get this in-game gear that you can only yeah. get from doing this, and then it's yeah. suddenly, if you didn't... Uh-oh, Jonathan popped uh, up. Hey. He's got... <laughs> <laughs> oh, <laughs> Hello there. Let's see if this works. Hello. Do you have to press the one or the... Yeah, here we go. Here we yeah, go. Yeah, you got the the, are you one on? Can people I think it's okay. Oh, yeah, you can hear me. Just way too loud. Sorry about that, guys. Um, it's getting blasted by the John can here. Comics. Also, big collector, like there was a big thing in the 90s that I'm learning because I'm going through a bunch of like comic history uh, video essays. Okay. But they would print with like all dark covers. They mm-hmm. would print in bags. So you had to keep it in a bag or it would lose its value. They would like be like four or five or six variations. So there's actually a lot of analogs between the comic industry and the current tabletop industry, mm-hmm. speculators, mm-hmm. et cetera. There's, there's a lot of collect- collectible everything now. You know, you collectibilize limit, it. Limited edition pan. You know, we yeah. only have a thousand of these cast irons. You see, when I put the hat on, I just get a little bit more country. 
Agreed. Like I, I cast iron as an example there is a little bit questionable. I don't know that I've seen a limited edition cast iron pan. But if there was one, this is the guy that would be buying it. 100%. Limited edition cast iron pan. This yeah. is the the persona. Yeah. Well, that you're technically, get. after you use a cast iron for a couple of years, it's limited edition. That's right. Yeah, it's mine. So one it's of the only one. one. Yeah. It's, it's, so let me give you some recent examples. Yeah. Yeah. Hit me with it. So obviously, like one way to solve this for games is you just rotate format. You have a format that's yep. rotating, and so then like you only ever have to have three booster boxes in print, and then you let them fall off, and you print the new ones. That limits the need for reprints. But then you have this thing, and I, are there some Magic players in the audience? If you could explain to me the reserve list in greater detail, that would be really helpful. But I know that Magic had a policy of like reprinting like older cards that were very like hard to get and valuable in new sets, and then that made people go nuts. And then they said, we're going to make a list of cards that we'll never reprint. That's and the reserve that, list. I believe that's the reserve yeah. list. Uh, so obviously, it was having a big enough impact on their game that it was like, okay, we got to do something about this because everything, the sky is falling. Well, I'm pretty sure people... yeah. I around wizards have it seems like they regret that decision to do the reserve list yes. or to have reprinted the cards at all reserve list oh right well everybody regrets it in hindsight but they did it in the moment for very obvious reasons like oh my gosh the numbers yeah. aren't good because that's something a, is happening that's worth mentioning because it, it it touches on the sensitivity of reprints in general which is if you have these things at the time that are very, like black lotus or whatever they're really valuable and you've shown that you're willing to reprint, even if that's not the thing you reprinted. Now, any collector side, uh, and there's two sides of that coin, collector or like investor speculator type mm -hmm. people who are just trying to buy and sell and all that stuff. Um, there's a nervousness. If you're going to pay $1,000 for a card, that, and you see this in Pokemon Yu-Gi-Oh all the time, they'll have a $200 card and they'll print it a starter deck in the future. Yeah. For, yeah. And it's just like intense. And they're actively just saying like, we don't care. Yeah, but that's like, known. That that's how Pokemon works. Yeah. So that creates a ceiling of cards probably don't go past this point. Mm -hmm. uh, but even like the most classic Pokemon is a first edition Charizard. And you don't see them reprinting the first edition Charizard. Right. But carry right. So we got Magic with the Reserve List and the reprinting strategy there. And now I think they're just reprinting a bunch of stuff. I'm, I'm completely on the outside of Magic, as you all know. Uh, so it's just kind of like trying to read the signals from various loud voices in that community as to what's going on. Then you have Lorcana. Lorcana came out and, as expected, just was an absolute madhouse of insane, you know, like kind of Disney level mania trying to find any and every booster box that could be found to buy to primarily, I assume, collect and just like Disney fans wanting to get their hands on the cards. Some people wanting to play the game also as well. Sold out, you know, relatively instantly. Ah, crazy. Ravens, how could we see this coming? And then they uh, were like, we're going to print this and for like, hard we're going to print it until prices come down in a big way they're basically not scared to say we're going to print this essentially until it stops being crazy uh, so that was Lorcana. then we have one piece was kind of in the same situation they their game came out and it went insane and then it's like oh are they going to reprint are they not going to reprint and bandai has a weird track record with all that kind of stuff so then I believe that they did go ahead with a reprint I don't know if that's if there's any one Lorcana? piece players oh, uh, one, one piece, piece. Yeah. Uh, let me know on that one and then where did that shake out? And then you also have, like you said, sorcery. We have beta that's going on. A lot of the regions, you know, Europe and whatnot, it's like we need a reprint, especially. Uh, LGS is here in the States through distribution. Distribution's out, so it's like we need a reprint. Uh, and then you also have uh, somebody else was just just in reprint territory that I cannot remember. But it's basically everywhere, and you see it primarily in these eternal formats, but there's not a structured rotation of boxes. And the, the thinking is that it's beneficial to not have structured rotation at this point, certainly as your primary format, uh, because that disincentivizes people from buying the cards now if they know they aren't going to be able to play them in two months, three months, four months, right? Yeah, even with Unlimited... Um... From my very limited oh, seat so far. That's what I was thinking, yeah. They've said that they're playing on rotation, but they haven't announced details. And I have only played games that are don't have rotation for a minute mm -hmm. on the competitive side. And it definitely hit me different. I didn't I want, I, At first, I didn't realize it when I was buying the product that at some point in the future, these will not be playable in like that way. Yeah. So it, it was just interesting more than anything. I, I don't have any grand plans to compete at that, so it doesn't really matter to me. But it did hit differently, mm -hmm. where it's like, it is strange that these things are just not going to be playable in 
two years or whatever yep. it is. We saw a Flesh and Blood. They started with first edition followed by Unlimited. Unlimited was designed to be printed. Well, I thought it was going to be printed forever, um, but that became unfeasible. And then it became history packs where we're going to take all of the cards from the first X sets, put them in a history pack with a different border on it. I forgot that it. happened. Yeah. Well. That's crazy. It's I, forgettable, I, really. I, I understood <laughs> the history packs in like in the other languages. Mm-hmm. Where it may not make sense to make every set in Italian, but you can do highlight sets in Italian. Yeah, Italian bringing players. basically those new localizations up to speed made a lot of sense. Yeah. Um, but as far as whether or not we'll see any more history packs is a great question. Um, whether or not that's even worth doing. Uh, or if Fab will move into like a different kind of, maybe like an Alpha Clash style mm. alt art treatments of all your favorite heroes and all their best that, cards. That was and... probably the strangest thing about history packs. They weren't draftable. Yeah. Like if they had used it to here's a new draft format. That was strange, yeah. That's what that's what's cool about this. Mm -hmm. Is I'm they're planning on doing this is draft box zero one. So they're planning on doing future draft and it makes sense. If all these things are gonna be legal in another year, you could do box number two, but now you get to mix cards from the first four or five, six sets. Yeah. So you can create environments. Now for Fab it's tougher because of the way classes work to actually make it draftable and include cards for everything. It is very tough. But still I, that's why they didn't do it. Yeah, that's but, nearly impossible. But I would rather like I could imagine now there's enough time where you could have a single set of history packs that feature like just four classes because there's so many different rune blades and so many different guardians, mm -hmm. and so then you could like do that mm -hmm. in a different stack. But that like if you could draft all the rune blades and all the guardians and all the wizards and all the whatever together, and you've never been able to do that, that's interesting. Mm -hmm. So. There's, there's really, let's lay the groundwork here. There's two questions. Why, you know, why reprint? Why not to reprint? Those are the two questions. But first, it really hinges on the fact that this, these are kinds of games that are unusual in that a board game doesn't have a question of whether or not to reprint, aside from is there simply enough demand to buy, and even if there isn't. Like if you're, uh, let's say you're Earthborn, for instance, mm -hmm. and you're not going through the Kickstarter and whatnot, and all of your Earthborn uh, sets are sold out at distribution and everywhere else. And then you're like, okay, uh, if I print another 5,000, I already know that this distributor wants 2,000, that distributor wants 1,000, that distributor wants 2,000. I can print those and sell them. And Maybe I want to do that forever. And then I really want to get to a point where they're not instantly selling out, and then they can just kind of trickle over time. They're, they run out, we print more, send them, they run out, print more. That's the evergreen nature of those mm -hmm. kinds of games. So every board game wants to be in that situation where they're always on the shelf, they're always available, they're the ticket to ride, they're the size of Catan. Uh, so just make as many as you can uh, that will sell in a reasonable amount of time and then do it over and over. With uh, TCGs, right, like that math is not the same. Like in many ways, TCGs don't want products sitting on shelves. Mm -hmm. They don't want a set to be there for three years after it's released. Yeah, they, um, they probably want it to be done by the time the next set's coming out. Yeah, or mostly done. Because what you see, and you see this, you go to TCG Player and look at a number of different games, and you know, like right off the bat, and this is why Medici went in the tank as well. Is like, if you have a set from a year, year and a half ago that is still on shelves, that thing is going to be twenty dollars a box. I mean, thirty dollars a box, forty dollars a box. There's no, there's, there's nothing anchoring those prices really. So the moment that retailers say, are, are like buying these again collectible products and they're not selling because nobody wants to collect them, then they're trying to be the last person to lose, right? So they're just going to undercut, 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 try to get it off their shelves because the moment something goes to this is not a collectible product. Nobody wants to actively collect and buy this. It's, it's the bottom falls out of everything, right? Now that doesn't happen with certain board games. Like mm -hmm. I think board games can sell three to 10 copies a week and you're not gonna see them in the bargain bin for 10 bucks. Yeah, Like they'll eventually trickle that supply out. But with collectible games, there's a psychological component to this that, that basically forces or uh, dictates buying behavior, whether something's desirable or not, depends entirely on whether other people think it's desirable or not. Sure. That's the entire market, right? Well, and it, it, it comes back to, it's funny, reprints are, there's, there's different between like Lorcana sells out in two days, mm -hmm. they're printing more, 
and this sold out after nine months and now you have the problem of this needs to be available for players because we're going to keep using these cards forever. Right. Um, and so there's different things that instigate that. But when we talk about collectible games, we always talk about supply and print, how much you print. And that's that's part of why this is an impossible uh, scenario for publishers. Because like Lorcana, as an example, I saw a comment earlier. Someone said that they were conservative and so they sold out very quickly. Mm-hmm. Um, but when you're talking about the first print of a game, how in the world to determine how much to print? It's, if you're Magic or Pokemon printing 10 million boxes every set every two or three months, yeah, you know, like, your off is like 100,000 extra boxes and yeah. 10 million. And you have so much data that is in history. but And they still miss. Yeah, and they still miss. No, Gene. <laughs> um, but th- <laughs> think, thinking about being uh, Ravensburger with Lorcana, the Lorcana uh, line at Gen Con was insane. Mm-hmm. And it's clear. It's like this is Disney. This is a way more accessible game than most games that ever come out. It's a huge IP. There's a lot of interest. I don't. I don't think the industry is set up for them to ever be accurate. It's also like, what is accurate, right? Because mm-hmm. we talk all the time about card games and how easy it is to overprint, underprint. And your thing about like, do people desire this thing is fueled by do do other people desire this thing? That's collectability in a nutshell. Yeah, right? and it's like, well, you know, if if let's just say you could actually be like, hey, demand is a hundred thousand boxes even. That's exactly how many are going to be bought. By people that want to buy this game in some amount of time frame. Yeah, well, you always got to have a time. Yeah, frame. well, let's not even get into that. Let's just keep it simple. <laughs> you, let's just say you can crystal ball. Okay, we need a hundred thousand of these boxes. Mm-hmm. Boom. Um, well, if you print a hundred and ten thousand, you're like, let's just have some extra. Um, it's possible if that time frame is three months. It hits. It hits shelves. Retailer has ten copies that are still sitting there, and again, there's thousands of retailers buying this product. And they don't want inventory to just sit there for too long, especially for collectible games. Board games, I think, is different. It's like, mm-hmm. oh, I'll just have this selection of board games and they'll eventually sell over time. So even a little bit overprinted can make it feel like it was way overprinted. And then it just is like, oh, next time I go in after I paid, let's say it's $100 boxes again for easy math. And then at some point, that retailer is selling the leftovers for 60 And as a person, it's really easy to see that and be like, hmm. Maybe next time I'll just like wait yeah. to buy. Because I feel like I just pay $40 more for a box. Yeah. And so, or you saw them online for cheaper or whatever. So you're like, yeah, I'll just wait and buy. And I'll see. And then the set comes out and then like 10% of your players are waiting. So now instead of 100 selling, 100,000 selling, 90,000 sell. And now that problem gets even worse. Because mm-hmm. it reinforces itself. It's like, well, now there's even more boxes that are going to end up at this thing. Meanwhile, if you even, if you underprint, a little, especially from like release date, like Volcano. What they, it's possible that they underprinted five percent, mm-hmm. but because they hit that thing so fast, interest and demand, and then like as soon as, as soon as people smell that in the market, it's, it's this is speculators, this is uh, whatever you want to call them, this is retail stores, this is just people looking to make money. As soon as they smell it, mm-hmm. I've seen this a thousand times. Um, retailers take products off the shelves or double the price. These boxes start getting listed on eBay. All the ones you can find online just quickly get devoured. Um, and it doesn't take a lot. Okay, so is that a problem? Like, how can, like, isn't this what collectability is supposed to be? So I think the biggest problem is that people want it to be collectible without it being collectible. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. <laughs> it's like we want none of the downside, mm-hmm. only upside of the collectible model, but the reality is that it has a lot of downsides too. Like if, if, and that's what, this is why it's impossible. <laughs> and this is also why when you get on the question of reprints, like if you're Lorcana and you sold out in 12 hours and then it's $500 boxes, to me, reprinting makes a lot of sense. Like there's mm-hmm. clearly a lot of, and, and especially it depends on your goal as a company, right? Like are you actually wanting to foster player bases and communities and have people playing this game or do you just want a really collectible product mm-hmm. um and that's fine there's baseball cards that's strictly a collectible product yeah um but if you actually want people to play and you're looking at that it makes a lot of sense at that point for me to be like yeah let's reprint like and how hard you want to go at that is up to you etc um but the 
I lost I lost the train there. Here's here's an idea. I got off on a different bus. Here's an <laughs> <laughs> Oh hey, you're not wearing your uh your uh teeth anymore. Uh, <laughs> speaking of. Yeah, old man. Speaking of being yeah, old, my Invisalign yeah. are gone after three and a half. It looks years, great. Whatever. Thanks. You know, I can yeah, tell thanks. it's just a glowing smile. Here's okay, let's think of it like this though. Let's think of it like because I li- I like to and then I want to get into the comments. Yeah, there's some really good comments. Yeah, I really because because this is all, you know, you're removing, you're basically taking a, a big fan and you're clearing the smoke out from uh, the industry that has, you know, I, basically collectability is an obfuscation of sorts of, uh, of product and demand and players and collectors and all this. So let's say right now I wanted to, the One Ring is a great example. If I want to make the mm-hmm. most collectible possible product, I will print one of it, okay? The problem with me printing one of the thing and guaranteeing its collectability is that I, as the publisher, make only this amount of money. Mm-hmm. So if I take this one thing and I think, well, maybe 100 people will buy this. Now I make 100 times the money, but I risk it being less collectible. Now there's 100 of them. And that's basically the math all the way up to however many boxes you want to print. Mm-hmm. You're saying, like, I'm going to lower collectability, but I'm if I get the number right, I'm going to increase my profit. And then if I get too far on this side, I'm going to decrease collectability and significantly reduce my profit well under what are the production costs that I have. Well, go ahead. I don't mean So, like, this is the accordion that all of these publishers are playing. Now, if you're only thinking about collectors, this makes a lot of sense, right? Like, if you're only thinking about collectors, just print, let's say, a thousand. Like, we saw this old, this one, for instance. While you're grabbing that, uh, yeah, go ahead. What is, what is this? Flights of Fantasy. This is the Ed Beard Jr. Uh, collector's card set and game with a loose and there. Other works copyrighted by some of your favorites, Melissa Benson, uh, Ron Rasool, and Ralph Pacquia from 1994. So this is a 1994 uh, collection of art on cards, and you saw this a lot in the early 90s, and most of them were not playable. They are not games whatsoever. This is just... We're going to print a number of cards with art on them from artists that you dig, and we're just going to have you collect them. You mm-hmm. try to get the whole set, or your favorite artists or your favorite pieces of art from the set. This was everywhere, this kind of stuff. I got that free Beetle Bailey collectible yeah. card. Yeah. And so if we start in that world, start in that brain space of forget a game at all, and just think about you're going to print fancy, good-looking things that people are going to want to track down in these booster packs, and they're going to enjoy the hunt and the scavenger uh, hunt nature of trying to find them, maybe trading with other players to get the, the full set, the full collection. Oh, I got it. It's in my binder. Put it on my shelf. Feel gratified every time I go down there and look at that binder. Open it up from time to time and relive those memories. Love it. Now, a key piece of collectability here is the number of people that desire a thing. Right, of course. So if nobody wants those cards and you're the only one... Yeah. You, well, you can collect them just fine. It's just going to be really cheap. So, like, the one ring, you mm-hmm. just had that example, which sparked some things for me. Yeah. Printing one of it and then printing millions of booster boxes, it could come in. And there's a number of people that would like to have that one ring, mm-hmm. like, quite a bit. But that's, like, a, when you're a smaller publisher, if you never get to the point where enough people are playing that even the more rare things are, like... Part of it is not just, lim- you know, you can make one, a one of one thing, but if no one wants it, it's not even actually collecting. Mm-hmm. It's just going to be whatever. So, yeah. and that's that's all, a lot of times, that's what I meant by the difference too between you sell out in two days reprinting versus you sold out in nine months reprinting, mm-hmm. or it's three years later and you're suddenly reprinting. Um, those are very different factors. Well, so, so that's the important, none of that makes any sense. If we just, if we just focus on collectors, collectability, we're divorce gaming entirely from this. Magic came out of that. You know, all of these early TCGs came out of the idea that you were just collecting cards, mm-hmm. baseball cards, trading cards, etc. So if we live in that world, everything's relatively fine if you sell out and the cards go to a million dollars. That's great. But I, I would say it's beyond fine. That's what you want. Yeah. And one note you had earlier that's before we get to the comments, it's worth iterating here is that accordion scale. Mm-hmm. So interestingly, like we saw this with Fab and Monarch. Legendary Studios, the publisher, made the same amount of money right. off of those boxes, no matter what they were selling for. Right. So it's another piece of this, which is their profit is only squeezed if the total number of boxes bought at the retail level changes. 
Right. So if, if the aftermarket price of an MSRP $100 product is actually $60 because you're overprinted, but if you do that every time and you still sell everything you're printing, right. they're making the same amount of money. Yeah, you really don't care as a publisher. Um, that's just not usually how that goes. Yeah, and that's that's where like the um, – there's a uh, kind of more false collectability and then there's like a more genuine version. As an example, in an ideal hypothetical world, if every set of a TCG was available for 12 months – Anyone wants to buy it, it's just available for 12 months. Mm -hmm. And then after that stopped, and then if in 10 years the game is still going on, that th that stuff would be collectible, of presumably. Course. It's yeah. going to be way harder to get. Yeah, 100%. And that is more the kind of collectability that existed prior to CCGs and baseball cards and mm -hmm. stuff, right? Which is like even thinking about things like a vinyl or a book printing. You just printed the 5,000 you were going to print of Lord of the Rings, and then it just so happens now there's tens of millions of people that love Lord of the Rings. Yeah. But there's only 5,000 copies of this. Mm -hmm. And I feel the same about like first edition Charizard. It's like, he was rare. Don't get me wrong. But also, compared to the number of players playing when it first started. Of course, yeah. He's 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 collectible, mm -hmm. but not what he became. Yeah. And then even now, it's crazier because there's t way more people into Pokemon than ever. But there's still e exactly this many <laughs> of Charizard that exist. And there is a joy to collectability that revolves around knowing what you have collected is desired by others and gaining in value. Yeah. Like, not not even if you plan to sell it. Like, it's not that you're necessarily looking to flip it in sure. a year. It's that, man, I put the Power 9 together mm -hmm. in 12, 20 years ago. And I know right now that every time I look at this, there are so many people who are trying to do this that can't. And I already have it. And I've got it. Yeah. And, like, that creates feelings in you i yep. don't the ethics of that whatever I mean, but it does create real feelings even outside of the collectible market it's like i run into people all the time outside of tabletop who collect things the morality of that yeah well yeah. you collect art you collect this kind of book right mm -hmm. it's like oh i have all the leather bound brandon sanderson books and it's like it's not, it means nothing i mean it means something to me but not sure. I'm, I'm not chasing after that but yeah humans by nature are collect collector, mm -hmm. dopamine-driven entities. Many of them are. Yeah, yeah. Not all. Like, I think it's a very natural human instinct to want to have things other people want that you have. Yeah, I mean, not in the most ideal way most of the time, but also I think that people use things that they own as a way to identify themselves and a way sure. to create their own identity. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of things that are collected are ways for people to piece together what they find important and valuable in their own lives. So Eric, for instance, Eric Curiosa, he, you know, I, I saw the old post where he built a little thing in his basement in his new house to house his Power 9 cards. He's got the nine slots in the wall that he can put those cards in. That is as much a statement about who Eric is and what was important in his life and his childhood and his development and his formative years as it is about having cards that other people want. Sure. You know, so there's a lot of factors at play, but if we complete the analogy where we go from a collectible product that is simply collectible, and now we add a new group of people that engage with this product that want to use it in a form of competition. They want to play with these cards. Well, now it's a different ball game, <laughs> right? So I used to be able to print yeah, here. I don't compete with my and art. And if everything you know, moons out, great. I made a highly collectible product, and I'll make another one. And then that one hopefully will do the same thing. But now I've got an entirely new group that gives me more profit potential on the amount that I'm printing. But it often comes at the expense of the profit potential of the collector types. Because if things get too easy to collect, the challenge isn't really exciting and it's not that that, yeah. that I'm not that into it. And if a player just wants to make a reprinting, 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 because the best thing for a pure player is one cent cards yeah. so that I can get everything that I need so I can just build the decks that I want. Well, now we get into all the collectors run off and now you have only players. And the question is, does that, which is the LCG model, uh, ultimately work? And we don't know. I mean, the, it, at least in the variations that it was tried under the FFG uh, days, where I think it was its most thriving, um, it was certainly not working at any kind of a scale that a TCG works. So I think the concession that we all have to make is that everybody is needed to make it better for everybody. And that's primarily players and collectors and player collectors, which are the majority, I'd say, of people doing this. Both of them, are they need each other. Like we all need each other for something to reach enough scale that players get big tournaments, big events, and that collectors get 
awesome foils and great card design and all these kinds of things. Well, and also so that publishers can continue investing in creating this experience. Yeah, exactly. So like like, that, that's the, not even just tournaments, it's like, is it feasible to continue producing this game? Right. But if you underprint, the players suffer. If you overprint, the collectors suffer. That's right. So, and you have like the, the hypothetical 100,000 boxes I mentioned earlier. Mm -hmm. You have no way of, it, it's a physically printed product that takes three to six months from the time you hit print to show up. And there's, right now the whole ecosystem is not set up to tell a publisher or to inform them how much to print. Mm -hmm. And this final thing I think is the, the piece that is often missed in that a lot of people are only playing a given game because they know that they can play it the way that they want it and they can sell the rest into a market that's wanting it. Mm -hmm. So like, you know, Eric Wainwright, great example, only doing magic drafts and selling it all after the, after the tournament. Yep. That person does not play that draft if that doesn't exist. And that only exists because collectors and players are willing to buy these cards in the secondary market. So all of these factors combine to say, okay, where do we put the box number? And that's where we're saying like, how do you figure out whether or not to reprint at any given moment along that timeline that might be good for players? It might be bad for players that are trying to get higher values for the cards that they draft, play in limited so they can sell. It might be good for collectors who uh, were going to quit collecting the game because they couldn't find the last two cards. <laughs> and finally, there's a little bit more supply. Uh -huh. I'm going to try it. I found the last two cards that I needed. I'm going to keep building collections for this game. There's so many different factors in this, and uh, I think kicking off like different strategies that publishers have used and maybe that we might think to use would be a great way to take the combo. After we get some comments, yeah, ooh, I was gonna say from our friends, your analogy just now, reprinting I think is inherently better for players and worse for collectors, unless reprinting leads to growth of the game, which then increases a collectability score. Yep. Because there's more people that want the thing that's being trying to be collected. Yeah. But as you also mentioned, there's a lot of people that aren't just players or collectors. Yeah. So yeah, there's a little bit of everything. Yeah. But it's a it's a tough spot because you also don't want to uh, essentially if you have a collectible game, kill the collectability of your game by going too far with that reprint mentality. So yeah. Yeah. Right, it's comments. There are a lot of good comments. Right, I'm gonna, gonna pay start. attention to the ones you're bringing. Ah, oh, my my face. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, Chris Gilbert, why does a company benefit if the cards go to a million dollars on the secondhand market? I can't get my head around that. So I think the biggest piece of this is it, me it, it inspires confidence in future products and it means that they likely sold everything yeah. that they made. And then if the people that bought those things all, like if, let's say you're selling to a bunch of retailers and they are all sold out, the next time you're doing that thing, the, there's going to be a lot of confidence and you're probably going to sell out again. A good comparable here to me, I meant to mention this earlier, is the company, I think they got bought, and it's been, it's weird now, but the Mondo print company, mm -hmm. they would, you know, print 200 of a poster, but, and they would charge like a little inflated, but not crazy prices. It's like 50, 80 bucks a poster. Mm -hmm. um, and the special edition art and this whole thing. And pretty much everything they put out sells out in a couple minutes. And then they move along. Yeah. And then those things over time are just worth, money and it's like people buying high art and and getting it and but they've created an ecosystem where they know every time they're going to sell out they're going to make the money they want to make and they get to move along yeah and that's that they don't have to speculate that, that's the main thing that's the advantage there is that they are going to know consistently that they're going to get this much return on a project that they do and if they can be very confident that's going to happen every time they can move forward by just go project 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 and always get the same return. And then it's like, if everybody's getting paid well and everyone's happy, then like, why try to get more? We may as well just take the sure bet as opposed to print 500 posters next time, 1,000 posters next time, 2,000 posters next time. Oh, they're overprinting these posters. Uh, next time they print them, nobody buys them. Like, isn't that crazy? It actually yeah. happens like that quite often. Uh, so it's just, it's just certainty, I would say. Adam, what would the drawbacks be for a publisher to just kickstart each set that they release or for a reprint? With Kickstarter, they're able to know how much to print. Mm -hmm. oh, there's a lot. I, I think there's, I know a lot of people that won't touch a Kickstarter. Yeah. Um, they don't, you don't want to prepay way in advance. Kickstarter itself has no obligation for someone to fulfill on that thing. 
So you're buying it months in advance, um, and even just buying before people print. I think you would be shocked. Like, so one of the primary things we've offered for years is a subscription service where you can sign up and automatically receive future expansions for whatever game that you want. And the number of people that don't buy product, like we usually charge two to four weeks before something comes out. Mm -hmm. um, but the number of people that don't buy product until it is on the shelf, or yeah. it's physically in front of them, or it's like I can order it and it'll ship to me right now, is high. Super high. Yeah. So, and even from a Kickstarter project perspective, specifically those platforms, like running a campaign is a lot of work. Um, and so I think the effort involved and the number of people that want to prepay and all that kind of stuff. Um, and then you also have that, men I think the mentality on crowdfunding is people have feel a lot more ownership mm -hmm. of it and they expect a lot more in terms of communication and and goodies and and just stuff. But that said, you're, you're keying on something that's really important, which is can we f pull any kind of lever to give us a better idea of demand for something we're about to print? Kickstarter is really good for that. Game Founder is really good for that. So those two services. We did something similar with Beta for Eric's Curioso where we ran pre-orders for a limited time well ahead of advance to try to get more information about what the demand would be to inform that print run. So if you're going in totally blind, you're right. Like that is very questionable. But having Kickstarter campaigns that are going to give you at least an initial idea of demand, right? So think about Altered, right? Altered... If Altered released their Kickstarter and they got $100,000 or the $6 million that they actually got, that is a vastly different it's confidence crazy. that they go into the printing booth with. Yeah. Same thing with Sorcery. They got $4 million on that Kickstarter. That gave them information that they then used to best inform their print runs. Yeah. So like, it's and a good tool to use, but you can't catch everybody. In fact, I would say you catch well less than half with those, those mechanics. And even with that information Sorcery had, right? Like... You then still have a situation where it comes out, and then distribution retails like it evaporates. Yeah, and part of that too is the first release, particularly, is in so crazy to try to predict because uh, when they're you're deciding how much to print, people don't even have the game yet. So mm -hmm. yeah, I'm reminded of Star Wars Destiny and it's the exact thing, which was it, they previewed it at Gen Con in August. General reception from players and retailers was like, "This game is not it. This is not good. It's going to be the vibe it's got was this chunky dice. Yeah, the vibe was like dead on arrival." Who's, they're making a collectible game in 2016? Like, it's crazy. Um, but then that pre-release week hit, the week before it came out, people played the game, actually. And it was like, oh, this is great. Mm -hmm. uh, then it released a week later, and within, like, three or four days, it was just suddenly gone. Um, so, you know, maybe you could back to... But, like, again, especially with games releasing a set every four months, like, you would have to be pre-selling this next set before this one is even in hand in order and that that's like who one mm -hmm. who's going to do that and pdp with ashes is getting close yeah. so that's like that's a consistent prediction model uh where you know if if there are x many subscribers you're going to have a print run and it's going to be x size and that works really well yep. uh, for ashes but it's never never going to approach the scale of uh, a even small uh, TCG, like a Sorcery or a Alpha Clash or anything like that. So if you're wanting to get as much product as you can out to the market, if you will, um, especially collectible product, that's when some kind of understanding of early demand is good, but it is not at all going to be everybody who you could possibly sell this product yeah, and is going to want it. One of the biggest upsides for collectability is that you can play draft. So how draftable or how good a draft experience is, I think does a lot in terms of how much of the product gets consumed or mm -hmm. opened. We saw it with heavy hitters. Like heavy hitters did well better than most of the fab sets in the past year or two. Yeah. So and it's very tough as a developer to really appreciate how much people are going to enjoy the limited format or not. Like I've seen it a thousand times at this point. Yeah. It'll be this is the best one we've ever made. And then you play it and then some people are like, mm. and then other people are excited about yeah. it. But you have a if you have a large audience, a singular limited experience that all of them are as excited about is it's not every set. Yeah. What else are you imagine? Uh, isn't the problem is that people enter TCGs for speculating slash reselling? LCGs don't have that problem. Yes, you're right. LCGs don't have that problem until they do, um, which we saw in Arkham and uh, others. Some of the Game of Thrones packs. Uh, once if there's a really popular pack that they printed ten thousand of everything and it was going along 5,000, 1,000, I don't know what their numbers were. 
But once it sells out of distribution, yeah, the same thing will happen. Yeah. Like wow. the, a lot of those early Arkham packs, those Mythos packs, were yeah. $50, $100, 200 S Express, right? Yeah. Wasn't that one of them? Yeah, because they have cards in Museum, I think, was one of them. Yeah, they have cards everybody yeah. in needs. This is just human but reality. That situation, reprints <clears throat> aren't a concern. Yeah. They, at that point, if it's just the one pack that's gone hard to get, you can reprint. Mm-hmm. and. Current players or whatever are not going to be like, oh, I can't believe they're you know doing this thing. Although, I mean, <laughs> I don't know because there is a risk still. There's always a risk to reprinting something that you don't know everyone's going to like want to buy. So you could reprint 10,000 Essex County Expresses and distribution wants 2,000 and 8,000 are in your Asmodee warehouse for the next 20 years. Yeah, that's the risk of doing mm-hmm. that. And especially that particular one because it's a whole campaign. And so it's like... Do you reprint the whole thing? Right. Or do you just reprint that one thing? Right. But then everything else sells out, and now are you... And it's really costly to reprint at that point. Mm-hmm. It'd be easy just to move move along. But Yeah. And they didn't reprint for a long time on Essex County. Okay. It, it, was it was painful for a long. very, very long yeah. time. You can't play that campaign without it creating. Mm-hmm. I thought this was particularly concise. I think you've hit the point, but... He says it very well. Nick says, I think it's a problem for the game to actually last and support a player base. For sports cards, demand is all that matters. That's right. I think for those kind of, for those just strictly collectible releases, you can err on underprinting, let your card prices go wild, and uh, you know print the next set and expect it to do well. Yeah, hundred percent. Keep going. AJ Brown, there's truly a line you have to walk between accessibility up, and collectability. That's why special treatments make the most sense. Those are for collectors and max rarity people. Mm-hmm. You know, is there a is there a limit to that? Star Wars Unlimited is trying to find it. <laughs> With the hyperspace uh, thing. If there is a limit to it. but So the most raw form of collectability is where it started, which is simply the ability to play the card. Like that is also like that was the supreme level of collectability that we even faced in our small play group in Chelsea, where like one person has the card. And if you want to play the card, it's really not practical to to get to buy it or to buy packs to try to find it. You either try to trade that person for the mm-hmm. card or you just cannot play it. And I think I think that idea has changed so much where where players should be able to play anything in the card pool. Mm, as is, a mentality. Is the mentality. Yeah, and 100%. so you say you start with the idea, I should be able to play anything I want. And then you say, these collectors are getting in the way of that, or this collectability model is getting in the way of that. We come from a time when you were not expected to be able to play everything in the set because you didn't have it. Yeah. And so you played with what you had. And sometimes you played with like one of the things. And you walked home uh, both ways uphill at the same time. Yeah, while it was so, snowing. Yeah, of course. Um, there was that basketball goal there you'd stop at <laughs> and shoot 100 free throws, you know. And, you know, a lot of this, uh, as competitive play became more important and as it became more lucrative... And as you could win $1,000 if you won a tournament, suddenly you needed every card or you're at a disadvantage. Mm-hmm. Um, you can when, just see how this happens. It's so yeah, funny. When we were playing and it didn't matter. I mean, it did matter. But it did. Just. But it didn't. Not in the same way. Really. Uh, it was like, I'm going to try to beat you with my strung together, you mm-hmm. know, droid deck in Man, Star Wars. I remember making trades with people just to so they could have a better chance at beating like one of Jason's decks. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It's like, Pass hey, I'll, I'll give you a good deal on this because I just need someone to be Jason. Yeah. Yeah, that's accurate. Hey, so, yeah, so it's a that's a tough... Uh, that, that's kind of what it comes down to is, like, if you think you need to have access to every card in the card pool, which ostensibly, yes, is the answer to that now, then the greatest form of collectability from a uh, rarity standpoint is if you don't get the card, you can't play it. So then if we remove that, and let's say we just stay, we just have every card in the set available. Let's say we do this, because there's tons of talk about this. I've heard it for the past X number of years. I heard it during the LCG days. Why don't we print an LCG pack, mm-hmm. let players have access to all the cards, and then we print a companion thing that has random stuff in it that's exciting. Like a draft box. Yeah. Yeah, I've, I've heard that. Or wow. that like a, a pack of five cards that has foil versions of the cards that you can get for twenty bucks the whole set. Um, those are options. Uh, those are those are types of options. But I do think that there comes a point where it gets so complicated or so complex mm-hmm. to try to collect something that really at the end of the day, like a lot of the collectability is, I get to play Lightning Bolt. <laughs> and then it goes to I get to play a fancy version of Lightning Bolt, and then mm-hmm. it goes to I get to play a serialized 
fancy version of lightning bolt, and then it goes to, I get to put a one of two serialized fancy off color foil version of lightning bolt in my binder. And like, as you just continue to spin out these variations, it, to me, it just, it just, I don't know, it kind of, it kind of destroys the, uh, the romance of the collectible nature. Yeah. Um, it comes a little too overt. It, it reminds me a little bit of our altered conversation. Um, and that, that got brought up because obviously with the codes and the ability to print more cards, like technically you're sort of solving this problem to an extent. Mm -hmm. If I were them, I would intentionally underprint. Cause, right, because the physicality is yeah. material. Um, but, you know, the thing that hit me is I, I bought a handful of boxes of Star Wars Unlimited, which we played last week. And I did it. I did the math. I've, I've done this game a thousand times. Um, and it was basically like, I should get ish a place out of like commons, uncommons, and rares, which is most of the game, right? Mm -hmm. Then you have the legendary like hard again. Then you have the hyperspace and all the whatever you want to collect. Um, so it's also an element of like when you talk about accessibility of cards, the majority of cards in a collectible product and a collect fabs the same way, right? Like you you buy three or four boxes, you probably have commons and rare playset. Mm -hmm. And then you'll have a decent number of Majestics, and you. And my goal with Unlimited is like I'm not trying to collect it all, but I will have enough Legendaries that I, before. I can probably trade into the one or two decks that I'm trying to build, mm -hmm. kind of a thing. Um, and so there's like a when you talk about a separate non-collectible thing, it's sort of solving a problem that a lot of collectible games don't really have. Yeah, like you kind of do, but really don't because it's like if you bought three boxes of Unlimited. You probably have a play set of common and common rare, and so then you're and I one of the decks I built um, is has like six legendaries in it, and I opened all of them. But mm -hmm. even if I didn't, that's so few cards, and it's so easy these days with places like eBay or TCG Player to just get those things, and that's I've changed the whole dynamic of this this equation. But when you th when I think about like an uh, even if there was a non collectible thing I could have bought just to get a play set. It's kind of the thing that's already happening. Yeah, for well, most of the cards. And I think the outliers are like Spring Tunic, uh, yep. Vader, mm -hmm. like th these kinds of cards that a lot of people want and that everybody needs. And it's a few of the very hard to get cards. I know Unlim Unlimited has some of these mm -hmm. that stick up the whole problem. So tell me, tell me this in the reprint combo. You know, early on, Flesh and Blood goes wild during Crucible of War. If mm -hmm. they printed a 10-card uh, pack for $10, that was Spring Tunic, Courage of Blade Hold, all these, all the heavy hitters. Skull Cap. Yeah, Skull Cap, all of these. And they sold CNC that. CNC East Rank. Uh, yeah, exactly. Three of CNC, three of East Rank. Mm -hmm. What happens? What do you think happens? Um, I think they sell a lot of it. Yeah. Okay. And then I think those things are... Very uh, cheap mm -hmm. to get. And then what happens? Nothing? I don't know, man. Is it fine? I mean, because if it's fine after that, then everybody's been absolutely bamboozled. So this is, but this is like the Pokemon thing. They do this thing. Because they mm -hmm. also don't know which cards are going to be the highest value cards. Yeah. Because there's a mixture, like you talk about Fando Spring Tune it. It and Skullcap. Skullcap was very expensive for a while. Yeah. And then Crown of Providence came out and Skullcap was not expensive anymore. <laughs> like it, yeah. it went to the floor. Yeah. Um, it's just strictly better headpiece. Same would happen if there was a chess piece that came out that was just better than tuning. God forbid. <laughs> um, so with Pokemon though, you know, obviously the Charizard card is going to be worth a lot. That's just how it, that, that, that happens every set or two. They say, yeah, it's a hard to get Charizard. That's shiny. Um, but, you know, I think about, uh, a lot of times, the, the cards that kind of end up shining through, and you'll see this, a, bit, a deck wins, a surprise deck wins a tournament, and suddenly on those cards are like more expensive now because people are like, ah, I need to go buy three copies of this, and then sure. they're gone. Um, so Pokemon solves that by just being, you know, six months later, it's like, ah, here's a pre-con starter deck that includes those expensive cards. Mm -hmm. um, and the collectors in Pokemon hate that. <laughs> But they're still there. Yeah. Uh, so, like, why are we why are we worried about this? Yeah. There, this the biggest card game in the world is taking highly collectible cards and reprinting them to the moon, mm -hmm. and they're fine. Yeah. So, like, why is this actually a problem? 
why not reprint your most expensive cards like Pokemon does? Does anyone have an answer to that? Because like I, I'm I'm out. Well, I do know. I'm gonna get on the bulk box if, on this one, man. You're if, supposed to have an answer, you know. If you just reprint, I'm sure there's a, a good argument here. <laughs> uh, but if if you just reprint just put a your in. most high value things, right? Then what happens is the next set comes out. And it's like, oh man, this is the card. This is the card that's like really good. And then I think what happens is everyone's like, oh, we'll just wait till they put out. The, and this happens to Pokemon too, right? So you're you're creating a the upper limit of what a Pokemon card can be valued at mm -hmm. in the short term now is way lower yeah. than most other games. So I think what ends up happening, the question would be, do less does less product ultimately sell because of this, right? Because if I know. If I want three Command and Conquer, and I have a couple ways to do it, I can buy boxes, I can buy singles, mm -hmm. or I can trade. So if there's a demand for Command and Conquer and this comes in a booster box, what happens is, and a lot of stores live on this, which is they sell singles. So if the expectation is that any high value card is going to get you know, just destroyed because it's just going to get printed in some mm -hmm. annual pack that comes out that is all the things that are really... Maybe, maybe your policy as a publisher is any card... On the secondary market, over fifty dollars. We're gonna print in a pack twice a year, mm -hmm. and just that's the that's the upper limit for us on this. Mm -hmm. um, I think a publisher could see sales of boxes go down in the in the opening and et cetera of boxes if that is what's happening. Mm -hmm. But there's a ton of people right now doing the, the EB math on Pokemon boxes and deciding how many to open and how many to list and how many to sell. And you don't know which ones they're going to print and start or not, if they're ever going to do it. Or maybe it's Yu-Gi-Oh. I don't know which one it is. Yeah. Um, so the other part of this, though, is you look at Fab. And like Command & Conquer has been a $20 to $80 card for almost the entire game's existence. And for me, in a collectible game, a card that you can play in, and often do play in pretty much every deck in the game, same with Tunic. It's like for a long time it was at Two hundred dollars to two two fifty, but it was a chess piece that went in like eighty percent of decks mm -hmm. that you could use in all these things. Like I don't, I don't have, I don't see a problem with that. If there's, if Tunic was a five thousand dollar card and it was necessary to play in tournaments, I think you do have a problem. Mm -hmm. So you're basically saying it's okay for uh, the gate of competitive play to be in the hundreds of dollars. Maybe thousand of dollars for anyone who wants to play at a competitive level. It is for me. Yeah. And the question is, how many play? Like Fab is not didn't struggle with people getting tunics. Mm -hmm. There were even with those prices, there were enough people willing to pay for a tunic. Yeah. That their tournaments were like effectively selling out at the big level. And the bet there would be that we're willing to accept this X hundred, if not thousand dollar entry fee for anybody who wants to play in any highly competitive way because we think it is going to drive more sales of existing booster boxes. I think that's, that's part the of math that's being done. I think another part of it too is when games actually don't die, which we've been a lot, a part of a lot of those, <laughs> um, these things that you're buying have value. And so when you decide not to do this thing anymore, it's not like this is like in an LCG, it's, I effectively felt for the most part, it was like, this is money I'm never getting back. Right. If I want out, there's not an out. Mm -hmm. uh, now, in some cases, that's not true. Like some of the old Netrunner stuff is very expensive. Yeah, once everything goes out of print, yeah, yeah, then it's collectible. But there was years there where it was like you would be lucky to get a third of what you paid. Mm -hmm. And it, it's going to be hard to find someone who just wants it all because you can just buy it all new off the shelf. Right. And do your, do your thing. Um, so there is like weird upsides, even for players. Uh, I think of someone like Eric Wainwright, right? Like, yeah, like we talked about it. He earlier. gets to essentially play for free because hmm. he just drafts and sometimes he's down money, but he got the experience. Like he, he would be willing to do it if he got no cards at the end of the night. But the fact that it, it, the art, sometimes you do open a $200 thing. It's like, okay, mm -hmm. off to the races. And that's, it that's part of the collectible thing. Whether or not that's good or bad or I don't know. Is it is it good or bad? Can somebody give me the answer on this, Jonathan? Do you have do you have any comments? I, I, there's got Thanks, to Mark. be commentary on this. What do you need to know? Ugh, is it? What are we doing in the collectible games world? Is it worth doing? Like, is it actually the right decision? I don't know. 
<laughs> you don't have the answer from the, the answer. Nobody has the comment that finally settles no, this? So no. here's, here's what I will say on that. Because if collectability doesn't matter, then reprinting doesn't matter. Here's what I will say. I My favorite way to play card games at this point is drafting. Mm -hmm. And the only sustainable business model I've seen that allows me to continue engaging with the same game over and over in new ways through draft has been the collectible model. I can figure that out. I also really enjoy uh, playing games like this with lots of different people. So it's possible there's other solutions to this thing. Yeah. But co a collectible card game is, at this point, an institution, an easily understood one. And I think that's what we talk about LCGs, right? Uh, several years ago, I, it was a, we were talking about the, our podcast, and you said something that has always has stuck with me since then, which is... LCGs effectively lower the barrier of entry on cost and accessibility to the, probably the maximum. Yeah. And I think the theory is if you lower that enough, then there should be a, a significant increase in interest or demand because, like, there's way more people that can be involved in this kind of thing. Mm -hmm. um, and my experience is that's actually not the case. Right. The it was, it, At least this is not proportional. Mm-hmm. It's so much more accessible. You would expect there to be way more people. But still, you if there was a Star Wars LCG that came out of Star Wars Unlimited, I would, even beyond the fact that a booster Dollars box makes, donuts, makes yeah. a lot of money, like you know, a $15 a month pack or booster boxes for $120 that you might buy anywhere from one to 30 of as a person, one is economic. 30. Dude, there's a reason we have a 24 per household limit on the website. Because, <laughs> you know, people be cray. Anyways. I'm going to go take a call. So the, I actually do. I might just yeah, yeah. Let's get John in here. Ooh. Tag him in. Tag him in, coach. I mean, I gotta, I'm getting a no, storage you're, container. Delivered. You're good, man. You do. i got to get my hat back. On um, <laughs> so, oh, man. You can, re, you just, can roll that one right back. Just lost it. Uh, so what was I even saying at this point? I don't know. It was something LCGs very intelligent. LCGs being more accessible. Yeah. Um, but the the moment, even the oh, be, here. beyond even the uh, basic fundamentals of how much more you a publisher slash retailers can make off of collectible games, right, is the fact that there is genuine excitement about it being like people love collectible games. Yes, that is. So that's where I, I always end up on this discussion is that there I have been in the industry now for a while. Sorry about the hair, everybody. Or lack thereof. Um, but I have yet to see a non-collectible LCG format competitive card game last any length of time or develop any sort of grand amount of hype. Netrunner did, but then they got the stuff taken out of it, and it had lost some steam, but it yeah, gained some steam it back. It definitely lost some steam. Um, Ashes is currently going on through uh, PDP, which is kind of a special case. Yeah, but even that is... When you talk about building a city from that hype, mm -hmm. that's not a hype game, right? Like Ash is one of the greatest games, one it's of like, games of all time. But like, I, and I don't know, I don't know if this is true, but it's it an analog maybe be like if you're going to release the thing that you've been spending your entire life on to create your your card game, your magnum opus, the thing that you love dearly. Um, it's it's the difference between releasing it in film to theaters and releasing it on VHS straight to video. LCG always has this weird straight to video feel, and I don't know why that is. And it could just be a perception. <laughs> That's awesome. But like, if you That's want a, to make I the like grand that. entrance into the thing, the yeah. it, it always, for whatever reason, mm -hmm. and not saying that the mathematics of this add up in any way, but for whatever reason, the collectible model seems to be the way to make your debut. Yeah, well, I mean, it, it makes sense in terms of when you're talking about a film, a worldwide theater, theatrical film release. Um, if you're doing that, even thinking about the marketing that makes sense for that mm -hmm. and the general awareness, mm -hmm. and then the idea that, like, it's worth investing the resources to make this this film, like Dune 2 came out, right? Yeah. And, like, it's worth investing the resources to make sure the world knows this movie is coming out. Mm -hmm. So now there's more people that get exposed to it, more people talking about it, more people that watch it. So someone that watched that film, uh, which I thought was excellent, by the way, but someone who watched that film, um, now there's a lot of people that I can engage with on that. Mm -hmm. And I think right. in, a, in, a, in a tabletop setting, that's even more important than anything else. Yeah. Because um, even if it's the best game ever and it was super accessible and super affordable, mm -hmm. if no one else is aware of it or playing, it's not worth that much. Yeah. Like, 
And you know, even like, so my my son's four-ish years old. And we go to McDonald's every once in a while. <laughs> I love that picture. Out town. Yeah, out on the town, it's, Mickey D's. Uh, yeah, we're going to McDonald's, and they're putting collectible card games in this Happy Meal. Pokemon. We got Crash Crazy. Bandicoot. We got a Pokemon pack. It was a four-card pack. One of them was foil. Yeah. And then it had a little thing that you flip and you look at a certain number depending on what it says and the highest number at the table wins. A little mini game of Just so you can like get the cards in your hand, but the foil is shiny. And then you've got the story about your wife. She opens packs, collectible card game packs. Yep, loves it. And she doesn't know anything about the cards. Yep. But she knows when something cool has yep. appeared in her hand. And that just doesn't happen with LCGs. And I, there's something about, you want to talk about <laughs> player focus <laughs> stuff. Right now are like, hilarious. You, whenever you can get your cards in people's hands, whether or not they're even playing the game, that's one step closer to them playing the game. Yeah. Did uh, did did little John enjoy opening his pack? Uh, he was nonplussed. He was not excited. He's like, I don't know why they keep giving me all these card games. I don't know how to play these cards. He's just like, uh, <laughs> yeah. The Crash Bandicoot one was not uh, not a good one. It yeah. was like it was like it was. I was surprised know. it even existed. Yeah, that's yeah, crazy. Yeah. Um, so people are saying. <laughs> Uh, that's no. fun, funny. Hold on. Uh, Sriracha is saying it's called gambling. Yeah. Um, which, you know, maybe maybe there's a dark side here, right? Mm-hmm. Which is like this is perhaps is it, should we be questioning our existence? I think the difference to me, like I've had the gambling conversation a lot, and mm-hmm. I understand people that are like a no on TCGs. Get, get it. it. And it's similarly, like um, I know a handful of people who won't get anywhere near alcohol mm-hmm. because they cannot control themselves right. either. Right. Right. So whether it's a personal thing or you're just philosophically don't you know don't agree with the the model and the premise etc mm-hmm. but i will say one of the key differences for me between this and gambling is that when i go to a craps table uh there's a hundred percent chance i'm going to walk away with zero money <laughs> <laughs> um and, and in particular enough. usually when you're gambling for me to win someone else has to lose mm-hmm. now sometimes you have house games where for me to win the, the house lost or vice versa but in a collectible game, when you open a, you buy a booster box, right? Like a boot box of unlimited. Mm-hmm. Um, it's randomized, and I don't know what I'm going to get. But at the same time, I do know I'm going to get this many cards. Right. And I can play the game and have this experience. Right. And for me, I'm okay with the randomness of it because I don't care which cards I get. Right. Like I just want to get cards. Yeah. So, anyways, on the on the game, it's not if you open a pack and it's like sometimes this will have playable cards in it, and sometimes it'll just be blank cards. That's gambling. Well, the, the uh, yes. Uh, the other thing that's interesting about that is like, let's say I have a task that I'm not particularly excited about doing in my life. What I have to do is I have to trick myself by like getting myself close to the task that I'm doing with a fun task. <laughs> it's like, I'm going to go to my I'm computer. Gonna I'm going to turn on some music I like. Oh, I'm already on my computer. I better start editing kind of thing. <laughs> but like that's the same way with these games, right? It's mm-hmm. like, well, I don't know if I'm going to play this game or not, but like I could crack some packs and see what the art looks like and see if we got any shiny stuff. And then that's your step. And even the interesting thing is even um, in defense of collectible card games, which I don't even know. The new I title really of the stream. This stance. <laughs> um, but at the end of your draft game at Sorcery Con, you guys just cracked, you guys got some packs for being at the final table and you just opened them. Mm-hmm. And it was fun to see what you got. And instead of the end of that interaction with your opponent being the game is over, mm-hmm. see you later, it's like, okay, let's do this thing that still interacts with the game and is fun and is like a non-competitive way to have fun with the game. Yeah, it was a fun moment. Yeah, which is something that you can't really get with LCGs. An LCG is much like a board game in the fact that the game is the game is Mm -hmm. the game. Mm -hmm. But there are so many variants when you put it in a collectible format that that may be why it's so different for a game to come out in a collectible way. Yeah. I also, we often cite the the game outside the game. Yes. Collectability is a game that you get to play. So... I don't you know. either get to play or hate playing. Uh, yeah, when you were out, I was talking about I have no no issues with people that don't want to play that part of the game. Yeah. Uh, and another thing, too, I think a lot of... I, I think it might surprise people how many people engage with collectible games and never buy a booster box. Or hmm. maybe even packs at all. I I, I know, especially in Magic, it's me. like super common how many people will just buy singles. Yeah. They'll just buy the deck they want. Like even in Fab right now, if you wanted to buy the deck you want, once you own like Tunic, CNC, East Strike, I think the average deck is like a three or four hundred dollar experience, like competitive level mm-hmm. deck. Um, and that's just especially like looking now, there's fifteen, like twelve, thirteen sets out. That's just that would be 
if, if you want to enter competitive constructed play, that's what you're doing. And it's kind of a weird para paradigm where it, attaining cards has become so streamlined that it is it, it starts to feel this this fuzzy line between act like collectability in an olden day sense and modern day is very different because of that piece of the puzzle. Yeah, it kind of I mean it makes it less fun, right? If you have fun doing that, it makes it less fun. Yeah, I mean it used to be fun, and, and Jonathan and I talk about this all the time, going to the old you know fantasy fair conventions in Dallas and. I'd have six of my superhero card set that I was missing, and I'd try to find the guy that had Fleer 94, and then I'd try to find the cards, and when I found them, it felt great. Yeah. It was really fun. And yeah. that that journey and that search can be very enticing. But now it's just like, it's just dollar, dollars. Dollar dues. You just go on the, on the website and say, do I have the dollars, and do I want to spend them on this? Yes, no, I've collected it. It's like, it's not the same. It's just not the same. You know what else is collectible? First generation Toyota Tacomas. <laughs> <laughs> I know where you can get one. No, that's real. Because like I'm looking at new sponsor of the show, Tacoma and Nalgene, making your life an adventure. Um, I seriously, I uh, don't like anything past those first generation Toyota Tacomas because I love weird things, and they're not tier two, Zach. Before you say it, they're not tier two. They're not modern. They no, only I have cassette players in them, but the body style is so much better. In 2005, they switched to this mid-sized garbage truck where everybody's got, you know, got to have mm -hmm. a 16-foot wingspan on their freaking yeah. Tacoma. Yeah. And they make the big, the, the, you know, the little the circular big, uh, like I'm an aggressive truck kind of stuff starts happening. Before then, though, it was just a, it was just a hard-working truck. I'm, I'm running into a similar situation. And now I'm trying to find them, and they're hard to find, and so prices have gone up because mm, they're not they're a collectible, collectible thing. You're into collectible trucks, man. I'm not into collectible <laughs> trucks. They got into me. Like, yeah. I, I'm into you found that your way style into of it. truck, yeah. and I found out that there's not enough of them because every year less of them exist. Yeah, I, uh, I'm i running a similar because I'm looking to replace my 2002 Toyota Camry. Um, and it turns out what's happened in the car market is interesting because – you either get a tiny car or an SUV, mm -hmm. and that anything in between is like just impossible. Yeah. And a lot of models getting rotated out and stuff. And all that. Uh, Ryan, Ryan quoted me saying, "I like weird things." By the way, I'm starting to understand why we're friends. Because you're weird. I think that's what happened. <laughs> yeah. Because I like weird things, and you're weird, so I like I like you. That's a, the, yeah. <laughs> the idea. And I started thinking about like the kind of <laughs> the kind of cards and decks we're typically drawn to. Yeah. yeah. And then I was like, wait a second, it can't be overt, man. Am I a tier two person? That's also I. <laughs> and, then, and then, and then I thought, and is Steven like, you know, a tier one person? I only like I'm a tier one I'm like person. A, I'm like a tier, tier one point five person, I guess. Yeah, you're like a weird tier one. I like a tier one that that's working hard. Like, yeah, that can get it done. I feel know? like you like tier two that can be made into a tier one point five. That's right. If you squeeze it hard enough. Yeah, it's like if you really try. Yeah. This could be in the conversation. Okay. So, so anyways, so here's here's is then though. This is let's just divorce the cards completely. Caleb, you're off meta, Zach. Delete delete the cards. All right, hold on. There are no cards. Done. We don't even need to live in this world anymore. I love 2001 and 2005 Toyota Tacomas. Yep. Number one. Noted. I am having a very hard time finding one right now, a double cab, because, you know, I might need that. Uh, if they started reprinting mm. the 2001 to 2005 Toyota Tacoma, mm -hmm. I would love it. I wouldn't feel bad because my my old 2001 Tacoma that I currently yep. own is suddenly worth less or suddenly is, hard, is easier to find. I would be overjoyed that I could finally drive the you truck that I want. I have a similar category for you. Okay. <laughs> These. These are Air Jordan 1s. <laughs> That's what I walked into. Yeah. These are uh, Air Jordan 1s. So Jordan's first basketball shoe. The first one he ever wore. No. But this is the style of shoe. You'll see the little logo over here. Mm -hmm. That's the Air I've Jordan heard you're logo. kind of a low-key sneaker guy, too. Well, just, you know, we're anyways, just different. Th these are my favorite shoes. It reminds me of the truck conversation. Yeah, yeah, okay. Which is like those shoes didn't come out and they weren't collectible. But as soon as they came out, they sold out immediately, and the world went nuts. They were the first black basketball shoes. Okay. Like, the shoe itself was black, right? right? Um, they, they got banned from the NBA, and there were fines, and, like, it's a whole thing, because there were rules. Your shoe had to be, like, 85% white. Oh, wow. And then Nike 
agreed to pay the fines for Jordan so he could wear these shoes. Wow. And then they, the marketing was like uh, a shoe the NBA had to ban. Like kind oh, of a thing. Tale as old yeah, as it's just just tantalizing. <laughs> I like the comments <laughs> coming through. Um, but so if they never remade those shoes, that would be really sad because I was not born when those shoes came out. Uh huh. And I love those shoes. So you benefited from the reprint. They reprint them. They reprint them all the time in different <laughs> colors. Like this is not the original exact yeah. configuration. Um, and like there are a couple different Jordans that I really love. But they will reprint occasionally, and every time they reprint, it like sells out. Mm-hmm. And so you know, you find your different websites that sell these like secondhand refurbished, and it's a whole thing. Um, but anyways, so why is it good for shoes and trucks, but somehow it's not good for cards? I didn't say it wasn't good. But why, in the theoretical <laughs> world where we're not reprinting uh, things like the set that has tunic in it? Or uh, the first set of One Piece is a classic. First set of Sorcery Beta, right? Mm-hmm. Why is it good for trucks and shoes, but perhaps bad for cards? Well, it's important to know. Typically, is it because I can't drive a card to work. Well, or walk on it. Yeah. Uh, the other thing is, if I wear these shoes, they will wear out. Yeah. So they're consumable. With cards, it's not the case. I mean, it can be. You know, that's an interesting angle that I was not expecting you to go. Um, like, when you have a tunic, as a fab player, I have tunic. Yeah. And I should have that forever. But if tunic only lasted two years and then the card was gone, they would have to make more of it. But there are people that put the shoes in a display case in the last row. 100%. Yeah, and they'll wear them like five times in their life. Now, if I, that. If I bought... And I, you know, I would have no idea how this would even happen. But if I bought... <laughs> An original edition Jordan ones that were released. Oh, let's go a step higher. Uh-huh. You can you can find like there's the pair of shoes he wore during the flu game, which is one of the most iconic pair of shoes and flu, games. When he had the flu, it was actually food poisoning. Does he still? I mean, are they still on the shoes? No, you can't get it from from where. But shoe? like you know, if you had that pair of shoes, it's like yeah, they would someone put. There's one of those. And you, it's like the one ring of Michael Jordan shoes. Yeah. It'd be crazy. It'd be, it's in a museum somewhere. Hmm. Um, so. Hmm. But that can't be the reason why reprints are good in that case and not bad here and bad here. I, I'm not saying they're bad here necessarily. I, I think reprints, um, even like Fab ended up reprinting Tunic in a different set. Yeah. And a, Tunic's fine. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I think uh, here's maybe a better question. Let's just assume you're going to play a collectible game. Okay. Bold. And collect it. Yeah. In some manner. Are you going to be buying the cards? Just let's I'll just, play if you buy. Let's just assume you're buying, collecting, playing the whole thing. Okay. What is your ideal scenario in terms of availability of cards for that game for you? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I see that. Huh. Let's see. I guess ideal for me <laughs> would be I have the entire collection to build with Oof. at a very reasonable price. And then I take my favorite, like, weird tier two ish deck and I foil it out. That's probably what I would do as a, as a player collector. If I could engage with a hobby without thinking about anything else in, in my life mm-hmm. and just kind of, you know, just I'm in a time chamber where this is just all that I do, that, that's what I would do. Yeah. Weirdly for me, like, I don't know that collectability matters. It drives action, but I don't know that it matters to me at all. Like, if if everyone in the, in just the dream state, if everyone who wanted to play could play for free, like if everyone could just have all the cards, mm-hmm. and there were a bunch of people that had all the cards and were playing, I... I'm trying to actually just genuinely suss out is the collectability relevant to me at all? Yeah. Now, if everyone was willing to pay twenty, like pay to draft, uh-huh. or to if we could draft it, uh-huh. and there were a lot of people that wanted to do it, uh-huh. even if it was free, let's just say it was free. Uh-huh. Um, but I don't know that that would be true. I mean, does collectability only exist because of LGSs? Maybe. Like, because the only way that you can play is because the store is open. And if the only way the store can stay open is by selling a lot of booster boxes, packs, and singles. Like, I guess my question would be, in kind of a response to that, why 
why are collectible games so popular? <laughs> 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 you know what I mean? Like, yeah. This is- that's what I was saying. Are there more players or are there just more buying? Is there just more buying from the same amount of players? Like, if if you remove the pizzazz. Oh. Yeah, what were you going to say? That's what I was saying in the chat, too. Is like, we I've, I've been down the road of collectible LCGs, et cetera. What can I say to you? But they just keep not working, and collectible games do. And that's the hardest puzzle for me to figure out. Why? Well, like, chess works. What's well, the I, oldest LCG on Earth? I think I think it's because so it doesn't expand. I guess is a problem. Well, that's the thing. So expandable games require active input from the developer slash publisher, and that's expensive. Mm-hmm. Matter, like, and the amount they can spend on art and the amount they can spend on continuing to create this experience mm-hmm. um, is directly correlated to the amount of money they can make. Right. Um, so collectible models have shown to be the they produce the most return for a, a publisher per player playing the game compared to any other model we've seen in tabletop yeah, games. Yeah, so far. It's not even close. Yeah. And so you can, you know, if you're a sm- indie small publisher of a collectible game, I think you can actually reasonably print three sets a year on two or 3,000 players mm-hmm. buying your product. Like, I think you can sustain that now it's not going to be a 1.5 million dollar pro circuit like you, you can't sustain it for sorcery if you're doing traditional art either well yeah but but it, it, uh, generally just to, generally speaking yeah. um and so the model that produces the outcome and allows for the continued production of the thing um because that's where earlier even you were saying like you know if you want tournaments i don't think it's that if you just want the game to keep mm, evolving new content and to con- be engaging with it it's the same reason that like um, you know, there any 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 content. If you look at movies, it's like if a movie, if Dune one came out and didn't make money, we don't ever get Dune two. Mm-hmm. And we were even saying earlier, like part of that is a theatrical release of a movie, even versus like a Netflix just dropping some movie or show. A theatrical release, particularly, um, has the propensity to produce so much result for the studio. They're willing to invest in the awareness and marketing piece to a different level. And now there's way more people aware of it and engaged in it. And the more people that watch a thing means the more people there are to engage and discuss about mm-hmm. the thing or to create you know, fandom about the thing and all that kind of stuff, which has value. But in tabletop, it's particularly valuable because you inherently need other people engaged in this thing for it to have any value uh, whatsoever. But with Ashes, we're seeing continued releases. New That's content is happening over yep. time. And the art is remaining at a high level. Mm-hmm. So it is working. But Ashes is also significantly smaller. In terms of player base. In terms of community size than a lot of games. Is that simply, though, a function of availability to play? Like, for instance, the LGSs, this is, I, I, I've seen this over and over in sorcery chats and stuff. And, and <laughs> Tony Hawk. It's a. It's a, it's a, we need to go back one question on the LGS question. So the first question that LGS has asked, of which we were one and plan to be one again very soon, in a different kind of way though. But um, we played the game early on and... Uh, we're the, kind of challenging every underlying assumption. The so. question is, players, I can't host tournaments for games if I don't have product to sell. Because that's, that's the entirety of the model. You use uh, events as an awareness mechanism. And then you get people in that were not currently engaged with you as a store. And then suddenly they're like, oh, what's sorcery? You're doing a sorcery event? Tell me more about the game. They start playing it. And because they start playing it, they go to your shelf and they buy boxes from you because it's easy and they happen to be in your in your store. Well, one counter to that would be you look at something like Sorcerer or Altered or any number of other games. And before even being in a store there's a large group of people buying it. Right, right. But the store argument is that I sell product because I host events, and I host events only if I can sell product. Yeah. Right, so that's the idea. And it makes sense for collectibles because, like, they have an easy booster pack that you don't have to get a tournament kit or an op kit for. You don't have to rely on publisher support through printing third-party accessories that you give out to tournament winners. You don't have to do much of anything. You just have to have a booster box that you can crack open and give three packs to the winner or whatever. Mm -hmm. So that's pretty easy. So my belief, you know, as as a standard LGS owner is that I can 
get players to come play this thing and when they play it i'll have the boxes on my shelf and they'll buy packs or they'll buy boxes and it will reward me for my efforts in getting them together and hosting a tournament which uh makes sense this that was what i would call the old or in many ways the current paradigm that spun out of the board game cafes and various other kind of models but if we reverse if we if we go back to that question and we say like if if events were possible without you needing to have products on your shelves, without you needing to sell product mm. to these people, mm -hmm. would a game like Ashes see a dramatic in increase in its player base because LGSs were hosting Ashes events without Ashes products on the shelf? Is that ultimately what is holding back a game like Ashes or in the old days, games like Game of Thrones, Netrunner, et cetera, from being sustainable in the way that a TCG is? Would they get as many players, maybe more players? Yeah, accessibility is super high, and then gameplay accessibility is super high. It's quality of the system is super high. Yeah. What's to stop them? Is it just that it's not collectible that's holding people back? Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know the end of I that. Because I also don't know, even if Ashes were 10 times as popular um, as it is, the, or 100 times, uh, the underlying model just makes less money. So if you had the same number of people playing Ashes as you did Magic, Plat Hat makes a lot less money than Wizards of the Coast makes. That's right, yeah. And Unless so, they're willing to pay 150 200 bucks for an Ashes pack. Well, they're yeah, not. Yeah, yeah, But presuming that's, <laughs> you know, things stay the way they are right yeah. now. Um, so that in inherently just means that the retailer selling it, the distributor, and particularly the publisher, makes less on the same, generating the same amount of popularity. Mm -hmm. And so I don't know if, if the condition was true that you said earlier would it be more popular? I presume it would be. But at the same time, even if it were, uh, that means that the resources the company has to either develop or support this thing uh, is less than this other model. Mm -hmm. And so whether or not that extra amount of support actually is what leads to the extra popularity or not, I don't know. Can we also just cut to the very bottom of this act, finally, after all of this? After the entire what, discussion, what is the bottom? bottom? Can I just oh, sum it up here? Oh, this is this is the. I got the bottom for you. He's throwing the hat off. <laughs> Listen, I got the the very deep well truth of this entire situation. You want to know what it is? It is fun to gamble. Yeah. Period. That's it's, it. It hits the, it, hits the brain. Is there a reason all the sports betting stuff is going wild? There's a reason everybody's in Vegas losing all their money. There's a reason everybody's playing the lottery and supporting the you know the schools and stuff. Is, there's a reason they're doing bar tabs in that bar that we were at and whatever that was. What was it called? Pull tabs uh, in uh, Seattle. You remember the, at the bar and they had that weird archaic stuff on the wall and it's like, oh, it's like tabs that you can gamble with while you're sitting here at the bar. I didn't know that. Yeah, you didn't know that at no. uh, the AJ's 24-7 cafe. Oh, you remember that? I do remember seeing that. I was so hungry though. <laughs> so you can the only thing like, I remember was that breakfast hash. You can pay like 50 cents or whatever and then maybe you'll win 100. Yeah. And and it can be a huge problem for certain personalities. And obviously we know this. There's gambling addictions. There are people that, that it just gets too out of control. It is fun to open a booster pack. But it's more fun to open a booster pack than a Mythos pack. 100%. And opening a Mythos pack is a chore, and, and then I need to organize it. Well, while you were gone, John was talking about the fact that Serena, my wife, enjoys opening packs with me. Yeah. And I've never opened an Ashes pack with her. Yeah, right. She might like that. She'd probably love it, actually. The art, at least. Uh, she she re she would like the art, but she really likes opening. Like, she'll open when she she knows it's a good thing. She's, she's like, like a foil, does this? like, shiny thing. And yeah. then I'm like, what did you get? And she's like, guess. <laughs> and it's like, I, I, I feel like it's only disappointing because I'm going to guess the most rare thing. Guess the card, win the card. And it's not going to be that. Um, but, you know, and I, I think you can take that all the way to, you know, is this degenerate gambling? And I was saying earlier, I don't think it's gambling. I mean, not gamble without it being degenerate. Like, the thing to me is, yeah, I think you can do that. But, and I, but like, it's hard. It's easy. A lot of people do that. Well, I think the, the other thing is, like, I bought a box of Star Wars Unlimited, and I don't know exactly what I'm getting. But I know that I can play Sealed and Draft, and I know that I will have cards to play the game with yeah. after. And so it's not the same. To me, gambling is, like, do I have a chance of walking away with nothing? Well, but, I mean, you can also make the same argument of, like, you're going to get a great experience, fun experience with blackjack, all these kinds of things, right? Like you're going to have a fun experience. You're going to have a fun time. You're going to hang out with your friends. You're going to be community yeah. Like, well, most of the time not. But that that can be a thing that we all do together and we have a great time. We won't walk away, like you're saying, with anything tangible. 
Most of the time. Certainly not any money. Yeah. Like, I don't know. Every time I go to a movie, I'm gambling. Like, is this worth my time yeah. and money? Um, in that kind of sense. But, like, if, if I paid 20 bucks to draft and walked away with zero cards, I would still be willing to do that. Because hmm. I enjoyed that experience enough. Yeah. But it is nice that also it comes with the benefit I'm, I get to play and then also build my collection. Yeah. And sometimes you hit the big card and you sell it for $300 and, like, now you pay for the next 10 drafts. Or you don't have to buy it for $300. That's normally and what I you save $300 yeah. and you get to play the card. Yeah, I, I see it as I got a draft experience for $20 and I save $300. Right. So I'm way up. Right. And so if we want to put a final uh, final note on the combo and maybe follow up with a few comments. Yeah. The the comments, there's so many good ones. <laughs> you go, y'all, are, y'all are going, hey, Austin, we've got a new system since there's about 200 of you on the chat. Are you chat. smashing the like button? Is that the new That's system? That's the system. Smash yeah, the, the more you button. smash the like button, the more we'll have conversations just the like this. The more Zach will put his shoes on the table. I've this got, was a, sh- a shoe on table kind of conversation. <laughs> I've got to do it. Hold on. I think I need to focus you. Can I do that? Uh, yeah, yeah, and a hat that. on head AFL sort of conversation. Uh, I don't know. I press them both. Terrence is oh. saying, is the juice worth there the squeeze is. is a phrase I've come to like. Yeah. You know what? You, you know, our mutual friend, Matt Phillips, Hates that. I said that to him a couple weeks ago mm. or a couple months oh, ago. The chat is going off on the emojis. Of and it. and he <laughs> was just like he repulsed. He hates juice. Yeah, just not a juice man. He's, yeah, he's always hated yeah, it. In his house, the juice is not loose. Here, here's the here's our new system. So we, we've got, we're, we're going to be kind of looking at our live streams and we're trying <laughs> to become more successful with these streams over time. We want to turn this into like the tabletop gaming show. Also, the hearts are not miss. likes, just so we're aware. <laughs> the hearts are not likes. No, no, no. But we like the I hearts. I still like the it. Heart. So uh, in the YouTube algorithm, obviously, <laughs> you know, the likes are good and the, and the views are good and those kinds of things are really important. Uh, so we're, we're going to be actively using that to, to figure out how to make the show better. Uh, and Jonathan's going to gonna be really you know, putting That's the screws in job. on that. Yeah. Now, we have increased our likes count since you got the John cam. That's un- Ooh, correlation. It's it, it's like, a one it, has, one. it has nothing to do with several times in a stream saying, please, for it's the love a, of it's everything that's good and holy, smash that like button. But my marketing take on this, I I think our, my marketing take on this is if you agree with Steven, like the video. Uh-huh. If you agree with Zach, subscribe to our channel. And whoever's it, just you know what's funny? It, last it, last it, time it was the opposite of and that. And if you agree with Jonathan, like and subscribe. Oh, there you go. And if you like all of us, leave a comment after this video is <laughs> out because comments matter too. <laughs> And also, if you really, really like us, just put these streams on in the background and let them roll and watch the whole thing over and over again. Last question, Zach. And maybe... <laughs> Whoa! <laughs> oh, the pa- there's so much power behind the desk right now. I'm there's glad so I'm leaving power. tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> this is getting wild in this room. I think this is what live streaming is supposed to look like. It is, yeah. If there's not, we need flame in here. Yeah. Here's, I think here's the, uh, maybe this would be the final take on reprints. Because we've already, we've gone around. Uh, the, he's putting a period on the The round has gone around plenty. <laughs> if we start with the premise that people enjoy and can responsibly gamble, it's a part of life. We gamble all the time. Sometimes actively in things that we know are gambles, sometimes in things that we didn't know were gambles. But everything that we do is essentially a gamble of a kind. So we start with that premise and then we say, the more packs that are out there of a certain set, the less exciting the gamble is because the cards are worth less Mm. and the easier they are to find. Then we can pretty quickly draw a straight line between if you reprint a set, it's going to be less fun to open those packs. Unless you're a player that needs those cards. And then it could be more fun because you get to open the packs that you could otherwise not open. So there's definitely like there's definitely a line there. And I think I think the ultimate reality on reprints is that a publisher is almost always, unless it's just a very short run, almost always uh, safer not reprinting something mm-hmm. than they are reprinting and missing. Because not reprinting something you won't sink the company. But reprinting and being very wrong could be the end of the game. Yeah. But also, if you were so wrong on your initial print, I think that's the biggest hazard. Mm-hmm. If your initial printing was so off that it actually uh, prevents people from engaging with the thing, that's what makes it tricky. Mm-hmm. I agree with you. The safest thing always is to do nothing. Yeah. <laughs> In that. If you've uh, achieved issue. success. Yeah. If you printed your boxes and sold them out, the safest thing is nothing. 
Mm -hmm. And it's also very tempting to always reprint more because if everyone, all the distributors and retailers are telling you, yeah, we buy, if you print this, we'll sell, we'll buy it. Mm -hmm. It's very tempting, especially yeah. if you're a smaller publisher. And like this, is, I mean, it's hard to say no. Um, and it's hard to know, actually, is there genuine interest at the end of this chain? Or do people just think there is? Right. Because, you know, at some point, I remember Destiny, people are driving six, eight, ten hours to find boxes. Right. They're calling every store. And so if you're a store and you get 20 calls a day about Destiny, you're telling a distributor, I want a thousand boxes. Right. <laughs> right. And then the distributor, and you're telling four distributors that. And yeah. then four distributors are telling the publisher, we need 200,000 boxes. <laughs> yeah. Stat. And, and then the publisher's like, I mean, I guess we'll print 200,000 more I'll boxes. I'll make a ton of cash. Great. Love then it. they show up, 20,000 sell. They end up half price online and on every shelf at retailers. And then your next product comes out and everyone's like, I don't know about that. Like yeah, they printed that. way too much last time. Yeah. Nobody wants it. And it's a nightmare. Players don't want it in stores. Oh, so want it. Pretty fascinating. Before and we... there are different strategies. Don't just reprint the set, reprint the card. And that's that's where, that's where we get that's where to Dropbox this. comes in. That we'll be playing a little bit later. So yeah. Now this this is it's that's like, where Magic's kind of doing that. And I don't know. Is it's it like, working? It's I like know. Fab did with Tunic, right? Mm -hmm. You have it in different sets. The original is still the most collectible. Like cold foil tunic. Like technically gold foil is the most, but cold foil tunic. Um, then you have the like crucible. I think they did rainbow foil tunic, maybe. Mm -hmm. Or non foil. It was non foil tunic. Mm -hmm. um, and then now you have like the non foil. Bright Lights Tunic, mm -hmm. uh, which is the cheapest of them all. And then it is worth noting, too, so that the, there's no uh, confusion about this. I see Cardboard Guide in the in the chat, um, and I know they're, uh, I believe, European sorcery players. In, in sorcery's case, you know, there are times where supply is so low to a region, I think like you're saying, yeah. that, like, it's not even really a reprint. Like, it's like, yeah. just get the first wave in. Because, like, if I print, you know, 500 boxes, which is not, I'm sure, the case of sorcery, but... If I printed 500 boxes and then it's like, should I reprint? It's like, you didn't really give it enough to, yeah, sure. to make that decision. You also have to, you know, one of the advantages places like Pokemon and Magic have is they print in the United States. Yeah. And they're at a really large scale. So they can actually reprint in a window that makes it not even feel like a reprint. Mm -hmm. Like maybe they want to have product for two months on the shelf, like a particular booster box. They see the first two weeks of trend, could potentially decide to print and have it on the shelves in two weeks. When you're printing, and it takes six months. Yeah, that's different. different vibe, yeah. I also think with like Sorcery's case, interestingly, even though uh, you know that they have not said one way or another what's going to happen or not or what their stance is, et cetera, um, with their once a year set mentality. That's different, isn't it? Like printing more inside of before even the next thing is out is very different. Yeah. It's like, well, is that even actually, like, are we reprinting? I don't even know what you would call this anymore. Mm -hmm. Anyways, I'm gonna get some more water and go to the bathroom, and then Wait, we can cover go, the news. Okay. There's one thing I want you to attempt. Can you and Steven formulate a question for people to answer in the comments? Question. The bet. The what's the impossible bet? What is the 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 reprinting? What would you do? Bet? That's how I want you to end this. Okay. How how would I do it? <clears throat> how would they do it? Yeah. The, what's the, the question? What's the viewers? fundamental question to ask here? Let's say you have a product. Mm -hmm. Let's say you printed the right amount for that time. Mm -hmm. But now more people want it. Not a lot. Yeah. So. But enough. It's or it's almost it? like what are the what factors would need to be true for you to reprint more of a collectible product? Isn't that really the question? So this is the question to all of y'all. And you can leave a leave it in the comments later if you're watching this uh, on your TV at home after you're unwinding from work, or right now in the chat if you want to. Uh, what factors need to be true, in your opinion, for a publisher to reprint a collectible product? Yeah, great question. I'd love to know the answer to that. I guess that's what we're supposed to do today is actually answer that question instead of whatever uh, we did. I, no, <laughs> I, th I think. I think queuing up the ability to ask that question, given the context necessary, uh, is relevant. Well, I think. I, so. I, I, I God, think. You, you, you tell us for me, if <laughs> if you think that's relevant. Smash that like button. I'll be right back. <laughs> we got news to cover too. We got some news. This box is so pretty. I don't even want to slash it. I like this. Hold on. Let me get to it. It's like a collectible box. Everything's collectible. 
You know there are people that collect like the, they won't throw away the booster packs? There we go. Open the packs and then keep the plastic packs. I turned on some music for Steven's box opening time. And there are people that, there are people that collect the, uh, the booster boxes, you know, sealed and they just put them in acrylic cases and, and that's it. You know, I, I'm as I get older, you can't account for what people want to do. And part of the deal was we were both raised with a father who was a collector. Yeah. He was very much like, I buy things, I buy pulp to read them. I buy comics to read them. That's true. And that was like a very important part of the message we got growing up. And we've always kind of been buy games to plan. Yeah. Certainly not to flip them. But I, I have understood the collectors more than ever. Well, especially like I'm selling the foils I pull in sorcery to fund buying more sorcery. It's a perfect system for me. Yeah, for people that like want that, then yeah, you provide it to the collector types. Yeah. It's I do want nice. some foils. I want to get four foil sea serpents. I've got a, I've got a wild idea, John. Okay. I'm looking at all these decks coming out, and Jesse Jesse winning agenda. Jesse obviously very good at this game. I'm I'm not yet. I might be okay. But like, if you look at all these deck lists, uh, half the cards some of these deck lists are running would not work if my stuff was submerged. Pretty important. And if you do, it's are beautiful. you doing water air? Yeah, you can do a top down here. Okay. I'm doing water and air. So if you do water air, there's a few things that can move your stuff from submerged to not submerged. And I think Blink, that's- Blink, Riptide. If you go fire, there's Mad Dash. Teleport. And then teleport and uh, flanking. flanking maneuver is the best. Because any card you have to spin that doesn't draw you a card off the back just to get mm -hmm. a swing in, it's like, it's not nearly as good. But if it doesn't cost you a card to unsubmerge an attack, now we're getting somewhere. Look at I, this. I made that uh, Unlimited Eel 7 League Boots deck. Of, of course you did. It's my dream. It works dream. once. <laughs> That's right. You're the dragon. Alpha Class Draft Box 01. Right there it is. Look at this. Wow, that's cool. They're writing and they're making. We'll cover the news here when Zach gets back to you if you're waiting on anything else What's to try out to you. Spacers? Here? Uh, I think it's the boxes. Keep going to the right. Yeah, these are cards. Oh. I don't know what these are, guys. What are these? Uh, those are contenders. Well, all of them? All of them. Uh, Every eight, eight of each of them. Eight of each of the ones that you can play with. All the heroes and clash buffs you need for each draft player. There's a universal clash buff called Awaken that comes in this. Look at Ryan, just crushing it. Why should the store have to source tokens? Yeah, dude, make it easy. If you want anyone to do anything, make it easy. This is nothing. This is all the contenders and clash buffs that you need to draft. This is a pack of presumably some kind of a promo, promotional uh, contenders. Nice. Let me see that guy. And then these are the cards that we get to draft. This is a brilliant product. It's really good. This is like a high quality, uh, like a, you remember that spoils box of whatever mm -hmm. that had that unfortunate art on it? Mm -hmm. Derek was asking, is the draft box going to be on the website for regular order? Yeah, I think we have some extras. Is it not already? Yeah, well, it may not be given. It, it was a pre-order thing, so it should have been. Well, easy pie. given you might imagine why it might not be currently. Are they in the room with us? Uh, no, <laughs> they are in fact not uh, at see, all in the building with us. Yeah, let me let me actually <laughs> let me just see if I can do that right now. Okay. Look at that. I, I figured out why. Now we're live streaming. You know. Yeah, let me just get them live. There you go. Well, we need we need to do a uh, a check, but I think it'll be relatively Thanks, easy. Derek. You're about to get some product. Does my audio sound like it's better, or is it just as echoey as ever? Echoey as ever. Right, I see, I see, I see. I think that's. I think this is reasonable. What are we working on here? Getting this live. Oh yeah. We should make that happen. Yeah, this is the first time Can we've. You poke your head in and let me know when that's all. Yeah. 
Also, does it still say? Yeah, it still says pre-order. We're gonna need to update on that. Yeah, marketing. I'll just update all that right now. <clears throat> yeah. Um, we have uh, we can the ops crew. But let, let me cover some news. Let's call it Way of the Dragon. That was a mistake. It's Year of the Dragon because that's the I think the Chinese year. Yeah. Yeah. Is the Year of the Dragon this year? Yep. So that's kind of cool. All right, news. Alpha Clash, Year of the Dragon, officially released last Friday. If you're a subscriber, you pre-ordered it. Uh, you should have it or have it soon. Uh, you can find, you can always find the status of that on your account on our website. I'm showing that in stock. Yeah, like, cool. Is that is that number a fine number? Yeah. Okay. I love it. Then uh, we're going live, baby. Thank you. Thank you. You're a you're a hero. Um. So that released last week. That's what we're doing today. So we'll come back to Alpha Clash. Uh, spoiler season does continue, um, and there's spoilers that are happening all over the internet, uh, including I saw. Uh, is it called an attachment in this one? It's an, uh, there's a word for the things you can. Uh, so many different games with terms like tapping, etc. Anyways, you can attach it to a contender. Like there's there's a weapon you can attach to magnet specifically, uh, which is new for the first time. Do you like that kind of stuff? Um. Attachments? <laughs> no, like, like so, like linear attachments, like in uh, Warhammer, uh, the other one, the Conquest, where it's like only this warlord can run this, oh. and it's a one of, and if you get it, it's really good, and if you don't, it's not great. I mean, maybe I'm just so used to Fab at this point, where it's like specialization cards or equipment that only a certain hero can run. Yeah, I think it's a safe way to create, and in Alpha Clash, there's like no boxes around factions, so I'm okay with. Things that are restricted in that way. Okay, but you know, yeah, uh, you're a special guy there. I get it. I am. I did. Uh, I registered. I'm going to the Level Up Expo at the end of April to play in the first big Clash Grounds event for Alpha Clash. Uh, so going to the Pro Tour this week for Fab, but after that, pivoting oh, right on over to Alpha Clash testing for the first time and have a couple Wolfpack buddies. Uh, they're also going, and we're going to play, including uh, the Fab Goat himself. Michael Hamilton. It's worth noting too the the promo for these Year of the Dragon is only for the subscription slash pre-orders. So normal sale of these do not include the promo. That's right. We give a little thank you uh, for the people who are willing to pre-order. Yeah. So the promo is kind of a reward for that. And then uh, one last note that I saw on here, the uh, Kickstarter for the novel has officially completed fulfillment. I was a little sad because uh, mine is scheduled to be delivered to my house today. So it was one day off of me having it here with mm. me. Is that now. not the one you've already read? I have read it, but I also backed the Kickstarter. You want to collect it? And, well, there, there were cards, you know, that you could only get in this way, promo cards. So one thing led to another, and there I was at checkout. You know what I mean? <laughs> uh, anyways, they're having a garage sale, uh, as they call it, which is the extra items that got printed as part of that are available. Uh, and you can, I think we'll post a link to that in the chat here if you want to find it. I got John on that one. Yeah, He's going to spook him. We're going to post it right away. Hey, yeah. look, I sound good now. All right. You what? I sound good now. Where you yeah, sound weird. Time, huh? I oh. pressed the right buttons finally. Um, I'm gonna move on to the other games and come back to Alpha Clash because that's gonna be uh, the theme. All right, it's up. Someone, oh, there goes the comment. Uh, a couple other things to cover. Ashes. We do have a handful of the play mats uh, that we had on like kind of limited edition pre-order for a while in stock on the, the website. Yeah, it's good. Perfect. Yeah, good for me. It's good for you. Yeah. Uh, if you're out there trying to order this draft box, let us know if it's not working for you. Um, so those playmats are there. We only have a couple left of each of them, and once they're gone, we're not planning on making them again. So if you want those, uh, well, now's the time. Uh, Fab apparently announced the details for ProQuest Season 5, uh, which I assume will be the Amsterdam qualifying Pro Tour. That's great. Uh, I'm not planning on going to that one, so I've been a little little less connected to the news around it. Uh, only so many international trips a man can make. International tournaments are some of the hardest things in the world. Man, tough life, huh? Yeah. Privileged, <laughs> but tough. Seriously, I have immense respect. People that travel like to the states to play in the big tournaments, I that is tough. <laughs> there are people the, still grinding it, right? But oh yeah, oh yeah, lots of people. Uh, anyways, that's coming up. Going to the pro tour this week for Fab, so I won't I won't be on stream next Monday, but I assume I'll be able to the following week talk about my championship run, and uh, <laughs> it's not gonna happen. Oh well. Uh, moving on. I just heard championship run and I smiled and nodded. Yep, yep. Keep thinking. Optimistic thoughts over there, Zach. Uh, Earthborn. 
Uh, I saw this come through. Naylor Games has some first printing Earthborn copies over in Europe that you yep. can yeah. Had. Yeah. had sold out. Yeah. And then I, I clicked on the, the button where it was like, this is our EU store. Check out our US store. Clicked on it. Senate took team cover. Yeah, it's us. We're yeah. the US Imagine store. Imagine my dude. surprise. The yeah. call's coming from inside the house. <laughs> I am the Senate. Yeah. It's us. Naylor's handling, I think, uh, the UK, UK, EU stuff. And then we're the point on US sales, online sales. It's us. Yeah. Uh, and on that note, so the, the late, late pledges are open point. for the reprint on the game found for Earthborn. And then uh, I expect we'll probably have uh, pre-orders up at some point and stock available whenever those start showing up. So we should have that if you're wanting it uh, at some point. And if you want to get in on the game found, that's an option for you too. But at some point. I don't know. You never know. I don't know, man. I'd say before, you know, it's like a Q4 probably. Yeah, I, uh, it's still early. Probably like a Q4. A lot of days between here and there. Just but I would, I would assume sometime later this year. It's the same, you know, it's the reprint. You know, they've already gotten through the core sets. And yeah, uh-huh. we'll it's see. not, you know, it's not reinventing the wheel here the first time. There's it's a lot the, of expansions, though, and all the that. The miniatures time. and all that stuff. Anyways, um, moving on, Marvel Champions. Sorry. Yeah, yeah okay. a lot of comments. Earthborn is the greatest, isn't it? Did something happen technologically that went wrong? No. No. <laughs> no preposterous. No. There's just like, <laughs> right answer. Yeah, okay. Uh, Marvel Champions. Uh, fifth and final scenario revealed for Age of the Apocalypse. The, the hype around that one is real. Did you see, uh, who was it that got revealed? Did you see Jubilee? Ju- as a character? That you Jubilee is bonkers. Yeah, she good. Is but she, like, she's really good. She's got three she or explosive? four, she's got three or four double resources in her, her pool. And then her shtick is if you play events, use it, like if you use two resources, three resources, four dif- different resources to play it, mm. it gets better and better. Does and better. crazier things. And she can always tap generate a there wild resource <laughs> look at that exhaust generate a money like totally <laughs> it says it right there on the card and she's got this crazy thing with shopping spree have you seen this john did you put it on the thing you know it. oh my gosh so she comes in here <laughs> she she has a her alter ego can go get this uh-huh. and then uh any alter ego action can exhaust their so own idea yeah that's it so jubilation lee is there which i didn't know that was her oh, name very uh-huh. very easy uh portmanteau there all my crossword friends search your deck for the shopping spree player side scheme and put it into play so then you put it into play she's a mall rat i see that and yeah. so then jonathan we go to the shopping spree and then anybody can take an alter ego action to remove a threat from it it's two and then once it's defeated the player who defeated it goes get any item in their thing and puts it into play you wow. know how much that unlocks certain characters that's awesome where it's like if i don't have my helmet i'm worthless but if i do i'm an unstoppable and then jubilee's your favorite yeah. companion on the planet great great card yeah i love the art choices on this too mm-hmm. also i really dig like on shopping spree oh, well, the contrast between the actual card art and then like the uh bottom right <laughs> art of like old school mm. jubilee that i'm used to and then like a lot kind of poppier Young, poppy jubilee. jubilee yeah, yeah, it's yeah cool. I love marvel, it. I love marvel it. can get away with that uh yeah so champions continues on man now i will say we talked about reprints and collectability and all this stuff co-op Else, like non collectible card games, well, LCGs, uh, including things like Earthborn, but also Champions and Arkham. Reprint it for a thousand they, years. And they, they just like, are cruising. Yeah. That's one of the most like sustainable card game yeah. models I've ever seen. Because you don't have to gamble when you open it. The only gamble it's, is whether you're going to like it. It's also, I feel like it has to be so much easier to test and design in that environment where it's not tens of thousands of players trying to just break it immediately. Mm-hmm. Like, that would that would definitely change. There things. is late breaking news on the MCC front. Late breaking, and you can refresh your browser and get it. But right before we went live, what's that throwback? Um, <laughs> right before we went live, they previewed the final scenario for Mage of Apocalypse. The final I've, scenario. I've got Who are we fighting Apocalypse. Well, I mean, guy. was that a guess or did you it's, know? That? It's got to be the Four Horsemen followed by Apocalypse. Huh. It's also called Age of Apocalypse for those people. He's the big bad, right? Huh. Yeah, and we got uh, this thing. <laughs> How did you guess that? It's a, what's it? Celestial Armor. What, I, what? I like he's got the giant A belt for Apocalypse. Oh, yeah. I need you to know. What is Apocalypse's thing? The end of, of humanity? Celestial Armor. So is that an angelic kind of vibe? Is like angelic colossus? Uh, Celestial doesn't mean angel-y. It just means... 
tortured space definition in in define celestial. Uh, you're right. You're right. Ooh, hold on. That's on camera. Yeah, I'm gonna clip that one. A celestial body. It'll it'll. Uh, what does it'll, does it mean of space? I'm gonna. I'm gonna Celeste, guess. like an old Greek god or something. You're out. Yeah, I'm out of my. Depth Isn't it now. funny how language happens like that? Uh, Looking it yeah. up. Yeah, positioned in or relating to the sky. Boom. You nailed it. And then second <laughs> He's definition. He's a genius. Belonging or relating to heaven. And then third definition, supremely good. So, but heaven. Yeah, did, it wasn't a total loss. Heaven in like a scriptural sense is also just meaning above. Oh, not, yeah? not like a geographic place, you know? <laughs> what, was your brother like a scholar of the Bible? He is. Yeah, it'll drive you crazy. <laughs> <laughs> He's a genius. I actually love talking about all that stuff. But anyways, it, it, would, it <laughs> historically would mean very similar to celestial. Like when you're talking about it, you know, not, there's not like, when I think angel, there's like a good evil reference. Mm -hmm. And angelic would be like a, the positive side of that coin. Right, 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 right. Uh, but like, Although Satan's an angel, so, you know, I don't know. Well, fallen is the word before that, et cetera, et cetera. But all that to say, uh, you know, in the heavens would be in the sky. It would yeah. be the same, same vibe, but it's neither here nor there. <laughs> I'll call Daniel on the phone tonight and we'll have yeah. a chat about that. <laughs> uh, Andrew Navarro says the Marvel version of Celestials. Well, that's not helpful. You can't the, define the word with the word. Well, the Celestials depends on what your definition a, is. A thing Isn't that, that an acapella group? And interact with. It. They may sing. I don't know. <laughs> uh, the singing is to be determined. Here comes treble. <laughs> uh, all right, sorcery. Let's move along. Uh, also, Andrew Navarro in the chat. Good to see your your face popping up here. Mm -hmm. uh, there are three. I love this. So, did you see Weatherman? Uh, I did. Weatherman it's, March of the Mortals was it, sick. It was. It was something else. Drew was. Drew was there. So we've talked. What, what was? What stream did we talk about? The bottom up OP approach. What was the name of that stream? Uh, you don't understand the sorcery TCG. Was that that one? Probably. Um, I love seeing this happen. Yeah. One set a year. No formal organized play happening thus far. Uh, but yet, yet, this past weekend, three uh, bigger events for gatherings for sorcery. You've got the Quest for the Cup in Albany, New York. You've got the New Zealand Sorcery Learn to Play Day in Auckland. And you've also got March of Mortals happening in Texas. And I was so sad I couldn't make it. That's not that far from here. Also, Simon was in the house uh, revealing just some bombs. On, yeah, that on color camera. out of space promo. And what they're doing is is genius. You put a little You put a little code on the bottom of this thing. You scratch that off, you put the little code into your online reservoir, it, it redeems it and says you got 100 dust points. And then they're like, we could print like cool promos and play mats, and then just you turn them in for dust. It's like the old, you know, uh, Underberg points or Marlboro points or any, any points like Pepsi that. Pepsi points. And the reason it's good is not just it's a way to get promos and stuff directly to players, but they have so much more information. Mm -hmm. Like they know the number of boxes that were opened and redeemed for dust because it's under the shrink wrap. They know like if they redeem dust for like playing in tournaments and doing being a part of the Sorcery Play Network, they know where you're playing. They know how often games are being played because they're rewarding dust and then players are incentivized to use that to buy things off their dust store. Once that whole system is up and going, that could be a really revolutionary thing. I've got my dust ready to go. Yeah. I'm, I'm I've got two boxes rare, worth of dust myself. Raring to go. Hey, check this out. Spring Sorcery Social. Okay? I like the name. They just put up their website, and I need to, I, I need to find it. Uh, I think it's probably in the Sorcery TCG Discord, if you're looking for it. I'm going to actually do a little search for it because I think <laughs> it's important. Caleb's saying you can't mention Pepsi points and not mention my Harrier. Yeah, your Harrier jet. We haven't seen that. That, that, was that a documentary was awesome. Yeah, it did was. You see that? I did. I love everything about it. Okay. Lord of It says here, it's time the Spring Sorcery Social website is live. Buy your tickets, book your room in the hotel block, finalize your plans to attend this epic weekend dedicated to all aspects of sorcery. So as far as I can tell, and this was a little, I, I've been speaking with some people on Discord about this. It's a little confusing to me. And, you know, I'm a little thick-headed sometimes about things. But I believe the Sorcer Sorcery Social Club is a group, <laughs> a, a, a formal group, that is putting on the Courtesan Cup. 
Just like the Finer Things Club. And the, <laughs> the Courtesan Cup is being has qualifiers hosted across a bunch of different LGSs. Louis Store Game Grub did one. Mm -hmm. There's one that you're talking about here, I think, in New York. Is that the Sorcerer nope, uh, Courtesan Cup, there. whatever? Uh, quest, quest for, for the, the Cup. cup. Uh, is that the Courtesan Cup they're questing for? I I don't know. I hope so. March of the Mortals didn't have anything to do with the Courtesan Cup. I think this is all an East Coast thing, the Courtesan Cup. So the Spring Sorcery Social, I believe, is hosted by the Sorcery Social Club. And it is the premier East Coast sorcery event. They're hosting the final uh, wrap-up of the Courtesan Cup. So all these qualifiers are happening. Mm -hmm. And then the Courtesan Cup happens at this event. In addition to that, they're doing draft games, uh, sealed tournaments, all of that happens. They've also got four sorcery artists attending the event. And they're going to have other special guests associated with the community. Get your tickets now, and they've got did, a website. Spring, do they list the artists? Spring.sorcery.social. Let's go over to the website I'm, and find out, Zach. I'm, I'm waiting for a uh, Liz Danforth moment. Look, it's like uh, okay. it's like being at my house. You can just watch me be on my phone. Spring.sorcery.social? That's it. Dot yeah. com? Dot, no, dot, that's it. Dot no, social. Dots. You can register anything you want. So it. someone bought sorcery.social, the domain, and then has a subdomain, spring.sorcery. Oh, look at fancy uh, online man. I know things. Jeff Minges will be there. My friend Jeff. Drew Tucker will be there. And Drew. I, Alan Pollock will be there. I. Uh, th those are some great people. Tony Skazudlo will be there. Tony Skazudlo will be there. I'm sure that's exactly how it's pronounced. Truett Parrish will be there. Lindsay Lee will be You said there. four. This is more There's than four. There's more. Yeah, yeah. I've Lynn been lied Klingler to. False marketing. There. Steve, a.k.a. Centerpoint, will be there. I see Steve on the uh, Discord a lot. Two Fluent's going to be there. Where's this going? Guest. Louis Silva. Mike Cervati from Collector Art House will be there. Where's this happening? Louis DeGeorge from Kitchen Table TCG will be there. <laughs> it's like talking to a wall. <laughs> Zach from Zach Attack will be there. Head judge. Spin Scott, a.k.a. Spin Scott. I'm just Scott. waiting for you to say, Zach and Steven from Covenant will be there. Spin Scott's a DJ and a sorcerer YouTuber like me. <laughs> I should have gone on this list. Man, you know what? We we could just have a weekly spin stream. Yeah. I watched one. I got on one where it's just a couple, and they're making dinner and spinning like house music, and it has billions of views. And they release new content like every week. That would work. What are we doing? Yeah. Like, why are we working so hard? Um, and then Zalem will be there. Uh, remote guest commentator Salem, who won the March of the Mortals. I hope that's not a spoiler for people. Uh, Caleb asking, was there a complaint about the starting tune text messages you sent? That's just my bad. I haven't been sending them. We've been reevaluating our entire <laughs> ecosystem. We always are. So I, I paused it. I used to send a text in the morning. Part of it is also I'm 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 less involved in the decision behind what's happening on these things. Sometimes that doesn't even know it's Monday. Yeah, yeah. most of the time, you know, actually. Just yeah. wheel them in here. I just know this is a, a day that I eat my oats and come to work, you know? <laughs> just like any old day. Yeah, it's, it's seven days a week. Anyways, um, but it seems like you find that valuable, so uh, I'll mention that to the decision makers. Look at that, too. They've got the... Let's see if we can... You've got the... When, where is it happening and where? Baltimore, when? Maryland, June 14th to 16th. Baltimore? Interesting. <laughs> 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 I was in until they said Baltimore. I went to the, why does everybody dog on Baltimore? Is it really dangerous or something? So I went to Baltimore last year for a pro tour for Fab. Uh -huh. um, he still hasn't found all his toes. It <laughs> it was not bad. It was just at night. Sometimes it was uh, not great. <laughs> okay. Well, I mean, I'm sure there's like places like that anywhere, right? Yeah, there's so, got to be places in Baltimore that are fine, but like it's never real. So my I have in laws in Chicago, and in like one square mile of Chicago is where ninety percent of the crime happens. Mm -hmm. So you just don't go there. Yeah, but it felt less like that in Baltimore. Like it, it wasn't bad. It was I've been to a lot of different cities and it was fine, but it definitely I had more moments where I was not certain I was fine. <laughs> <laughs> then I did. Uh, anybody watching from Baltimore, feel free to pipe in here. Um, AJ be. Brown posted. AJ? Yeah, it's not. It's not like I don't know. You're not going to Crimeville. <laughs> uh, it's not just every. I don't know how to explain it. Well, it sure is sounding that way, Zach. <laughs> AJ, come in with the stats. <laughs> uh, AJ Brown saying only one car got broken into during Pro Tour Baltimore. <laughs> Uh, Simon's is. saying it, those are the only text messages I ever get. Simon, <laughs> I, I, I'll, I can text you all the time now. I'll just start. Yeah, what have you done? 
Uh, it's at No Land Beyond, which is, uh, check this out, Baltimore's first ever board game, bar, game shop, and venue. Let's take a look at this I place. I see the lights. The lights look cool. It does look good. It's like, kind of like a D20 hanging yeah, from the Yeah, so ceiling. this is true. Mark, to understand, it's just like how the media makes it sound like Portland is a war zone. It's actually amazing. Um, when we were going to Seattle, there were people at the airport from there that were like, oh, you know, it's just too crazy now. And Seattle was, I love Seattle. Yeah. It was great. They said the words you'd expect them to say. Yeah, I, I'm not going to go there. <laughs> Did you uh, guys, I forgot to put this up in the earlier discussion. I just want to make it sure you know K, that no. K. White saying, have you guys seen Star Wars Unlimited is out of stock for Mr. Rears? My question is, is it out of distribution or is it out at non asthma Day distri distribution? Because I saw that yeah, the non asthma Day distributors were out, but it would make sense to me if they got less and the asthma Day themselves have a lot. I can't even imagine why you would but distribute through non asthma Day sources. They have... For an asthma Day owned studio. If they're already out, that is that they are going to die on that hill <laughs> because they have spent months telling everyone they can't be out we will not run out no. their stock will not be a problem etc they're not out <gasps> if it, they'll be back in a week or two clockwork saying it's out at asthma day now <laughs> i'm gonna need a minute seems like they're about to make an impossible bet <laughs> no they're gonna reprint 100 percent. they are reprinting that set they will not no, 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 no. okay hold they're on. reprinting that set. so big hank saying it was sold out at asthma day on saturday is it sold out on asthma day's public website or is retail can retail not get it anymore through Asmodee? we got to get the facts here. Can an LGS place an order with the Asmodee distribution uh, people right now? Because them being out on the website, I know they had the announcement, at, the slide at Gamma I saw was like um, 90 or 95% of all boxes will go through local game stores. Yeah. Period. Which means they allocated 5% or less to their online store. The if you take them at their word. The irony of that statement to me, though, is that once you sell it to a retailer, you control nothing. Right. So to say that 95% will be sold at local retail stores. There's no way that's true. You can't force that to happen. Hold on a second. Let me, in fact, let Clockwork me. Clockwork's saying it's sold out on both. Let me just take a second. Let me do a little tour. Let me do a tour. I need to go buy some boxes. Because, I mean. Let's just, let me, I'm going to look at TCG Player. Did you say live. through local game stores or at local game stores? I don't know. What because this is the freaking problem. They're all just going to put them up on TCG, not all of them. Many of them are going to put them up on TCG Player and they're online now. That's an online e-commerce experience. Wow. Well, what's um, up? Case prices are up. Let me see if there's box prices. Case prices are up. Hmm. Okay. This is happening. <laughs> this is happening. So booster boxes. This is oh my god, Steven, you're gonna this is gonna kill you. You ready for this? So boxes yes, please. all the way through last time I looked were like ninety five dollars. MSRP 120. Okay? Okay. Right now on TCG player, there are Six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. Fourteen boxes available. Okay. And the first line is from Potomac Distribution. <laughs> <laughs> Which that's what's gonna kill you. That's the old site we used to order from as kids. That's to try a to get a that, that made us so upset. I remember Philip Rowland in high school of Star Wars TCG found them and was buying boxes for cheaper than we could find them for. Mm -hmm. And he wouldn't share his source. Mm -hmm. He's like, I don't I don't wanna <laughs> the whole thing. Um, hey look, they're all look. Add to cart at Miniature Market, 120 bucks. They're all moving locally, I assure you. They're an LGS, right? But all this to say, Technically counts. there's way less boxes available, and the prices are shifting up. 20 plus in stock right here, buddy. And once people start smelling it, it's we'll see what happens. But are they going to reprint? I think they have to. Are they going to announce it? Or are they, oh my gosh, that was incredible. Dude. You just avoided like a masterful mistake. <laughs> yeah, I've, you I've really done that flooded the world. Yeah, because I'm iPad there. sitting here. We had Why a don't you we, get we a, had a teleprompter what? ability. Our sponsor is now I'm and going to. You've got an, I, it's not pint glass. I, I'm going to buy you something with a lid. Well, I have one over here. I just need to really wash it because it's got a problem. You can't. You can't. You can't use that one anymore because this has wet brain on. I think it's our old logo as well. Oh, TCG Baron. This is the tea, the hot tea. Let's get at the tea here. Asmodee can't reprint the first set until December as they have other sets in the queue. I've heard that from an Asmodee rep. My God, if this happens, if this happens, I don't even know. No, Zach, all that it means was demand was so much higher than we anticipated that we did everything we could to make sure that they would not run out. And still, the demand was so high that we did. Because you can't get this right. Yeah, no, that's true. I mean, it's real. I actually kind of feel for it. You, you cannot get, get right. this right. Because if you're Asmodee and you overprint Star Wars Unlimited set one, your game is done. Well, if you're, it's, 
they have an advantageous position if they did that because they're the distributor. Yeah, they can hide it. They so if, if they have 50,000 extra boxes, they can just not reveal that that's the case. Yeah, that's um, true. That's but true. again, it's just an impossible. That's for... <laughs> uh, okay, here's my question for you then in a non-theoretical world. I agree, Simon. If you could get more first set boxes into the market three months from now, would you press the button and how many? I don't know how much they printed in the first place, percentage-wise. How many um, do you think that? How many booster boxes do you think that Asmodee printed of Star Wars Unlimited? If it were me, I would not reprint it. Is it in the hundred thousands on that early print run? You think? Like, is it like that high? I guess it's fifty to a hundred thousand. Okay. Because like, we got print data on Monarch, which was printed for Fab after they knew they had a certified hit. And we know they printed 125,000, and presumably they printed at least 125,000 unlimited because that came out a month later. Mm -hmm. So I could see them printing 200, 300,000 then. If they sold through that, that's good news for them. But would you print more if they were showing up three months from now? You're the publisher. You own the Star Wars Unlimited IP. You know that you have 18,000 sets developed already. You know that everybody's hot for the game right now, at least so, a certain group of people. So they did something smart, which is their their true blue big organized play does not start till next year. Yeah. So you have time. Yeah. Before it becomes a, in my mind, it's just like with Destiny. Okay. Destiny came out, it sold out. Right. They made the decision to push back set two, so they had time to reprint set one, and I think that was a horrible decision. Mm -hmm. In retrospect, um, I don't fault them for it, but I do think it was a bad decision because it meant people that had the product. Now had to wait longer to for the game to change, mm -hmm. and then people that didn't have the product by the time it actually showed up, there weren't as many people interested anymore. So then it shows up, and now there's less people who actually want it by the time it gets there. And then also, you just have a glut of set one sitting there when set two hits, right? And then it's like, oh, etc. Yeah. Um, also, by the time you print the second set, now there's two things to buy. So once you can get to three or four sets, it's a lot easier to not have this problem. So you're gonna reprint or not? I wouldn't reprint. I would just print the second set and move on. Wow. <clears throat> Jonathan, what would you do? <laughs> I I think I would reprint. How many I think boxes? I would reprint. Let's work on percentages. What percentage of the initial print run would you print if you were reprinting? Three months from now, it hits shelves. Okay. Because they have asthma day. Uh huh. They are asthma day. Can asthma day just print an infinite amount? And only tell people they printed and like absolutely they can tell they people just nothing. Burn yeah. them in a fire. Yeah, that's a Watsi, which is just doesn't. It's the same kind of vibe. Yeah, they can just be caught putting them in the dumpster two years from now. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I'd do that. Not get caught. <laughs> not the getting caught part. <laughs> but <laughs> I'd do that, but I wouldn't get caught. <laughs> <laughs> it reminds me of the Office where Michael Scott's being prison, Mike. Yeah, and he's telling people how bad it was in prison, and then he's like, "And I never got caught, neither." <laughs> It's like, well, how do you have this experience you're sharing with us? <laughs> it's so funny. Would you, would you all, uh, would you all reprint? Wait, did, what was that comment? Because yeah, I think that's a relevant thing comment. Shake out. Did it work out for them? Yeah, Lorcana worked out fine, right? Lorcana didn't crash at all. And they just put uh, it all the way. Did it? All the stuff they've reprinted has now since crashed. In the sense that it's just sitting on shelves and nobody's buying it. That you can find it for a super cheap. And that the value of most of the cards in the set are like very low now. So then the only question we would ask is, is the next, the upcoming Lacrana set now selling worse? I don't because think we know that. that yet. So we're about to find out. Fixing to find out. Fixing so to find is, out. We, we can watch in real time about the genius predictions being made here. Can we just turn into one of those channels that just looks at TCG player on the ha big well, part of it? And then we just yeah. have our little heads and we're just looking at market <laughs> data? You guys, you guys are the captains of that ship. <laughs> um, we almost had now, a whiteboard for today. If if you expand the do you reprint? <laughs> yeah, let's get small. Get your expansion robot. Let's get big. <laughs> so if you expand, if you don't just ask the question, should would you reprint? An alternative to me, especially if you're a distributor asthma day, is you reprint and then you use it in a different kind of way. Like you 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 know you have uh, every store can host one draft championship, and you send to each store. Ten boxes to host. How do you make sure you. they host it? Not well, just sell the you'd the have boxes. tournament software. They could do that, but like with you know, Fab does a really good job of you to host a ProQuest. Right? Here's what you have to do. If someone just sold the stuff they got in the Pro Kit, ProQuest kit, um, there's such a penalty for doing that because if if it gets found out 
and it's like we know this store is supposed to be hosting this event mm-hmm. and they have to report this event with real players and there's they should have at least 40 or 50 players at this kind of level of yeah. event um that people follow those rules yeah and so if you have a way where it's like hey 62 64 person cap draft championship event we're going to get more product in in the like controlled can't go more than this price sort of way okay uh almost like an event if, to me, it's like perfect. Like I would print more products and just use it exclusively for that kind of event style stuff. But mm. I would also per- it just gets super complex. Like you print the second set and go, man. Let it run wild. Yeah, second set is supposed to be in July. Yeah, look at Andrew. Ooh. Oh, Andrew with some Spice. hot, some hot former FFG knowledge. <laughs> Don't, Don't reprint. reprint. Why not, Andrew? Can you give me context on that? I, was Andrew in the in the hot seat when Destiny was getting reprinted? Yeah. Was he? I thought that was pre-Andrew. Uh, I'm pretty sure the Asmodee merger happened and Christian Peterson went to Asmodee, North America. ANA, yeah. And Andrew got promoted ahead of studio. Okay. I think that was like 2016. But would ANA make the call to reprint or would FFG head of studio make the call? I don't know that. That's that's yeah. beyond my pay grade. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. Jake Moss. What up, Jake? <laughs> What's up, Jake? Saying, I'm finding Lorcana set one available in the parks in the middle of the day now. It feels like a canary. <laughs> Uh, can Jake, you, how's production going, man? Can how's, you how's TCG going? player to the see picture what Lorcana's at? I'm picture doing a lot good. of different uh, I got you. I'm on answers. Lorcana. Can you imagine just having like a a, a a a marketplace like this? It just it just everybody is an e-commerce seller now. Every brick and mortar store in the world is selling online. Okay, okay. So set one, cheapest box is two hundred and fifty dollars. That does not seem like the bottom's falling That's out. That's not the bottom. Is that no. the top? Go to the one year. Go to the one year. Where do you see the? Oh, there it is. Yeah, it's not the top. Oh no, it's not the top. So the peak but... here was about four hundred dollars a box. So the reprints have gotten it down to two fifty a box. That is anyone scared of that? Oh, that's great. What about set two? Did they reprint set two also? How many sets of Lorcana are there now? Uh, seven. Man, I is there really? No. There's not really. No. Uh, I think set two is Rise of the Floodborne. Yeah, that's there's three right. sets now. Wow. How do we, <laughs> dude? Zach using a website is the greatest user <laughs> testing on earth. Well, I couldn't get back to this. I love it. Yeah, I love it. No, dude, it's... that Cinderella is beautiful. <laughs> <I've>... <laughs> He's <laughs> shopping, Jonathan. <laughs> you can't stop him. You can't stop this man. He's already. He's gonna have a pair John, of shoes so by the time this is over. We we came on Saturday He's buying cars. and did, did an all day shoot. Um, <laughs> And John said something during that shoot that really uh, stuck with me and tickled me, which was basically one of the hardest things in the world is getting these two people to do anything but be exactly who they are, uh, which I really liked. Yeah. I'll die on the hill. The best and worst uh, quality you guys have is being undirectable. Yeah. yeah. Is, is very this, genuine. Is this Cinderella balloon? Ba- ba- <laughs> still on it. Hey, is would this you, still on hold it? Hold on, hold on. Cinderella ballroom sensation, alternate art. Is that a good card? It's just a stunning. That looks we good, can, man. We can plug the HDMI cord into your computer if you That's just want to do a shopping Okay, set for a while. two. The just chat what is it. the second set? Peak was four hundred. Okay, this, and then currently is a hundred and twenty dollars. So yeah, but like this is this is as intended. It's not like they're down to twenty bucks. Like they're not sitting on shelves. If I was a retailer, I could sell a box for two hundred fifty. I'm I'm over the. I don't know what minimum. the MSRP is or what people pay for these things. If they're buying them two hundred fifty from look, distribution, then that's their it, problem. Into like, the Inkland set three is currently. Ooh, I took a took a dive, dude. No, no, but that's, that's five hundred dollars. That's a swan dive. The top is eight hundred and fifty, and it's still at five hundred for set three, the most recent set. On a pre-order. How many is in a case? Uh, I don't think it's pre-order. I think this is out. This is four boxes. No. This is four boxes. Yeah, no. times X four right over there. What does that mean? Oh, case. four booster boxes. Oh, this is a case. This is a yeah, case. but that means what is that price? Let me find the box. Let me find the box. Four ninety five. Oh, there it is. It's a hundred and twenty. Hundred twenty. Hundred twenty. Okay. Yeah. Oof. That was that was crazy. So, what do you buy these from distribution for? I don't know. You don't. Do you? Does it? Whoever is there an LGS that sells Lorcana? Can you tell us what the box price is that you pay at Distro? For Lorcana, because like this isn't a problem, right? It's not a problem. I mean, a four hundred dollar box is good for like one person, the guy with the four hundred dollar box, <laughs> but it's bad for literally everybody else. Let's just see. Are we? Did, did we? Uh, 
I want to see if we help create a sellout on this. On Do you want an thing. HDMI cord? No. Okay. No, it's it's more fun to watch people use the internet. <laughs> to, to narrate what someone's it doing. Definitely there's on one thing I've learned is it's fun to watch people use their phones and computers. You just stare at them. I did whenever uh, my wife and I were first dating. She would watch Adventure Time and explain to me what was going on on the television but without knowing the names of any of the characters. She was like, okay, the giant rainbow pony is now doing, you know, this and that. Where so just there it is. You just told me that when you, you and your wife were first dating, you were on a lot of drugs. <laughs> That's the only thing that I've learned from that conversation. I think these will be gone by the time we're we're done here. What are they? The unlimited booster boxes. I just want to see. Well, like I said, they're still available at 120 at Ministry Mart. Why are we not buying them? Do you want to just buy them and flip them? Buy all of them live? Buy all of them and then put them on our website? Let's make a documentary about it. Yeah. It's like, how can we do a lot of work and end up with no money? <laughs> the story of Covenant. <laughs> I don't know, oh, like, Lord. they can't be that out unless... I don't know, man. I got my three Vaders. I'm done. But this is the thing. Like, MM is going to have a few distributors. They're going to be a massive client. They're going to get a ton of the print run. Simon's saying this needs to be turned into a podcast anyway, so the video, it needs to not be video reliant. <clears throat> yeah, that's true. Yeah, maybe we should do that. Uh, Ryan, the, mono, the news. monochrome hero in the draft box was Magnate. Are we still covering the news, Zach? No. I don't even know how we got here. <laughs> oh, spring, the Spring Sorcery Social in Baltimore, Maryland is how we got here. Uh, apparently, Baltimore is okay. It's fine. I mean, the, the, the board game bar isn't getting broken into, apparently. So, <laughs> I'd feel okay. Uh, anyway, they're going to be hosting the Courtesan Cup and artists and all that. So, that's another great Baltimore. big East Coast event. Yeah. And then we got March of the Mortals in Texas, which a ton of work clearly went into that event. Uh, everybody involved in that did a great job. I know Drew uh, was very involved, uh, as well as a couple other people that were running the stream uh, who were less high profile because they're not on the videos that I watch. Yeah, the weatherman so, thing was crazy. It wasn't that cool. Um, I will say this about Baltimore on the positive. There's a couple of these there. It's called Ceremony Coffee. Mm. Great coffee. Mm -hmm. Great overnight oats. Okay. And it was and close to our hotel. 5% chance of mugging. I, I I felt perfectly reasonably safe most of the time. Once you got your oats? You just have to be aware, honestly. Yeah, yeah situational awareness. <laughs> if you're from Baltimore, it's not a dig. I'm from Tulsa. <clears throat> this is like... Okay, yeah, tell us about Baltimore, though, really, if you're out there. And then what else do we have in the news to cover? Oh, last thing was Netrunner. Uh... John, pull us up a card. Right. <laughs> they just keep this. doing things. I don't know. This this is like the opposite of everything we've been talking about. Non-collectible. you see this? Community run. You guys see this? Um, it's what? got too much text. Community run. I can't read it. Non-collectible. I'll read it to you. Continuing <laughs> to exist. But part of why this can exist is I. this is a like nonprofit, community-driven organization of like 40, 50 people putting out two products a year. Mm -hmm. um, so it's cool that they're still doing it. But also, this is, this is not a panacea of sustainability from a... Right actual organization with people who can get paid to create these things that we love. A lot of those player committees go on forever. Yeah. Indef indefinitely. And, and it's it, also, I've always thought it was a really cool it works if it's an act um, of love, especially. Incubator for people who are getting their foot, feet in the industry, want to try design, yeah. that kind of thing. Yeah. Okay. Where's the John cam on it? Well, I'm covered with up. Card. With card. I got it. When your turn ends, if you made a successful run on HQ, R&D, and Archive, so you hit all three centrals, you may add this hardware to your score area as an assassination agenda worth zero agenda points. Then if you have three of them in your score area, you win the game. Okay. Threat three, which I believe is if the corp has scored three points. If anyone has three. If anyone points. has three points. Or whenever you bypass a piece of ice, you may spend an action to install this hardware from your heap. Ah, whoa. I mean, it's very weird. It's the kind of card, Jonathan, I would never run. <laughs> well, yeah. But... It is interesting, isn't it? As far as alternate win conditions go, you got to play the game. Seems yeah, like still within the realm of Netrunner. It is interesting, like, and it's the story of is cool. Like, it's a it's a weapon, so you're like getting in there and well, being so, a crazy criminal. Like, it's a criminal thing to do. Like the, the stabbing. Interesting thing about stabbing, it to me is stabbing. you still have to get three of these. Which yeah, but the, the other two are easy. Because you pay one to bring it in from your graveyard. You just film something and then pay an action and install it from your, your heap. But the cool your thing trash pile. is that because this is a agenda worth zero points, it doesn't count towards your 
threat. Torture threat. So like you still yeah. have to wait till probably either you or the corp have at least three agenda points scored before that is active. Yeah, so I wonder if you have two of these sitting in your discard pile. This is still zero. Yeah, but if you have two of them sitting in your discard pile and then you bypass a piece of ice, the corp has scored three points, you just action, action, install them both and win the game? So, because that's pretty wild if that's actually true. I could see decks that just try to get an early Jetta and HQ, whatever, down, and then they discard the other two to effect, search them out, discard them, and then they just wait. And once the corp, corp scores three points, they just bypass a piece of ice and then mm -hmm, press the button twice. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because you can't take it from your score area. So you do have to have seen three of them. Interesting. Yeah. 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 There's a lot of like tutoring stuff now, though. And there's also a lot of, I think, hardware destruction that the Corp has access to. It's easier to destroy things that the runner has on the board, mm -hmm. so it might not be as big of a threat. Oh, they're unique. They're unique? What does that mean? So there's only one of this card. You can only have one of this card installed. So you'd have to have other of these kind of cards installed. Like this one, you can put from your heap, and you know what I mean? No. So to win the game, you have to have three of these assassination cards installed. Oh, so there's multiple different ones. Yes. And this particular different... one you can play from the trash. Oh, even cooler. Okay. And and to do this, you have to have successfully run on three different Yeah, games. but I do that all the time. Well, yeah. yeah good all luck. day. Good luck mid to late game. That's just called playing good netrunner. Yeah, but if, if we're like late game and you can successfully run on all three and you're not winning, it, the thing it fixes is proactively as the runner you can win if there's degenerately hiding agendas somehow. Yeah, I would say if they're slamming all one one agenda stuff too. You so, could also sell this to Aesha's pawn shop. Aesha's pawn shop is worth three bucks. Get the money. Put That's it back my in. line. <laughs> I have a trademark on that. Get out of here. What else? You got another That's one? That's it. That's the end of the news. More, I got some more. I got some more. You got one more. Really. Boto. Uh, six, four. So four strength barrier for six is not good yet. Threat four. It's plus two if somebody scored four. That's better. Net damage, trash, trash. Interesting. That's good. And then here's the last one. I like Ooh, this. Ooh, it's pretty. Two for four centuries is good. Soraka Bond four for Blade. Two. You cannot trash more than one installed with this ice during each encounter, but it has three trashes. Resource piece of hardware program. Wow, this ice is nasty. They're getting nasty. So you get to, like, the runner chooses which subroutine to break, but yeah. the court can only trigger one subroutine if they don't break any of them. Yeah. So if I'm running in and I have no hardware or programs, I just break resource and nothing happens. Or if I have a lot of all of those things, I let them choose one and then I keep going. Pick your poison. Yeah, that's good. That's good. All right. We have arrived. They're in this crazy game. At the end of the news. I love the game. And so now we're going to play out. All right. So where do we find the draft rules? Oh, they're right here. Oh, right. They included everything we need. Okay. How to draft it. Uh, well, and of course, we're going to be doing sealed. Yeah, we'll just do sealed. Uh, players will open. Okay, so that's just standard draft. At the end, you should receive uh, 60 cards plus shared contenders and clash buffs to begin deck construction. So four packs? I don't know. Let's do six. six. I'm going to make it spicy. Drafts or any other form of limited carry a large degree of randomization. Clash buffs carry a large degree of power. The culmination makes it clear that clash buffs should not be included in the draft packs. A well-timed clash buff could stop even the strongest cards in the set, and it felt wrong to leave that gameplay purely to chance. Because of this, we created a special buff just for drafts. Awaken. Colorless. Uh, but it does offer a different effect for each color in the game, depending on which contender you choose to play based on the cards you choose to draft. Okay, once we have all of our cards, we contain 40 cards. Player's sideboard can contain up to 24 cards. Let's not do that. A player can include any number of copies of a card. After a player finishes their deck, they should determine which contender they want to take the helm for the event. Be careful once you make your choice. It's your choice for the rest of the event. You're locked in. Once deck construction is finished, players should receive their pairings for the first round. And then we've got to we've actually got to we've got to maintain our thresholds here, don't we? So look at this. We get eight copies of all these contenders. Oh wow! Very cool. And then what you choose will say a lot about you. Of course. Your entire identity is tied up in this. Of course. So this is highlights from set one and two. And this is the all the contenders that we got. Wow. Here's the Awaken. They give you enough for all eight players to play this card. It's like hmm. universal. Mm -hmm. 
Awaken, one cost, Clash buff. You may only play this card in the draft format. Target contender or Clash party control gets plus one, plus one until the end of turn. Then, if your contender is black, you can put a Clash card with an initial resource cost of one or less from Oblivion into your Clash zone engaged. Wow. Okay. If it's green, you can target an opponent to discard a card. If it's, <sighs> if it's white, your contender gains two health. If it's blue, you put a street counter on target Clash card you control, mm -hmm. or put a collection counter on target relic you control. Okay. And if it's red, you deal two damage to target Clash card. Okay. And then, of course, we got the portal, and then they gave us war tokens. You'll be using those, I assume. Uh, so we did six. Pack. Let's do six. And we need a 40 cards. Player's deck must contain 40 cards. All right. Let's crack them and rip them. Uh, Mark, there is not a Covenant store right now. We own land, and we're working on plans to physically build uh, our dream store. Kicking it back off. Oh, man. Look at this. Collateral damage foil in the comic book version. Whoa. Which I love. That looks nasty. That's crazy. I love this style of... Yeah, that's the normal one, but this one is like a page of a comic book that came out. Oh, yeah. I saw some previews. Wow. Look at that. Um, that is cool. That is cool, 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 cool. All right, I'm just going to... Oh, my gosh. It's a sign from the Lord. Whoa. My first three, six, seven cards are red. Look at that. It's a comic book version. That one. What's that? It's surprise. Not shiny, but surprise. Surprise, yeah. surprise. And the foil was red, so, you know. What, what is, what's a guy to do? Oh, dude, Age of the Alphas. Look how cool this card looks. I love that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, what, going for it. If you're out there, Fridge, Garrett, Josh, was there was there ever a consideration to have all of your art in this comic book style? Makes the text harder to read is the only problem. I could see that. They could they could add more uh, opacity to the text box. Okay, it's looking good. Actually. I got that Bardogan Warhorn. You know what I mean? Bardogan. Ryan, I don't know if we're ready for that yet. He said we should face up draft these packs. Ugh. I'm this not, videos took forever. I'm not ready. Nice little comic book version there. So where do you think of going to Vegas? What's your uh what are your thoughts on that on that event? Um I have a lot of work to do. <laughs> to get ready, yeah. Yeah, I mean it's kinda cool. Like the Saturday event is the world premiere of set three, it's like a pre release. And so that is a large part of the interest for me. Mm -hmm. Sunday's constructed, technically. Um, I'm going to put together some decks and do some testing and stuff, but like, I don't have any grand aspirations on my performance there. Uh, so I'm, I'm primarily looking to have a good time in what an the, idiot. the limited format. And then, <laughs> you know, we'll mix it up and we'll see what happens in the... Uh, you got bring a constructed deck. You can go all that way and not play. I'm definitely yeah. doing it, but I I'm not I'm not expecting a lot. You know what I mean? Yes. Dude, I got two of this foil Age of the Alphas. I've got a lot of hate into. It. What does it do? Oh, interesting. Yeah, this pack was bonkers blue. Uh, X nice. Flesh and Blood X. What's yeah, up, man? Boy. Uh, saying the packs are linear rarity clumped. That's cool looking. What's that mean? You know, I'm finding out that all these TCG packs are clumped. They were saying that you needed to shuffle the packs, but I think you did shuffle. I the did packs. shuffle the packs. He's an old drafter from back in the day. Yeah, <laughs> I've been here for a long time. Back in my day, dude. Alternative strike looks so cool. I just love these comic book looking cards. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. I don't have any of the new the comic book one cards, but I'll pop the normal cards so people can read what the cards are. Do you have a somewhere in San Francisco? I better believe I do. That art is very good. Well, There's also... Uh, that bad boy. Yes. Yeah, it's really good. That's, that's some of the War best. War Cry and Torque dueling. Um, there are... So there's... 
the comic book style cards cards in the set, and then there's also um, basically alt art. So some cards are literally have full new art happening on them. Ooh, disorientation Grand looks Park awesome. Again. It's a trap. Moxie primed to clash. Um, and we get to choose any contender. Huh? Mm -hmm. And then the splashes are going to be. I'm probably going to go two, right? Two colors. Flesh and Blood X saying like they weren't correlated and mixed. C to E, left to right. I think, yeah, I'm, not, I'm still not following. Don't you understand? I don't. I don't understand. <laughs> I'm like yeah, maybe it's my age showing. I'm getting so many red cards. Look how big this red stack is. It's mind bending. I'm so happy for you. <laughs> I'm living the dream. Magnate, unwavering might. It's a golden card. Man, so many blue cards. Hey, that's your dream. Dude, this is crazy. He's a blue man. I'm a blue man group over here. And then, okay. All right, so when you're new to a limited format, like if you were just doing sealed, yeah. my normal recommendation is sort by color and then and sort by beef. Like white and green for me are the smallest card pools that I have. How many do we have to have in open? 40. Let me see how many reds I've got. I'm not familiar enough to know the bombs quite yet. So I've got 27 reds. Yikes. And I'm going to look at the stack, like how many characters I have in each stack. Because mm -hmm. you're going to have to, like, that's something you always really just need. You don't want to be in a game and be like, oh, oops. Yeah, I think part of it, too, is like how many of the higher cost cards do you have as well? Just Yeah, because they're you, disproportionately good. If you don't have any higher cost cards, it's probably not that that appealing. Man, low to the ground. These are all just tiny numbers. Yeah, the high cost cards are gonna tell you everything, aren't they? All right, so I got a, a death stalking specter. Oh, so good. Oh, so good. <laughs> it's so good. Death. <laughs> <laughs> of course I'd play death. Oh, man. The blue's out of here. I'm going to keep that trend going. I got I got some beefy green cards. Okay, so it's blue and white for me, like, straight away. Like, look at the difference in these stacks. What are these stacks? These stacks are big. Like, these are, like, the actual characters. Like, I've got four characters to play in blue. I'm going to follow, no, follow your methodology here. I mean, maybe if there's some just, like... Baller weapons? Yeah, because you got it. So, like, this is interesting. I've literally got in white six, five characters. How did that get in here? Oh, it's white and green. Ooh, that's bad. <laughs> Look at this. I have one green character. That's not going to fly. Yeah, see, that's not enough. Shit. I've got four green characters. Also, not enough. Unless. <laughs> no. Reminds me of the probably not that uh, gif where she's like one, two, three, four, five, six, ten, eleven, back and forth, back and forth. Seven. I love the art on Dark Domain. I mean, if I put white and blue together, I've still only got twenty-three characters out of forty. That's pretty good, right? We need green. Yeah, it's not terrible, but it does make you wonder: should you go? You're definitely playing red, of course. I mean, my two biggest characters, Flare and Torque, are over here in red. There's only five of them. But, oh, that's a three threshold? Yeah, no thanks. Oh, look, some of these, ah, don't sleep. Some of these are one thresholds, and they're pretty good. Mm, you go on three colors? I don't know. Let's look at the one thresh stuff. I would imagine one threshold is pretty easy in Alpha Clash. Yeah, you just got to find two red cards to play one of them. So you got to play one as a resource, and then, and if you don't, I mean, it's going to be awful. It's really going to not be fun. I mean, if you have it in your hand and you don't have the resource, the threshold to play it, it just becomes the resource. 
That's true. That's true. It doesn't contribute to your thresholds, but it does. It can easily resource out, so that's relevant, actually. All right, so I'm just gonna cruise through my red cards, and well, that's my base. I'm gonna build from there. Um, interesting. Yeah. Okay. That's no bueno. Card draw is good. Casualty of war. Hey, this is nutty. Removal is good, favorable outcome. I love you name the cards like that, Zach. It's a dream come true. <laughs> I'm, I'm here for you right now. <laughs> I've got no one threshold black characters here in this situation. It's probably a no for me, dog. Ooh. Removal is good, collateral damage. Bardog and Warhorn, come on now. That's a good one. Dudes for days. <laughs> Interesting. If you'll recall, I used that card to great effect in the game we played on the stream. The Warhorn? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. He's Bardagging. He's Bardagging. <laughs> He's Bardog. <laughs> what? That card's great. And it looks great. Alternative Strike. Okay, so I okay, I've got I've got some piles I can go three into if I need to. Uh, we got two warhorns. We're going to town. This is going to be unfavorable for you. Portal can't, can't be obstructed. Right, portal is open. Clarity and play engaged. Another target clash card gets plus one, plus zero. Okay. Got it. Against two health, draw one card, draw a card, flight. Okay. Your yeah, win's not bad there. And then counter attack. Prevent all clash during this clash. Oh, I mean that's that's pretty good, but I got a I got a dude problem. It's question question mark. Yeah? Not enough dudes? Not enough dudes. Turn. That's kind of I'm afraid I'm gonna have to play blue. I'm not gonna do it. I refuse. Let me hit. I'm gonna go hit the little boys room. All right, I'll be here building. I, this is gonna be some feisty off of class. I I agree. I can tell that already. I uh, it's gonna be something. So normally, if you're drafting, I feel like five colors, you'd probably end up picking two to focus on. And if we if we were seeing sixty cards, I'm gonna guess forty five to fifty of them would be the right colors. But in sealed, we opened six packs, so we have 90 cards. And we need to end up with 40? That makes sense. It's going to be a struggle. Two, it's going to be two or three colors. Oh. Oh, boy. I, I feel like I just don't have enough cards. You ever feel that way? I feel that way. Mm -hmm. So we're putting all... Man, it's weird, the, the black cards, you have death, and then you've got like the set one moxie stuff. And they sort of play different. Like these are just basic characters. I love this like Captain Captain Maxine Riggins. When there's no text, they just have the full art on the card. A plus. Uh, doesn't really work. That's fine, that's fine. Is the Warhorn a weapon? If so, we're shipping this pairing. Uh, relic, see. accessory, no, it's not a weapon. Dang. I have a Colonel Edwards, Colonial Edwards, for those spelling it over on a typing machine. <laughs> uh, and he goes to search for a weapon. Yeah. So I mean, these, these three characters are, I guess they're fine as units that we play. Does Hamilton know what he's playing? No. No, we haven't started that yet. We have Pro Tour this week, and then it's then it's then it's Alpha Clash. Not good. Uh, enter from beyond. She looks pretty intense. Mm -hmm. I'm just I can't do I can't do traps yet. Just can't make the math make sense, huh? Well, you just have to. You got to put it down. 
He's going to spend a card on it. And then you've got to hold resources. So like if you're playing on curve with somebody, it's very difficult to make a bet that the thing that they're going to do, you can trigger with the resource that you've held or else you waste the money. Right. And then they just get a turn where you are less effective. It, it would have to be... Yeah, it would have to be a certain style of trap for me to really care about it. Real, like, like a real bomb. Like spiritual defense, right? So like, this is just never going to be worth it for me. Activated the class card being played as an initial cost of two or less. When Andrew's play, it gets minus one, minus one. Yeah. I, that just can't that be a good trade. I, that's just out already. Uh, I think Clash Grounds are going to be important in Limited. Agreed. Very important. Yeah, that Zach's got something at the sleeve. Uh, see, like Grand Park Chicago is very important. When it enters, search your deck for a Clash card with a resource cost of five or less. Add it to your hand. Like, that can single-handedly win you the entire game. If you get your five cost on the table instantly and they're still playing ones and twos, that's going to be in the gotta play me pile. Not to mention the extra defense. Goodness gracious. Mm -hmm. The portal can't be the portal's closed. I, this one's less likely to be relevant. Let's see how many we're at here. Ooh, see, I like this ancestral guando. That's a good one. Remember how busted close combat is? It does its damage and then it attacks. It's like a double swing. Know what close combat is? Where do you see that? Mm -hmm. Close combat. Didn't you have the rule book up? I do. Yeah. That's the one we got wrong the entire time we've been playing this game because we didn't, we couldn't comprehend that it would be that good. Mm. <clears throat> I think Barrage is also super good, if I remember from the tutorial. Is that the one that takes their damage and spreads it? Mm -hmm. Close combat. A card with close combat has a fun effect. This card can attack ready clash mm, cards. What's the one I'm thinking of? Bar no, is it Barrage? Barrage. I always get it wrong. It's like you do your damage and then you do your damage. There's another one. His chat now? Barrage, uh, when this card attacks, you may deal damage equal to its initial attack power divided as you choose among up to X target clash cards. That's it. You attack, it does the damage, and then you get the attack. Wow. Right? I think that's it. And that's truly crazy. Yeah. Yeah, here it is. Yeah, 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 yeah. Barrage is nutty. So I have to add six more cards. You're already there, huh? Uh, <laughs> you know it. Three, okay, these are out. Five. What's this thing? Zach's drafting strategy is much like collectible card games. I wish it didn't work as well as it did. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Why, why is this working? Oh, wait, wait, wait. How many awakens do we get? Four. Did we get four? What yeah, is it? four. That's for the four of the cards I'm adding. Five, uh, six. I assume it's four. Yeah. Can you just control F that thing? Yeah, it's just four. I mean, I assume it's four. It doesn't tell you explicitly what it is. I can tell you. Oh, I'm going to get into some weird collection counter awfulness here. It's four, because there's enough for each player to have four. If you do, you put two. Target Relic you control. I'm going to have to play Haven if I do any blue cards. Not that. Like a moth to the freaking Not flame, dude. <laughs> you just going. Did you get the backpack? No, I didn't get oh, the backpack. Oh, he got the backpack. <laughs> Remember, when you're choosing a contender, this is pretty crazy. The color of the contender only matters for this thing. Mm -hmm. But like from a threshold perspective, it doesn't yeah, really matter. It doesn't matter, does it? Because I immediately was like, I'm playing black and red. I was like, oh, let me find all the black and red contenders and decide. But you don't have to do that. Like, you can play anything. Like, freaking Magnate, who's a stonky. Yeah, sometimes I forget how, like, open Alpha Clash is between not coming in tapped and the building stuff you just mentioned. Yeah, no, no summoning sickness is wild. It's a crazy that, deal. That's a subtle thing that they did. But it is crazy. <laughs> it's, you, you crazy, Ridge. Mm -hmm. You crazy. All right, so... Uh, uh. 
Why why is blue doing this to me all the time? Why why did is blue just a tier two color? All right, now I've got to look and see how many like street counter cards that I have. I don't know how to answer that. You should have seen the look on his face. On my face? Yeah, the answer no, is Steve. yes. He knew. Put one streak counter. I think he's always known. Prevent that would be dealt. Okay, well that's good. I feel like I feel like Magnate is just such a generically good contender in a limited format. Am I wrong? Can someone out there who's good correct me? I don't think I'm wrong. Okay. Well, that settles it. Ooh, yeah. there's legendaries in here. Did the, the legendaries reprinted? Mm, attach class tree. You put one on target relic. Okay, that's a, two collection counters. Okay. Remove two counters from target clash card. You do clash cards in control. Well, I mean, that's maybe. Ryan's saying their contender abilities do care about types. Yeah, but I'm looking, and the three contenders that I think I would choose from generically are War, Legion Commander. He doesn't care about color. Uh, clash card you control, get trigger attack. If this is the second attack, you have to clear this turn, draw a card. That seems good. Then you got Torque the Diabolical. After reading the book, I, it's it's difficult for me to play Torque. Does Haven go get an accessory? Is that her ability? Does she start the game with one? I got you, yeah. But I only have... You may start the game with a Relic with an initial resource cost of two or less. This is a Haven Binding Time. Mm -hmm. uh, two or less in your accessory zone. During your turn, whenever this container loses health, you may put one collection counter on target Relic you control. This ability only triggers... This ability triggers only once per turn. And she has 20 health? There's no way. No, she has no, one no, defense. No. Yeah, there's no, there's no yeah, way, though. Yeah, but there's no way. Big. Well, I don't know. Maybe? I don't know. Especially unlimited. I'm going to have a bunch of... No, there's just no way, All right, back to, back to Torque the Diabolical. So after reading the book, I have a hard time being this character. Nice. He's just kind of, like, unjustifiably evil character. Mm. I, so, well, so far, you know, they always kind of bring it in at the end. And, you know, then... Uh, this is one. Once returned during a prime phase, you may engage this card. If you do, deal a damage to a target clash card. Whenever non-clash damage is dealt... To this contender, draw a card. This ability triggers only once a turn. So, like, that's just generically useful. Don't care about color. And then, of course, we have Magnate the Awakened, uh, which, if I play, I'll play this version. Uh, your Alpha Clash cards, your Alpha cards get plus one defense, period. Doesn't care about color. You can see my my situation. This card, I, I, can't, I can't do this. I'm not going to do this to myself. I do it too often. Flesh and Blood X saying without backpack Haven is a hard sell. Yeah. So you got got people out there with But you back. could do a one threshold lucky charm with some of these Haven stocking ups. <laughs> <laughs> like a moth to flame. <laughs> you could. I you know what? I'm not doing it. If you just do it, we'll find out. No, we will we don't even need to run the experiment. Fixing to learn today. You don't need to run the experiment. Yeah, I agree. Uh, the one defense is huge. Yeah, the one defense is huge, but you also, your cards have to do something besides put doodles <laughs> on baubles. Uh, if you play Haven, you get bonuses from your, your main character energy. Hey, uh, don't forget these. You're going to play those. I won't forget them. I don't have enough cards. That's how I felt. I almost added a third color, and then I found these. Okay, so look. Let's think about this. It's gonna be great. I know I'm breaking Not people's hearts nice. right now. Riffle shuffling, no sleeves. We're a kid again right here. We're one kid. Go back and scream at my young self for how I treated my Pokemon cards. Don't do it. Mm. I'll tell you what, damaging my cards is better than using penny sleeves. <laughs> <laughs> Those things are the worst. Eric Wainwright drafted Destiny for years with penny sleeves. Yeah, I love that. And then he'd be like, hey, at some point you're like, hey, let's swap decks. And then he handed me his deck and I was like, I don't think I can do this. <laughs> this is like shuffling bread. <laughs> <laughs> or shuffling wet bread. <laughs> okay, so... Okay. Not terrible. So I've got... What are you guys? Harbingers and Alphas. Alpha, Alpha, Alpha. I think I'm playing Magnate. Hmm. Ryan Roper in quotes. I put doodles on bobbles. 
Okay, this S day mom. This is fine. This is fine. It's fine. Okay. Uh, these are in the maybe zone. This is a card I have to now run. Uh, this is not. We're not going to play that. Uh, maybe that. And no, we're not going to play that trap. No way. Uh, San Francisco is a no. San Francisco, no. I was waiting for that, Joe. Yep, good. You delivered. On time. You delivered. I am curious about the Vegas event, because so the Saturday is the world premiere set three. And is set one and two were not draftable or really even sealable. So I know it's limited, and I'm curious if what they're doing there. Mm -hmm. If there's like a, a pre-release pack or a... Something or if is set three a limited a bill set? I haven't said as much. Limited a bill. Limited a Limited a bill. Don't you love that art on Garfield Park Lagoon? Yeah, I do. Hmm. Mm -hmm. I bet you got alpha cards. I know because that's the only thing you would play, right? Wait a minute. No, no. So I have my contenders here. I'm not definitely choosing. But, more. but most of the cards in the game are alpha cards, right? Um. So a lot of the Harbinger stuff is not. Hmm. Would you say the stuff in your deck is Harbinger or Alpha? Like, which one primarily would you say? Um, I would say it's at least half. <laughs> yeah, me too. Of both. Yeah, me too. Okay, there's got to be a strategy in here somewhere, right? <laughs> okay. Play dudes, do damage. That's good, that's good. That's Win the good. game. This has got to be a no. Yeah, me too, Ryan. Say any site for world premiere. <clears throat> All right, I'll go to the well here if I have to. You I got your four clash buffs in there already? I don't want to, I assure the, you. Yeah, they're, they're hanging out up here. He, okay. keep, he keeps eyeballing them. Okay, how many cards we got? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. <laughs> Twelve, thirteen. This for you, I'm glad 15, you appreciate my humor. 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, 26. 27, 28, 29. Oh, we're not even close. You need 11 more cards? 29, 30, 31, 32, 33. Seven cards. We're bringing in another color. Ooh. I would just grab seven bodies from a different color. Low threshold bodies. Oh, I don't have seven bodies. Ooh. I've got three bodies here, and I've got three bodies here. I think this is at the tournament when you take a bathroom break and don't return. <laughs> And I've Jessica, got... what's up? Saying what game is this? It's the Alpha Clash TCG, uh, made by Rising Empire Studios, uh, indie publisher. And uh, this is so there's two sets out. This is technically, I won't even call it set three, but it's a draft box, um, which is highlight cards from the first two sets. And we're playing it for the first time. It came out on Friday. <clears throat> it looks like this Monkey Kim, greetings from Belgium. Hey, Steven Belgium. loves Belgium. Yeah. How did you know I was going to say that? You know, I, I had a moment the other day <clears throat> with my wife driving in the car. Yeah, driving, you know, uh, 10 and 2, of course, <laughs> like a responsible citizen. And uh, what I don't trying to, I, I asked her a question and then I turned away and under my breath I said, in a perfect world. Um, cause I was asking her a hypothetical about what she want, you know, wanted to happen. And then I knew, I absolutely knew the first thing out of her mouth was going to be in a perfect world. And as I said it under my breath, she actually said the sentence and she both liked that I knew her well enough <laughs> to like call the thing she was going to say when she was going to say it. And also it was like a bit scary to her that I did it. And she's like, how'd you know? I was like, I just knew that. You were going to classify what you're about to say with in a perfect world. It's like ideally this is what would happen, but anyways. So I felt the love. same way. I knew exactly what I knew. I knew what you were going to say. Then. Okay. Well, how about that? How Ryan about Roper, that? I ordered the set two clash kit. I didn't realize I didn't have a clash kit subscription. Error corrected. Thank you for signing up, Ryan. One of our most ardent supporters. I don't know how you play everything. He said he was signed up to go to the Netrunner Worlds. He was teaching new people how to play Miller CCG a week or two ago. He's going to the Alpha Clash uh, World Premiere in Vegas. That's a man about town. 
Nathaniel Dalton, great to know. This is what Fab History Pack 1 should have been. Great to see someone getting it right. Uh, yeah, it, look, in retrospect, I get why History Pack was not that for Fab, because they had eight classes they're trying to get cards for printed. But now, looking at it, it'd be really cool if, if, they, if it was a draftable format in some way, or limited. I think it's a great product. And having these kind of tentpole products that you can release um, once or twice a year and say, you know, if you're a new player, buy this. Like this is going to have highlight cards from the first two sets. You don't have to hunt down two boxes. You can get it. You can do a draft with friends. You can play sealed, etc. cetera. Um, I think that that will be cool to see continue to happen. You get another year from now, and suddenly they can do one of these with cards from the first four or five sets if they want. Very cool. Very cool. And as a current player, it's a cool way. Like it, it's an actual – an interesting product for me, even though I have the first two sets. Well, it's just fun to draft. It is very fun. Even this, fun is fun just fun. limited. You're gonna have maximize your playable cards, right? Five. Let me see something. This is crazy. Uh huh. This is crazy. What are you looking at? I just like, man, deck building is actually kind of awesome. <laughs> One, two, kind of awesome. Three, four. Put his face on the website. You, you know what? Yeah. The actually deck building for this awesome. game is actually kind of awesome. <laughs> um, I feel like the thing that always gets you is when we get into limited truly for the first time. Yeah. Like if we were drafting this, I think you would be over the moon right now. I agree. This is one of the most exciting products I've had my hands on from a game in forever. I thought you were just saying this. <laughs> yeah, I saw X Flesh and Blood X, uh, and Ryan Roper collabed on some content with this, doing some uh, unboxing of these sets. Oh, dang. Uh, some, I think uh, both Vegas lads. It'd be nice like if him. Vegas was in your backyard for events, because there are always big events in Vegas. Okay. Everything's bigger over there. Everything's bigger in Vegas, clearly. <laughs> Everyone says it. That's what they say, isn't it? Don't they say that? Everything's yeah. bigger in I've, Vegas? I've heard that. Uh -huh. In Vegas. That's not... What happens in Texas stays in Texas. That's yeah, not... it's the tales all this time. Y'all are trolling me. They say everything's bigger in Vegas, do they not? I think you're trolling me. Oh, that's Texas. <laughs> <laughs> I actually got that wrong. That's why he said <laughs> what happens in Texas stays in Texas. <laughs> oh, that's... Okay, I get it. He was joking with you. <laughs> Y'all got me. Uh, Y'all got me. Okay, I, I just hate this. I keep looking through. Oh, here we go. What's I feel this? like I feel like this moment has happened a lot recently. Nine eight clash cards. I don't have any of those. I mean, three of them. Three yeah, of them not, is not. It's enough. not going to be a playable situation for you. No, it's not. <laughs> none of these are playable, Zach. Well, you know, I'm in an unplayable situation. It'll play. It'll <laughs> it can always be resources, It'll right? play, it'll play. It can always be resources. And hey, don't forget you have to choose a contender. Have you done that yet? No. Sweet. Is that an important part of the process? Where are they? This is your stack. No. Oh, man. Okay, <laughs> let's look at universally good. Okay. War. Lots of attacks. Okay. Tokens. Understood. Clarity. Top two, any number on the bottom. And She's the good, man. Uh, that's what I'm running. I'm gonna need to nope. fix a lot of problems. Uh, if you do deal one damage, target clash card, or not, it's dealt to this contender. Draw one card. This feels like it needs. We need to make sure we can hit our draws. Clash. I don't have enough of those. During move any number of street counters. No way. Haven. Don't have any relics. We're starting. Magnate, alphas are plus zero, plus one. Generically good. And then once you can engage to discard, okay, that's now, pretty solid. The other part of this choice is that you're going to have four of this in there. Yeah. So if you choose clarity, white is heal two. Yeah, always good, yeah. Uh, if you choose magnate, green is your opponent discards a card. Just giving you. When a clash card an opponent controls is defeated, you may engage this card to draw a card. A 20 health. One he defense. has one defense. Yeah. Took us a minute to find that last yeah. time. And then it was like, defense oh, he just gains, especially in this. Not I think like we're all going to have a lot of little bodies on the table. When a death clash card you control is defeated, no, that's Bad. not going to happen. Okay. So let's go clarity. That's just going to be universally have a game. Well, this is thematic. 
Well, I don't know that. <laughs> I'm playing against. I'm playing as War. Clarity versus War is that uh, in the books there? In set two, the alt art uh, cards um, is an old picture of them when they were much younger fighting near the portal. Uh, it should be like it's the Clarity split split resource card. Um, gosh, what are their names? <clears throat> Some, can someone in chat tell me the names of those cards? See all the cards from set two. Do we have those all all ten? I looked and saw if I had anything under alt art, and I don't. But I might have the actual card. I think you probably do have the alt. We're gonna wait till chat figures it out, or we're just not gonna pop it. Just too busy ripping on the. I what see. Yeah. The Texas, the Texas Vegas, Vegas thing is. <laughs> some say they're just gonna be joking about it forever. <laughs> That Ryan told me that once. Things bigger in Vegas. No, that's the OG card clarifying. There's a literal clarity card and a war card. War of the Second Horseman. That's the name of it. Yeah, yeah, I got you. Wait, no, that's the. Uh... Oh, here it is. It's the other version of that. Yes, that's half of it, and it goes together with the other yeah. one. Yeah. There's a clarity. Anyways, it's clarity versus war. Which is I'm what's happening. I always wondered why war was drawn that way, Zach. That war? Yeah, you know anything about that? Uh, it's because that's from old old times. You might notice he's dressed almost Romanish, huh? Like there was a clash previously. You know what? Those people don't re don't often talk about for things to be collectible in the card gaming space. They need to look good. Yeah, yeah. You can't just slap a one hundred one or a one of twenty one on it. If and something is it looks one, good, really. it's rare. And it's a card that people actually play. It's the trifecta. That's the nexus where you get like Fandel Spring Tuning. Yeah, and that's why Sorcery gets that. When you do all traditional art, you're also art collecting. That's right. Let me see. Here's the other one. Thank you, Flesh of Blood. Okay. Yeah, hey, we got okay, it. We got let's it. Let's do it. Spoiler Harbinger of Death. All right, Oops. so we played a thousand games. What is it? Seven cards? No, Good eight. mulligan or bad it's, mulligan? It's bad. Well, I, I don't want to. Do you pitch the whole hand? Let me just pull up. Do you set aside okay. or do you discard? Reveal your contender. Randomly determine who goes first. You got to die. While well, you're working on that, each player shuffles their main deck and then draws eight. Each player may then shuffle any number of cards back into your deck and then draw back up to shuffle eight. Shuffle before draw. Okay, so it's a mid mulligan. Yeah, the worst is just shuffle your hand in and draw again. Yeah. Uh, Best is set aside. And then shuffle at the end. Even Steven. That's an odd. You touched the die there. It didn't count. Uh, so then, you can shuffle any number back in. Let me do my own mulligan real quick. I've got a really clear... Hmm. Okay, I definitely want this. Let's freak Steven out. And then, I do want this. I do like that. It's fine. Okay. Seems good. Ugh. Okay, well that's a resource, right? I'm gonna mulligan four. All right, let's just uh, market market check real quick. Uh, I'm limited up to <laughs> one thirty five per box. Uh, it already just happened. Yeah, the bottom ones are gonna sell out, and then it's gonna be sold out and gone. I'm telling you, man. Watch it. We're like a shut up, sit down review. I, I, uh, I called it. Mark me. Late game card. I'm gonna pitch to you. Okay. I'm only in four. Straw. Um, okay. Then for my next trick, I think particularly playing unlimited last week is like so. There's similarities. You put you can put any card down as a resource. Um, the, the mulligan for that was the you shuffle your whole hand back in. Mm -hmm. Just like these little tweets that you can get confusing. Uh, start, we have our starting health. I'm at 30, you're at 30. How are we going to track that? Uh, you know, on our brains. Uh, just kidding. All right, here we go. Five sixes or six fives? Six fives. We're not savages. I agree. More sophisticated time. Like marble, marbly dice. Aren't they nice? 
They really are, actually. We got them because they're the biggest ones to test in the adjusted boards. And they fit, but you... I barely did. They don't really fit. I mean, they get in there. All right. Then players, play's going to be in my first turn. I skip the ready and draw step at the first turn because I'm going first. Time okay. uh, And I may not declare any attacks, but after that, there's no... After that, it's sickness. baseball. Yeah. So let's put a card down as a uh, resource. I'm going to put... Uh, yikes. Yikes, 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 yikes. I'm going to put... Uh, Moxie sidearm down, and I'm gonna do it upside down so I don't get confused here. And then we're gonna play Moxie uh, preparing for battle. One cost, one black threshold. It says trigger enter. You may draw one card. So I'll draw, replace over to you. One one, huh? One one. I've got a better. I've got a better version of that card. Okay, <laughs> these are all good things. Good things, good things. All right, uh, at the beginning of my draw step, I'm gonna look at the top two cards and put any number of them on the bottom. I have a portal here in case we need it. It's currently closed, so I'll put it here. Um, Clockwork Gadgets, hey, my local store, I bought Star Wars Unlimited at earlier today for $95, just up the price to 140 bucks. Blood's in the water. Blood's That's $20 over water. MSRP, just so we're clear. Bump. Bum, 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 bum. Both those go down. Yeah, we'll keep that one on top. It's kind of fun being on the outside of one. It is. It's like, it's I, I've <laughs> nothing. No, there's no. It's great. All right, let's go uh, there. And then, am I running a, a rush deck or what? I'm going to spin one Haven, Resourceful Helper, Trigger, Enter, Draw a card. Come on. Look at us. That was adorable, the, what we just did there. Um, punch me for one? Punch you for one. And so you can't attack things, if you're out there watching and have no idea, uh, unless they are whatever tapped means in this game, exhausted, engaged. Yeah, whatever clever tap um, word. So his only choice there, Haven has two health, even the resourceful helper. So I can't, if I block, I die, because you do one to me and I have one health. Here, so Over me? Over to you, yeah. Draw. Let's put this uh, red resource down. And then... Um, bum, bum, bum. Yeah, we could just uh, attack each other contender-wise. If we wanted to speed the game up, I just don't know if my deck wants to go long or short. I can't imagine what's to go long because the cards don't get better. <laughs> Got them. But I feel like it's more sophisticated to not swing for no reason. Mm. I'm going to play uh, one cost Captain Maxine Riggins. And then I'll go ahead and just swing out here. That's great. Then. I'm going to use Moxie preparing for battle to swing at Clarity. Take one. I have one defense, so I go away. You die. Unless you don't want to do that. I do want to do that. Now it's trigger war. Or I guess I should have done it when I attack. So it's trigger attack. Uh, only do this. It's the second attack you've played this turn. Tap and draw a card. Okay. And then uh, I'll pass to you. Mm hmm. Start of the draw step. Look at the top two. <laughs> Ryan Rubber. If it gets to 200, I have four boxes for sale. <laughs> okay. We like this. We like this. Okay. So let's let's really take a look. Yeah. Why did you do that song? You're gonna murder me. Is this a rush deck? Aren't they all? Where's our portal? Is it open yet? No. What? Do, how do we do that? Uh, you can either play a card that activates the portal, or you can pay two to activate it on your turn. Okay. I would love for you to do that. I'm gonna leave. I'm gonna leave these bad boys here. <coughs> Bless you. Thank you. All right, then we draw a card. Uh -huh, uh -huh. And then we play a resource. Got 
one blue and one white. Now wait, this is a, you gotta spend them to, to use them. Yes. Um, it's not like spoils. So if a card, like as an example, this uh, Moxie preparing for battle has a one cost, so I have to pay one resource. Yay. And under that's a little black uh, diamond. So you actually, one of the resources you use to pay for this card has to be a black resource in order for this to come into play. I run into that all the time. Because spoils was, as long as you have that in play, you've met the threshold. It's, wow, this is going to be a total mind mind. Mind mind. Okay. Mind squared, some would say. Uh, I'm going to swing it to you for one. I think I'm playing a rush deck. Okay. It's important to realize that. I later. guess the red deck? Yeah. <laughs> what could go wrong? Well, look, Terrence, he's a 2 1. That's a rush card. T Bone? T Bone himself. Uh, T Bone is going to swing yeah. at war, and we're going to play Awaken. So I'm going to heal two, and then I'm going to get plus one, plus one. Do did you have it. any clash buffs? I pass. All right, so you take three. I don't I die. It. I did it. And then I healed up. See, I took the damage first so I could heal the max two. You Look see, it's you. called max He's value. He's a genius. That's what I call that. Mine? Yeah. Max value. That's my middle name. It's even max value Willie. I believe it. My cards are disappearing. Where, where's all my card draw? Do you have card draw? Yes, I've been drawing the whole time. You gotta have two attacks though. I have to have two attacks? Because their second attack is when you get to trigger Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I was confused for a second there. Mm, 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 is Ryan out there? Mm, mm hmm. Yeah. What's Ryan up to? I think he's excited for a little Vegas uh, reunion with you. I'm excited. <laughs> Dreams come true in Vegas. <laughs> is that the. That's what they say. <laughs> Vegas, the city of brotherly love. Yeah, the city, the city of dreamers. <laughs> oh, man. Uh, all right, I'm going to attack your clarity with war. We're going to each take one. Oh, that was me coming through. What are you doing? I'm attacking your clarity with war. All right, so we each take one. We each take one, yeah. Um, yeah, no free lunch for Sergeant Weber here. Come on in. Trade him. Uh, I'm going to attack your clarity. Okay. And then I'm gonna awaken. Okay, I'll take three. So you'll take three, and I'm red, so I'll deal two damage here. And it was my second attack, so that's it. Mr. Trigger. Nice draw card. Nice draw card. Okay, over to you. Okay, so every time you play a clash buff, you do two damage. Um, but it's only to a clash card. Okay. So I can't do two to your contender with my buff. Thank goodness. So the draw phase. Let's filter. It seems pretty powerful, if I'm going to be honest. Slide that bad boy over. Let's draw this card. Ready our resources. We got one white and one blue. Game looks good, man. Game looks good. Let's play a green resource. Look at us. Ooh, got a rainbow. Sparkles. Mm. You need, we need a sparkle effect that you can apply on one side of the screen or not. <laughs> now, Contender is not a Clash card, right? No. Mm -mm. Okay. Clash cards notably... Uh, say Clash card on it. On the bottom right-ish yeah. area, say Clash. All right, I'm going to spin three. But they're all Alpha Clash cards. So I, I you could make a case. Mm -hmm. All day. <laughs> Someone help me. I'm finally going to get that first YouTube copyright strike for all the humming. Get out of here. Swing at your, your Weber there. Do that. That is Clarity Inspiring Leaders inspired. Does it do anything? I'm going to give another target clash card plus one plus okay. zero, but I'm going to not, not do that. You weren't supposed to do that. What? And then... Uh-oh. Uh yeah, let's go. Wait, now can I block for, for this? I can't remember how it works in Alpha Clash. Um... I think it's like Ashes. Dang it, and Ashes is different too. In Ashes, your stuff can block for your thing, but they can't block for each other. And I don't think the Contender can block, but the Phoenixborn can block for your things. Your things can't block for your Phoenixborn? Hold on. 
They just gotta block in second. Because I think they can. I think if they're untapped, they can block for the contender. They can block for the contender. I, they can't block for each other. I, I think there's a keyword. I don't think the contender can block for the dudes. See, while Zach's looking at a flesh and blood X, seems to have a, a tip for UI. Looks look looks look like. What's maybe? that? She doesn't have to engage to use, so she can still contender attack for the race. Probably because of her ability. Yeah, she can. She can yeah, still. Yeah. yeah, she she's going to swing. I think for sure. About that one. If we're racing. How about that one. There we go. Yeah, so her is just like a draw two at the start passively. I don't think you can block. Your clash cards can intercept for your Clash hero. cards can intercept for your hero or other clash cards. Contender cannot block for the clash. Contender can block yeah. for clash. Swing for one. One to, one to both. Back to you. Contender can't block for Clash. Clash can block for Contender. That's the advantage of having him standing up. Well, well. It's hard to love well. and not be loved. It's hard to free your mind. Break your heart from many a poor boy, but you never break the shirt of mine. That might be what I'm listening to on my way home. Maybe time to break out the old, old, old crow. Old, old crow? Old, old crow. Back before they were like everyone else. Mm -hmm. All right, let's play game. Clash cards, can they not block for the, I don't think they can block for the clash cards. I think clash cards can block for contender. That's it. That's the whole game. And an intercept can block for clash cards. I'm on it. I mean, that's how I would design it. Otherwise, what's intercept? The defending player may obstruct with one or more of the red class cards. You obstruct by engaging one or more class cards you control. When obstructors are declared, the attacking contender class card is now attacking the obstructor. It's not the original target. So I can obstruct any attack you send my way if I have a standing thing. With a class card. But you can't obstruct. Can't obstruct with a, with a guy, with a contender. With a contender. Yeah. Okay. I you still may. say that Alpha Clash has one of the best rule books in the business. Yeah, they did a good job. You can search it. It's just bullet points. Yeah. So it's like defend. Bump, 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 bump. All right. Great. I think it's Bardog in time. We're going to play the Bardog and Warhorn. What's that do? Uh, when it enters play, I get a war token. So this is just going to break the game, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, you're not going to like it. Uh, at the end of my turn, if the portal is open, I create one of these guys. Okay. It's not no, open. I won't be doing that. Yet. Presently. Um, but I am going to attack um, your contender. We just take one. Okay. And then I'm going to attack here. And I'm going to awaken. So I'm going to get plus one, plus one, and I'm going to do two damage to this. Okay. So we trade? Yes. But I had to get that off the, the, the board. All right. All right. You're in rush zone. I, I know you'll run out of bodies, but I'm just persistent enough. Yeah, I'm definitely not. Uh... Yeah, the uh, fly, flight can only be blocked by things that intercept. Although you're digging through your, your cards. That's really what I'm quickly. saying, man. You better watch out. That's right. I'll open that portal and we'll just get a dude. Dudes for days. Watch your buckets. It's my strategy. Um, let's take this one. Our card. We're gonna resource. We're gonna go conquest for three. Why do you have so much beef? I got beef in different area codes, man. Uh, let's go three on you. Which which conquest is that? Conquest triumphant brute. The beefy boy. Let's go one on you. I'm getting slaughtered. Ooh, wow. Nice victory trigger. Yeah. Just put out some tokens, man. He's thick. Then let's go... I feel like... Do you have any pingy stuff? Mm -mm. And then do you have any... Your little war tokens will come out. 
when I'm at 10 or less health, my uh, tokens get plus one attack and a breakthrough. So you can pay two to activate, and at the start of the turn, you get a guy? At the start of the turn? If at it's the open? At the end of a turn of the portal's open. At the end? End of my turn of the portal's open. Okay. Let's go here for T-Bone. I like the according to the rules comment. <laughs> All right. Let's see if we can... Oh, my God. Uh, okay. One... play Weber weapons expert <laughs> and I'm gonna play casualty of war send target class card I controlled with oblivion okay I do draw two you got two red money over there yeah? uh, I spent I spent four yeah so two black resources oh, you know what? I forgot two to, red resources on, on. I need oh, to put a I need to put a resource oh, there gosh uh, we're, gonna, we're gonna put this down. this guy's going to Vegas man <laughs> uh, not yet okay so draw two and activate the portal Send target to you, and if you do draw two and activate the wow, that's a that's a bold play. And then I got one floating, so I'm gonna play Captain Maxine Riggins for mm -hmm. one, and then I'll pass at the end of the round and get a war token. Got it. Body, body. <laughs> it's war time. Mm-hmm. We like that card. Oh, we like this card, too. We like them both. We're going to draw one, though. <laughs> I've got some good victory. So, so your little doodads can block for your, your stuff. Is that My accurate? little doodads. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and you can't attack them because they're not tapped. You know what I mean? You know what I mean. Right. So we can just send, we'll just send pain and see what happens. The train is leaving the station. <laughs> <laughs> the pain train, baby. I don't know which one of these cards I want. Is there one that closes the portal? I want to know. I don't know that one. <laughs> that one ain't happening. Uh, Shut it down. <laughs> We got a leak. I'll just, I'll just do that. I feel like your ability to filter your cards and get your big dudes has been powerful. Yay! I've just been drawing garbanzos. I think, I think it needs to go like this. As much as I want to play this one, well, I guess I get to decide. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Okay. Draw this. Um, let's go. Yeah, hey, Ryan reminded you. You can spend two and close the portal if you want. Yeah, but nobody has time for that. I mean, if we go back and forth doing that forever. You just get a token every time, and I get nothing. I like this math. So, so yeah, no, we don't. That's that's called no. No, we don't. Do that's that. called nah, dog. Keep on swinging him for two. You like that? You would currently just do two and die. Mm hmm Do two and die. Hmm. You can't okay. spend two to close the portal. That's crazy. I, I will not buy it. All right, take two. Uh, let's swing one at you. With old Claire Bear? Mm-hmm. <laughs> we'll each take one. 
Sim Conquest for three there. Uh, I'm gonna block with this guy. Yeah, no, he won. It must be done. Uh, I didn't resource, sorry. <laughs> pay five for Lynn. Swing oh, five sweet flight. Sweet Lord Almighty. Oof. Take five. Right. Over to you. All right. Cool. This is easy. Easy, easy. Um, yeah, but running, if Zach opens the portal with two, he gains a 1 1 token. If I close the portal, I gain nothing. So if we did that for the rest of the game, he would obliterate me. Which is not cool. <laughs> not a fan of obliteration? No, I'm not an obliteration fan. Obliteration, no breathing. <laughs> it's hat time, baby. Hey, you know what will make me really good at this game is if I have this hat. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. You guys have played against this player a lot. Mm -hmm. Everybody knows this player's in Vegas. This player's going to Vegas. Driving that Tacoma to Vegas. What are you going to do, bro? <laughs> bro. Bro, what are you going to do? Die. Nice Warhorn, man. That's good. It's good play. How many cards are in your hand? One. So we're on top deck today. What do you have Clarity's ability? Yeah, not really a top deck. Two. I've been testing this deck for like three months. <laughs> me, and my, me and my buds back home. I think it's pretty good. <laughs> this guy's I'll, be, I'll be normal again. I'll be normal. This guy's miserable. <laughs> Let's play this. Um, there's an answer. There it is. Okay. Uh, I'm gonna attack here. All right. Can you attack flight? Yeah, I think you block. can. Yeah, yeah. Then I'll wake in. Okay. So I'm doing and three, three clash and pretty two, good and two damage off of my right. thing. Trade him up. And let him go. I mean, it's okay, but that's all I've drawn. Yeah. It's like, what is happening? Yeah. Um. There will be an answer. <laughs> um, let's go. Alternative strike. No. <laughs> You're playing fancy off of Clash. I'm just playing dudes. Let's let's. Ugh. I like that, Nathaniel. <laughs> All right, I'll go back. Uh, I'll do a turn of strike to do two damage here. Show me your red resources. Two. What does it say on the card, please? It says choose one. Deal two damage to a target contender clash card, or send target to non-accessory or non-target non-trap accessory to oblivion. Uh, if the portal's open, I can do both. Nice play, dude. Doesn't matter. Uh, then I'm gonna punch him here. Take three. I'll take three. And at the end of the turn, we'll get a war token. <laughs> Stinky. Yeah, it was a good turn, man. Uh huh. I feel like you're playing your board game bro character. Yeah, I totally am. I'm talking about launching a different YouTube channel called Board Game Bros. Brah. And we wear backwards hats, of course. But I don't think I can keep that joke up for more than like two minutes. I want both of these bad boys. Eventually. Don't like that. Swing you for one. Take one. Man. Take one. Take one. Okay. Just see where this is a two attack. Case that matters. That's a two attack? Yeah. According to what? My ability that once I'm at 10 life or less. Oh. Sick. That really is sick. Yeah. Spin three for war cry, four, two, breakthrough. Let's swing for four with breakthrough. Four? Um. 
Hmm. Okay. I will not block take three. Block, but you want to let's let's go to reactions. Reactions. I'm gonna play this thing again and do two to that guy. Okay. So wait, does somebody have to be fighting for you to clash buff? Yeah, I'm buffing this guy. Okay, and then it fizzles because yeah. he, he takes the yeah. two. You got it. All right, and unless Raging Plasma acts to fight. Take two. Yeah. All right. Back to you. Can he pull it out in time? Top deck city, baby. Four clash buffs, Bun. That's pretty good. It's uh, fine. I just I didn't have anything to play. Yeah, but you could take the board here, just making a bunch of minions. Yes, it's true. Uh, as long as you get this, which I think you can. Uh, torque, redirecting damage, for two. Uh. Uh, when he is defeated, I draw a card. Cool. So I'm gonna attack for two here. Yeah. Then I'm gonna attack here for one, and I'll draw a card. Take it. You have to tap to do that. Mm -mm. Man, it's just the nature of the beast. Man. And then I'll save four resources. An insurmountable advantage happening to here. To play this. What the heck? Maybe. That's like what we want to draw. I mean, the same card. Unfortunately, I'm down uh, 19 health currently. Otherwise, we'd be feeling great. <laughs> <laughs> I don't like any, either of these. Good. I mean, they're not bad. They're bodies. Like, this is where I'm just going to start drawing, like, clash cards and stuff. Let's see. And then you've got two to one, two, one. Do I play it conservative is the question. I'm hulking up. Play it conservative. Ever since I went to see it sting, uh, in the prelude to seeing sting, I was watching more wrestling things to catch mm -hmm. up. But now my algorithms are like serving me wrestling things. And I do want to watch them. So, you know, it's like Hulk Hogan versus The Rock that I've never seen. It's like, I'll watch that for five minutes. And then YouTube's like, you know what? I bet he would also like to see this video. What do you think's on the top of this bad boy? Garbage. I'm going to try. Because like both of these are basically things that just instantly trade with a minion. And you can put them both under? Yeah, I can put them both under. Yeah. I think I just need to try to find something that's going to end the game. I agree. Flight, et cetera. Yeah, something big. Yeah. I could always draw events. Hmm, that's not terrible. Not terrible, not terrible. Okay. <laughs> I like the idea of backward hat Steven as card shark Steven. Yeah. So he's been playing tier two this whole time, but when he has the hat <laughs> on backwards, he's, he's fierce <laughs> and like tier one Steven. <laughs> We've got some breaking news from Alpha Clash. Breaking news? Yep. The comic book is coming soon. Comic book? Yep. Launches April 9th on G the Kickstarter. Genuine comic book? Genuine. <laughs> Check out their Discord for more. Did you, uh, did you draw the thing you were looking for? All, I, it's not terrible. Things. I drew better than the other cards I had, so that's good. It, it was an improvement, you're saying? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so then what we're going to do, we know we're going to do that. We know we're going to do this. And the order is going to matter. So now we go down the decision tree here. Swing at you for one. Take one. Yeah, I think we've got, that's a clock there. Uh, and then we'll play Haven for three. <laughs> I'll swing at you at a two, three. Adorable. Uh, I'll block here. Okay. Trades, and then I'll close the portal. Boom. Pass it to you. Which haven was that? Steve? That was Haven stocking up. Whenever she kills that, I can put two relic, uh, two collection counters on a relic I control. Mm. Aren't we all glad for that? <laughs> wow, let's put this down. <laughs> <laughs> um. Dude, once you get me to ten, I start drawing. You better watch your buckets. Well, I know. <laughs> I've got like I've got hot sauce in here somewhere. I'm gonna pay three and do two here. Okay, very creative. Yeah, and then I'm gonna send this guy there. Okay. When this is defeated, I draw a card. Plus, it's my second attack, so I'll draw two cards. That's good. Having any card draw ability on the character is incredible. Very. Powerful. And the warhorn. The warhorn is busted in skill. They should not expect. 
Uh, I'll pay two and open the portal. Mm. Who would have thought? Who saw that coming? Hmm. Pay two for a dude forever. But you you can now always pay two if you don't have something to do. Mm -hmm. And if it's if it's not closing the portal, then it's playing in a game ending card. But if you had two horns out, watch out. I mean, are these? It's, it's you can only one. It's okay. Exclusive. Okay. Thank goodness. You're um, only winning because you're drawing better. I'll pass to you. Oh, no. <laughs> but I'm not winning, dog. Get your token out. Yeah, yeah. That's a very fortunate pass for me. It's war time. And this ability is quite good. I, the, we're seeing the beautiful thing about the game, right? Of like... Huh. Wade Jones, this is nice. Uh, saying, just joined the stream, looking forward to watching everything I missed. This box is a delight for any fans of TCGs. It's a joyful product. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Put sorry. that on the box. Sorry, I look insane, Wade. <laughs> Wade's like, what happened to Steven also? <laughs> He was tired of now, the now, second tier. Now this is interesting, you know. Mm -hmm. You basically got two more turns of playing bad cards. Hmm. I've got. A, I've got a uh, fascinating. See, like this is look at the look at the situation you get yourself into. I've got a. I've got a magnate four four here, which is quite good. But he's two threshold. I've got one down. There's no way I can play this card for the rest of the game. So he's going, <laughs> shipping that one. Mm, but he would end the game. <laughs> well, he's not flying, so you just block with a minion. He would end the game. And then you'd have to just put bodies out, which the Warhorns get at. Uh, We're living on a hope and a prayer over here. Uh, I'll swing for one. I do hate that. <laughs> block it. Uh, I block for two. You take two. OK. Wow, so you have to have something that prevents three damage. What kind of crazy <laughs> stuff do you have? Is it a counter attack, like kill the thing that's swinging I or something? I don't know. You've got two, one open? It can't be that good. Yeah, two open. Yeah, two open. Well, that's probably OK. I guess I just have to make you Maybe I'm calling your bluff, right? dog. No, there's like, <laughs> unless you had something in hand, you would not have blocked with that minion. <laughs> there is no way in in human history, there is no way that Zach blocks with that minion if he does not have something in hand that prevents a character that's about to swing in. Ah, oh, man. There is, Zach, there is not even conceivable. Bro. Wow. Close that portal. Hold, hold that tiger. Let's pay three for clarity, inspiring leader. Trigger attack, and the target clash card gets plus one plus zero till end of turn. I don't have any more. That's a bummer. Um, now I can risk it for Le Biscuit. Le Biscuit. And you do your thing and you spend your money. Mm -hmm. Or I can not do anything. You waste the mana. I have the opportunity to trigger the plus one plus zero next turn, which could be impactful depending on what I draw. I also am not going to lose this character. But if I don't have an answer, you just do two damage here. You have an answer. You have an answer. Like, it's the stupidest. It's not even a question. Unless you read it wrong, which is possible. It is possible. <laughs> yeah, sure is. <laughs> it's like, it's like, well... Um... What could you have? What kind of cards are in that deck? Are in like the pool that would stop this? It's like almost every card in the game so far <laughs> is in this pool. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you know it's red or black. I guess that's 40% of the cards in the pool. I'm going to hold here. All right, mine? Yeah. I think if I try like a clash buff or something here and I can remove, I think I can get weird. Let's try You got a read on Brendan recently? Is he playing Lorcana? He's playing a little bit of this, a little bit of that. Did he turn into a Marvel snapper? <laughs> Didn't he get start a podcast like he... snapping? I think he's always been a snapper. <laughs> I won't put any resources. Does down. he just do a podcast about anything that he's doing? I think so. Yeah. Playing Denver. Okay. That's not my symbols. Uh. I don't know what that helmet symbol is actually, but then the alpha symbol <laughs> is, I've never even seen that. Um, alpha cards get plus one attack. Yeah, got it. 
And then enter, draw two cards, discard one. Okay, that's good. That's the best part of that card for you, for sure. This is Moxie symbol. Yeah, the, uh, the, alpha, hunters. the alpha Hunters, yeah. Sure. We're not used to seeing it because we never play that faction. I have to discard one. Uh, one it's going to be this one. Okay. So I need. You only spend four. And then you whatever trap you had that you're. It's probably hopefully not going to get played. We're going when I to... put the backward hound on it, how, it, isn't it nice when I can narrate your actions for you? Oh, isn't it that, is nice. Isn't that what we all enjoy gonna... across the table? Open the portal. Yeah, I understand exactly what you're doing, man. I've already played out the turn. Uh, <laughs> to the depths. Uh, send target clash card with a defense power of three or less to oblivion. That's, That's pretty good. Um, you couldn't have played that on your turn. Did you think you could play that on your turn? On your turn, you mean? On my turn? I don't know. Dude, that's like the misplay. That's so funny. Then I'm actually. gonna play War <laughs> Battle te Tactician. Trigger Enter. If the portal's open, create a one-one red War token. Ah, uh, that's good. The game's turned over. That token can't be obstructed or be the target of a clash buff this turn. At the end of the turn, send that token to oblivion. So I'm gonna swing for two here. Okay. It's gonna go away at the end. That's right. But then at the end of the turn, I'm gonna get one from this. That's yes, right. All right. Uh, and we'll leave this guy out for insurance. Fair enough. Fair enough. Let's go to Top Deck City. <laughs> Let's go. <laughs> mm -hmm. There's nothing I, I like more than being down by like 19 and thinking I have a chance. You got a chance. Yeah, That's... I just gotta go through two cards a turn and then find something that can end the game. Yeah. I can't swing anymore because he got a 2 2. So now it's just watch it happen. <laughs> watch myself slowly lose. Mm -hmm. Um, I mean, neither of these are going to win the game for me. Ship them. <laughs> but I don't know if there's anything left that's worth playing. Eh. I don't know. You just get a big, big body I can't deal with. You'll now have an attack every turn, that kind of thing. All right, well, we'll play this at least, see what happens. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, blue resource and then probably a white resource. We'll play Haven Taking Risks. Enter. <laughs> Reveal the top card of your deck. Mm -hmm. Conquest. Uh, the Domineer. Once per turn during your prime, you may engage to activate the portal. That's good. I'd like to play that. I can lose health equal to that card's initial cost. If I do, put two collection counters on target relic you control and then put the reveal card in your hand. Can I use it if I don't have a relic? Does it say and then? It says then. A lot of times that's the, you have to do the first thing to get the second thing, but I don't know how the rules work here. Oh, that's bad. If I could draw this card, it would be good. Can you just leave it on top? What happens well, if you Well, I mean, it? like, I would draw it right now. Oh, put it into my hand, yeah, play yeah. it for one, close the portal, and then mm. that would be good. So I'm going to guess I can't do that. If we're wrong, someone correct us in the chat. If you do, so. put two collection cards on target relic you control, then put the reveal card. Yeah, there's no way I can do that. We still just pay two to close the portal. Oh, I'll, yeah, I'll be doing that. The greatest exchange on the planet. And then uh, we got no tradesies, so now we're just in take our time. Try to find the answer. Close Let's the port. War tokens are going to be stacking up. Mm -hmm. Let's go for go. it. Uh, the Warhorn, I think, is ridiculous. It probably is the. It has to be the best to generate dudes every turn in a game like this. I mean, there there are genuine bombs though in the game. Like just big, yeah, big units. Yeah, yeah you're right. The play character has a like a rate of arrows type card. The what character? The play character. The mm. death fan, whatever the one that has one defense on the. Can, can All right. There's a green card that's basically random. I'll attack here for two. Can't. Why not? Not engaged. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. All right. Well, let's do it this way. I'll attack clarity for two. Take it. I'll attack clarity for two. Take it. Trigger my draw. I need to get to Drawsville. Okay. Uh, end of the turn. Wow, you got some Garbo in there. Boy. Everybody? That's horrible. Okay, let's get top two. Hmm. 
That's good. Don't take this guy off the table. Oh, uh, yeah. We love this. This is great. Okay. Uh... Oh. I believe it I believe we've done it. That's pretty ambitious. You gotta have all sorts of weird tricks in your hand, right? Maybe. <laughs> I mean, they're not doing anything else. They're literally, your cards are doing nothing else. I don't know what you drafted, but good on you, man. I may have just picked two colors and smashed that like button, which if you haven't done yet, you should. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I'm going to put Pestilence World Degrader in here. What's he do? During primary, when a class part in, in an opponent controls is defeated, he gets plus one, plus one until end of turn. Uh, so then I'm going to swing at one at your contender. Um, one. Oh wait, 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 no, no, no! I need to pump him up. This guy, and then I take two, and then I swing again. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Let's do it like that. Ah, uh, no, I like this better. Ah. Uh, yeah, I think that is better. Well, one, one. Because either way, that's not going to get you to the, the, the kill. So let's go here. I'm going to attack that war minion. So you're going to take two. Mm -hmm. And I will die. That's right. If and I don't block. And then I'll go plus one, plus one here. Which I mean. We're getting into reasonable. All right. And then we'll swing at a uh, contender there. Uh, one one. I was like, why does he have two tokens? Mm -hmm. So he's a three five. Three five. I have a rules question. <laughs> for myself. I've got to go to the bathroom. I'll be right back. <laughs> What's up, Josh? Yeah. I mean, I'm in. I've decided to. I'm decided to play tier one okay. TCG. Okay. Bro. All right. Um, I have a quick action that reacts to you attacking. I'm gonna play collateral damage. Okay. For two. Um, and it says the three damage to target attacking clash card. This one. That one, yeah. And then it says then if the portal is open, I can pay two red. If I do, deal two damage to another target clash card. Okay. Which I could do, and, and non clash damage sticks around the whole turn. Mm -hmm. So I have to decide. I will not pay the extra. Okay. That was a card I had earlier. Mm -hmm. That if you had attacked, I would have just used those resources for free and then had, yeah. So either that means you're going to block with your war minion and it would do four damage total, and then nothing would matter. Or. It means that the thing in your hand means that if you spend the two resources, you can't do it. In which case, you have a way to take pestilence off the table. Now, because otherwise, there's no downside. With you being at five, even if I blocked here and you had two extra damage, you wouldn't die. Exactly. But there's also no downside of you triggering that unless there's something you need those resources for. Because if you trigger the two damage, that makes me think, oh, he's got it. Also, if you don't block and you have a clash buff, have you played all four of your clash buffs? Three. Three. So you could threaten clash buff. Now, if I have a clash buff here and you don't have an answer, I would win the game, of course, but I don't have any cards in the end. That's right. So that's easy math for me. Yeah. And then... Uh, then I've also got to ask the question, <laughs> can you get a four damage thing off the board just straight away? Mm, these are good questions. Very good questions. He's a beefy boy. I think... I mean, best case scenario, I get a war minion off the table. You get another one. You got some funny business going on here. 
or we finally figure out what you've been holding in your hand this whole time. Which is gonna eventually come out. Eventually. It will eventually be known. <laughs> All right, I'm just gonna close the portal and I'll pass. Boo. Fine. Eventually I'm gonna draw my characters that are good. You will, yeah. And you've got a million ways to do it because you've got the card draw every turn. Whoosh. Oakley doakley. Um, I'm gonna swing at you for two. Take it. Uh-oh, what's your thing now? I'm going to look at the top three and draw one. Uh-oh. Uh, I'll attack for two. Anything draw. happen when I die or when he dies? I'll take two. Hello, dark. Need to have either like a a tremendous amount of bodies so that I can get through all of your attack or all of your stead up things. I need to draw some kind of hot sauce card. I'll play War Controlling Minds. Ooh, what does that do? Target clash card you don't control must abstract if able. Okay. Let's keep these. Cost you four. Yeah. Ooh. Okay. Is dad is dad horning? <laughs> that's, a, that's maybe maybe the not the best verb. We're so close. <laughs> <laughs> Woo! Um, the backwards hat makes it okay to say that. <laughs> Um, uh, I'm not going to recover from that. <laughs> Critical strike. Uh, we'll spend four here, and then I'll pay two. Uh, open this. And get this at the end. That's it, huh? That's it. That's all. Okay. Oh, wait. wait. I'm putting this down face down. I didn't realize what it was. <laughs> it's a trap. <laughs> <laughs> hey, block box. What's going on, Ricky? All right, the start of the draw step, two cards. Ricky, did you notice? Can you give me the full shot here, John? Did you notice anything? Yeah, he said I really am pushing for a segment of the show called Getting on My Bulk Box instead of Soapbox. Mm -hmm. Also, that has a camera and it's clear to see that I'm standing on like eight bolt boxes. It's good marketing because you can like jump up and down on them and nothing happens. Mm. Does this, do these cards matter? Do you feel like you're winning or losing? I don't know what's in the deck. I, I If I had a couple of things with flight and stuff, I'd feel okay. But I, I honestly, if I were you, I would not be swinging at all. I would be building a billion minions, and then that would be my end game. Well, I feel like I'm at a pace right now where <laughs> I can do both. But what if you just stopped swinging and just built a minion every turn? What would I do? Well, <laughs> if at any point you draw flight, I lose. Yeah, that's true. And I'm nervous with the, especially of white and green, and there's a lot of flight in that. Like I saw a magnate, which makes me nervous. Uh, okay. When do, when do I do this at the start of my turn? Anyway, I'm going to do this at the start of the turn. What is it? Activate the portal. Oh, that's nice. Yeah, so I don't need the, the cash. Um, Man, I really don't know the right call here. This is money. Oh, and my money. My money on my mind. Okay. So that's at least worth something. You know what? Oh, my goodness. Hmm. Okay, it hasn't mattered. Yeah, no, it's only uh, not nobody yet, except this one I'm about to play. That's what I was just looking at. Oh, sure. Okay, let's draw here. And then uh, we're going to go to the primary phase. I'm going to skip resource, and then mm -hmm. I'm going to look at the top three. Mm -hmm. I can put them back in any order. And then I can draw one. Okay. 
Well, I mean, it's closer than it looked. It's close. It's close. I feel like I had to go quick with the horn came out. Is this card good? Uh, Ryan's saying you only need a clash card to win. So I've got two things on the board, a resource and a trap of some sort. Well, my clash buff doesn't... Uh... Oh, the, even my clash buff doesn't do contender damage. Oh, and these three cards, none of them are bodies, which is the, the downside of what I'm staring at here. Bobby, what's up? Been a while, gentlemen. I'm going to have to get a well. shout-out on my bulk box order. Fantastic product. Need to order another set for storing all my Star Wars Unlimited cards. Like the, really like the new studio. Good to see your name. We have uh, the creator of what works in the house, so it's a good time for you to be complimenting them. I've been hearing, um, hey, <laughs> Volkbox saying I'm good. Love the early chat. Did you catch up? Have you been here the whole time? Anyways, Ricky's a man after my own heart, of course. Um, but it's a good time to be saying as much. I have a lot of friends who have been ordering uh, bulk box and telling me how much they love it, and then ordering more. Is that you saying you love bulk box? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Can, are they in the background? Here? Yeah, you can see them in the background. Yeah. Yeah. Shot. Oh, like I tried to point to them, but it's like is. really hard to do. In this area, right here. Golly. Hmm. What's next here? Oh, I see. Ryan's saying you have two attacks, so mm -hmm. you have another body. You can attack, attack, and then I'm wide open for business. But I got a trap, so you never know what that's going to be. Yeah, so we assume one goes, and then this gets blocked, this gets blocked. And then you have two, and you make a third body. That's pretty tough. I really. assume if you're four hours deep into the stream, that because uh, Wade's saying the bulk boxes are quite good. I got several of them, love them, um, that you probably are around a lot, I'm going to guess, if you made it this far. Uh, I'd be curious, anyone out there that has bought Bubble Box, what your thoughts are? This would be great feedback for Ricky, I think, to hear, just having live interaction with people. Uh, X, Flesh and Blood X, I do need to order Bubble Box also. Yes, do it. Do it. <laughs> do it. Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's uh, let's swing. We were swinging, and we're gonna swing at your contender. I'm gonna block here for three. Okay, we're gonna get a clash buff for one here. We're gonna use this bad boy, plus one, plus one, and then we're gonna heal two because it's white. So you go to ten, and then I'm gonna take two, one less. So I'll take two. But you're hitting me for. Two. For two. Yeah, so you go off the board there. Okay. And this gets plus one, plus one. Okay, and then Pestilence tries to do something here. Sure, let's try. Three, five, coming at you. Contender. Um... Let's go no block, but well, before blocks, I react with a piercing darkness. Okay. Counter attack costs one black. Target attacking character clash card gets minus three attack until the end of turn. Okay. So we'll just go minus three there. Minus three, done. Okay. And then. What do we do? I mean, do we want to go. And then if you haven't, your last clash buff is really bad. Oh, look at this this uh, feedback coming in. Bobby's saying, I need a uh, Star Wars Unlimited branded bulk box or stickers for the tops and sides. Stickers are, are probably where it's at. Uh, Brent's saying he wants a deep version that is the depth of a calyx, not square, uh, but you can fit a few more cards in it. Interesting. Uh, I'll just play two there. Wade's saying he uses the white boxes previously, still transferring, but having these fit in a calyx is a game changer. Only complaint is the internal height. His dividers are a tad tall. Uh... What happened? I just played Warcry here. Okay. And then Warcry? Warcry Prideful Warrior. Yeah. And I'll pass you. That is very much like T-Bone. Like, look at this. Yeah, like sitting on this in the same... Uh, yeah. Yeah. Same. Yeah, their streets are raged like cut screen. Mm -hmm. <laughs> All right, let's draw a card. Oh, wow. Wowie. 
Who's the guy that gives everything plus one? Oh, it's the horn. Right. The horn gives everything one plus one? This gives everything plus one. No, the, uh, the, your tokens. Oh, it's him. Oh, okay. Yeah. Particularly. Yeah. All right, you got a, t a three two sitting mm -hmm. there. Well, when in Rome, they say, I'll tack your contender here for two. I'll take it. Mm -mm -mm. Is that for two? I think I have to draw take it. What is this? Enter. Okay, so just two, 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 two. Yeah, I think I'm going to take that. <laughs> not, not. What? B -b 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 bomb. <laughs> Wow, no cards in hand? Yep. All right, I'm gonna play. Get it, get into it. Flare, it's just flare, actually. Yeah. One cost flare. Uh, once per turn in my prime phase, I can engage this card if I do deal damage to a target clash card or contender. So let's do one to you directly. Okay. Um, I will attack for two. Mm, take it. <laughs> Look at this. Uh. Death. Use your burn spells. Yeah, look at this. No, death, devour of souls. So four cost. Black. Uh, which we'll just work that out here. Um, it says, trigger attack. I can send any number of clash cards I control to oblivion. If I do, this card gets plus two attack for each one. Breakthrough. And if it's two or more, it gets breakthrough. Noise. So I'll attack, give it plus eight, and breakthrough. Noise. Good game. <laughs> Come on. Good the game. Warhorn. Goat. MVP. Yeah, it's so good. <laughs> Nothing oh to be my done. goodness! Yeah, I also had this uh, surprise. Yeah, that, that's funny. Magnate would have. That was the card, actually, just the two-one flight. Menacing Magnate would have got us there. I love. I love the way that card looks. So I, there was one more flight card. It was what two turns away, and you so were had to you were looking through so many cards. Yeah, that's, I, think I, I remember I had a second flight. I couldn't remember what it was. That's what I was afraid of. Yeah, something like that. Just like ending the game. I, did, I, knew, I remember seeing this card when I was building, but I didn't. It was just like, oh, that card's good. Put that in. Mm -hmm. And I wasn't thinking about particular outs. But uh, yeah, how'd you feel? Uh, I felt good. Yeah, I felt quite good. Your ability was exceptionally good. It's good. So it's always going to be on a curve. Uh, it's always going to be early game, but it's going to be worse late game than that, or mid game to late game. You're getting, you're drawing two cards a turn. I'm filtering two cards a turn. Mm -hmm. So up cards. Filter two, draw one. Yeah, and then draw two. And you I'll can take even, draw two every time. You can even feel it because I ended up on seven resources, mm -hmm. and you were on five. Mm -hmm. And then I, I didn't have any problems. Like at that point, I'm seeing more cards than you two. Like I had more cards to get to resources, and I had more card draw two. But then, well, just you can play two cards a turn. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Play but that. like even getting to seven was enabled by that, but then once I'm at seven and I'm seeing two cards and you're only seeing one, you're kind of constantly having to just put a body on the table. Yeah, exactly. You can only play one card a turn. Yeah, and then so I... So that's a, that's a huge issue. So not having card draw baked into the contenders. So if I were to play this limited again, I would lean into anything that has card draw on the card. Yep, I had a lot of that in my deck. Uh, which is actually just... Is it just war? Uh, contenders? No, there's a multiple. Pestilence does. Um, uh, what's the other one? Who else does? Uh, war? Uh, you can have Harbingers get victory, uh, draw a card. You may engage your contender, draw a card. That's not as good. Yeah, most of the time, though, my contender was not doing anything. Mm -hmm. I was not actually attacking with it. So don't do it. Uh, just for I don't think we'll do a rematch. It's late. We uh, ran long on the discussion. So yeah, I would go to these three. These would be the three that I would look at almost exclusively. So the three I was looking at. Um, you do a really qu if you have a quick enough deck, I think we could get away with clarity. I was looking at. I don't know where they went. I was looking at oh, there there. Uh, War. I think Magnate's also really good because it's just plus one defense on all your stuff. So he's not drawing, but a lot of that, even the stuff I was killing, I couldn't have killed if they had plus one mm -hmm. uh, thing. I also don't mind Torque. Um, he does have so much stuff that can tr that can combo. Yeah, 
because you have to be doing damage to yourself to draw. It's like, yeah, that's true. I honestly war, like war is very good. in a limited format, right? Like fundies are so strong. So no matter what ability is written on the card, if I'm drawing two and you're drawing one, I think eventually I win the game. So if I were to see any, it's like in sorcery. When I sat down uh, my first limited game, other player had a non-sorcerer avatar. Yeah. And I said, all I have to do is wait. <laughs> so my whole game plan was just trade one for one. Yeah. And then I'm drawing two and you're drawing one and I win the game. Yeah. War being very powerful for that reason. Yeah. And I mean, the horn was, now without the horn, it would have been fine. Yeah. Because I'd have to have two things on the board I have to attack with, I which then constantly leaves me open. I think clarity would have been fast enough without the horn. Interesting. But having an extra body every single turn is... Yeah. Too much. Just off curve enough. Yeah, it was too much. There's a few cars that get rid of relics. I actually had one. Many. Oh, you did. Yeah, I had one deep in the deck. I uh, weird. Finally enough, I had two horns in my deck, but you can only play one. Yeah, I put one down as a resource. If you blown the other one up, I would have been sad because yeah. I was like, ah, I don't need two of these, and then I didn't even think about you possibly destroying it. That's that would have been a good, a good one. I did have one of those, one copy of that card in there. Um, but I think I saw it like turn one, and so I pitched it away. I was like, wow, this is going to be useful I'm, for I'm a I'm never going to need this. <laughs> Who could possibly? Playing like I didn't know you had the horn. You know? I think this product is great. This product is super fun. I, I, It's a good one just to have on the shelf, right? Like a singular product if you never play Alpha Clash except this way. Yeah. I also you, you could cube them up. I was going to say, it's just very naturally a cube as well. After we're done, you can just sort uh, back into like randomized packs. And it's the fact that it, they give you so many things, that, like all the contenders and the, the buff, the awakened buff and the portal and the war tokens. Um, it's just a nice product. <laughs> yeah, it's like, and they actually include everything you need in there. Yeah, when they, they thought when I, about it. When I first heard of it, heard about what they were doing, it, I hadn't seen it done. So I was like, I, I don't know. But it is kind of nice. Obviously, in most games, any booster box is draftable. You just don't get all the stuff the extra stuff that you need. Mm -hmm. But just picturing this as like an entry product even, and it's like you get all the contenders and you get just all these cards. Um, super cool. And then they did this, um, you get eight copies of uh, the monochrome contender. Yeah. But there's all the different ones. So like if I bought a box and you bought a box, we could trade. Oh, so you get eight of the monochromes. Cool. You, you, okay, you everyone eight gets one. one different one basically. Yeah. It's a random contender in the box. You uh -huh. get eight of them. Yeah, that's tight. And that's the... Outside of the booster packs, just having random cards. This is like the only way to get them is by buying a box of this. But, uh, you know, so if you buy a second one, you're very unlikely to get the same mm -hmm. character, but then you have all the stuff to trade. It's really cool. You might, it would just be a little sad. <laughs> Statistically, it will happen one in 64 times, but uh, it's not likely. It's well, the main thing. That was just pleasant. Thank you all for watching. Thanks yep. for being here. Shout out to Ryzen Empire for uh, innovating in this space. It's a cool way to reprint a product. I hope it does well for them. Um, I think it would be a good, uh, it's just a good good product all around, good retail product too. Yep. You walk in and say like, hey, you want to join the Alpha Clash uh, crew? For sure. There you go. Uh, we have it available on the site if you want to check it out. And uh, I won't be here next week, so stay safe out yeah, there. Yeah, what are we going to do? Are we going to do a stream, Jonathan? It's a good question. We can do a stream. We got a lot of editing to do that you probably need to do. I'd that imagine. would be that would be very handy, actually. That we, maybe we'll just cancel to next week. I'll let you guys yeah decide that. Yeah, we'll figure that out. But thank y'all for being here so much. We uh, love getting to hang out with y'all. It's the highlight of the week. So we'll see you next time. Take care.